call the meeting of the Quincy City Council Finance Committee meeting to order. And before we get started, I need to read the open meeting law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make, a, may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledgeable and permissible. And at this time, I'd like to ask the clerk of committees to read the roll. Council Andronico. Present. Council Kane. Present. Council Devine. Present. Council DeBona. Present. Council Harris. Present. Council Liang. Present. Council Mahoney. Present. Council McCarthy. Present. Chairman Phelan. Present. Nine members. You have a quorum. Nine members present. We have a quorum. And we'll get right into the Finance Committee meeting tonight. Um, first on the agenda, we have the education. We have the education budget. We have Superintendent Mulvey here to make the presentation. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for uh, the invite to uh, participate in the budget process and to present to you tonight. Presenting with me is Assistant Superintendent Aaron Perkins, as well as our Director of Business Affairs, Mr. James Mullaney. Also with us tonight is uh, Vice Chair of the School Committee, Mr. Frank Santoro. So thank you, Mr. Santoro, for joining us tonight. Um, I would just uh, quickly go through the budget process with you uh, and then uh, get in directly to uh, the numbers for your consideration. You'll see in the budget process, just as an overview, the vast majority of the positions that we are uh, funding through the allocation given to us uh, by the mayor's office is uh, targeted towards maintaining our class sizes as well as maintaining manageable numbers in our programs, particularly our special education program. Uh, as well, and we'll go through point by point with you uh, the areas where the additional funding will go, but uh, it will be specifically, uh, the vast majority of the funding will be targeted to those areas. So as part of the budget process, I know many of you are familiar with the process this, that the school department follows, many of you being former school committee members and many of you being present for previous Quincy Public School budget process reviews. But for those who are new, the, first, the budget process for the school department begins by identifying areas of consideration, um, whether we're increasing or decreasing uh, numbers based on the budgetary allocation. Uh, the committee and the SLT review organized options to address possible areas of impact. Those areas of impact would be based on class size numbers. The Quincy Public Schools is now at an enrollment in excess of 10,000 students, which we haven't seen since the 1970s. So we certainly are a school system that is attracting more and more students uh, to the city. Uh, we prioritize possible areas of increase, shifting staff, uh, and looking at reductions. Fortunately, this year we have no recommendations for reductions, uh, which is great. We obviously determine the impact on budget areas and lines with the superintendent's leadership team and report directly back to the school committee. We present options to the Quincy School Committee with regard to the um, budget allocations, including staffing and uh, programming, as well as uh, non-academic expenses, and you'll see the lines as we go through it. We have done that already. We have presented our preliminary budget recommendations to the school committee, uh, and that will be on the June 14th meeting for final review, of course, subject to the community input, which will be happening tomorrow. Um, we then, of course, uh, present our proposed budget to the City Council, which is why we're here tonight. And then based on that, we prioritize our options with the Quincy School Committee, obviously factoring in the parent feedback, which we'll receive tomorrow night. We, we as the superintendent's leadership team, we rework options to fit um, the priorities of the School Committee. And then we act on those options through a pre final presentation to the School Committee and of course the final vote of the School Committee, which is right now expected to be on June 14th. Uh, the proposed budget for the Quincy Public Schools uh, totals for this year totals $134,639,644. This represents an $8,200,000 increase from the FY 2023 budget. And funding from this year's budget comes from two main sources. The mayor's appropriation of $127,539,644 a $6,700,000 or 5.54% increase from FY 2023's appropriation 
of $120,839,639. Uh, in, in the next source for the, the um, FY 2024 budget is the projected circuit breaker funding of 7,100,000, which is an increase of 1,500,000 from FY 2023. And I would like to thank our state delegation um, who worked tirelessly to uh, get that funding increased for us, uh, for the Quincy Public Schools. So I do wanna thank our state delegation uh, for working uh, to give us that increase. It is greatly appreciated. Uh, next, we'll review with you, Mr. Mullaney will review with you the FY budget summary of funds needed, and then um, Mrs. Perkins will review with you point by point uh, the staffing additions that we are proposing uh, for the FY 2024 budget. So, Mr. Mullaney. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, when we went to uh, build, our, build our budget, we always look at the prior year budget, not that uh, everything should be set in stone, but it's a baseline for us. Uh, we take that and we add the contractual raises for this year. It's going to be $6,720,015. Uh, and that would give us a budget that we'd need for a uh, level service budget. Uh, from that, we have a couple of offsets. Uh, circuit breaker funding, which is a special education reimbursement of uh, $7,100,000. And we're expecting salary savings. Uh, we're anticipating 25 uh, retirements and a savings of approximately 40,000 each. So that'd be a million dollars. So that'd be a reduction of 8.1 from the needed funds. So that would mean for a level service adjustments would need $125,059,659. Uh, the appropriation from the city, uh, it's before you now, the appropriation from the mayor uh, $127,539,644. So that gives us a, a, a funds available for budget building of $2,479,985. And what this does is allows us to meet our contractual obligations. Uh, that would be the $6.7 million we mentioned, less, uh, less than a million in savings, and provides that $249,000 in, in uh, additional funding for academic class size program support and super, uh, Assistant Superintendent Perkins will uh, let you know where this money is being allocated. Thank you, Mr. Mullaney. So uh, in terms of our allocation for the funding, we are starting with our academic uh, classroom teachers. This funding is primarily going to address class sizes at North Quincy High School. So North Quincy High School, as, as Superintendent Mulvey mentioned, we've seen a significant influx in enrollment. And um, we addressed some of this last year with our last year's budget and uh, being able to move some positions over to North Quincy to help with class size. But we're looking at many classrooms being over the school committee guidelines of 27, 28 students. And so we're uh, looking to increase in all of the subject areas, science, math, ELA, and social studies. Um, next, we have our academic program areas. And so in the top part, you see that we did reconcile a position in the fall, and that was to um, address an art teacher position that we needed to cover, cover contractual prep time. We are looking to increase by one EL teacher, again, to address um, increases in enrollment in that area. Also, uh, two literacy and math interventionists. So these will be math interventionists at Point Webster and Southwest Middle School. Last year we were able to add math interventionists at some of our elementary schools. It's been just a wonderful uh, enhancement to our programming. And um, we decided this based on MCAS and our MAP data, that these were the two schools that really could benefit from that, this support. Um, and the school committee absolutely supported this initiative and um, is in favor of adding these two positions. We have an increase of a music teacher that again is at the elementary level in order to cover contractual prep time that would be district wide an increase of a physical education teacher. This is at Quincy High School. The class sizes for physical education um, at Quincy High School are very large. 
we're looking at you know somewhere around 60, 70 children in a class uh, if we don't add this additional position. And um, another significant area um, of increase and absolute priority for the district is special education. And so we have 3.5 additional positions. That a 0.5 would be for central. We already have a 0.5 there. We'd like to make this um, a full-time position and this will help to address caseload concerns um, at the middle school. We also would like to increase by one CARES teacher. That's a substantially separate program for students with autism. In the preschool, our numbers are significant, and those class sizes really do need to stay small with a high teacher ratio in order for us to do an effective job working with our students. We also have um, an increase of a substantially separate teacher at the high school in our special needs learning center. We have quite an influx of students coming in. We have about 18 students coming into the program and only two students leaving. And um, an increase of one resource room position at Atlantic, again, for caseload adjustment. Um, and then two speech and language teachers. Our speech and language caseload just this year alone has gone up 110 students. Um, and so that would be, again, to address caseload concerns. So next, um, we have um, a continuation on our academic support. So again, we reconciled the position in the fall. This was when we added the second assistant athletic director. We had one uh, athletic director and we added two assistant athletic directors. One was an additional um, position in the budget. We are also proposing to increase three elementary guidance positions. And again, this is in our elementary schools, our guidance counselors are our chair people for special education. So this will address um, significant concerns with the, the chairperson role and the caseload at Snug Harbor, Atherton and Howe, and Squanum, which house our substantially separate programs. And we also are proposing to increase a position for OT. Again, this is because of caseload and because of the increases. And then five positions for special education paraprofessionals. And this is um, in order to support the additional cares and learning center classrooms so that we have appropriate staffing in those classes. And then we have a fund set aside for director and coordinator contractual increases. And um, finally, in terms of our staffing, we are proposing to increase 0.5 clerical staff. This is in the HR office. The a HR office is a very busy place. We currently have a 0.5 in there, and we would really like to increase this to a full-time position. And then lastly, in our academic expenses, um, the supply line, we're asking for an increase in the supply line. This is to address the cost of things like paper, which has gone up significantly um, over time. And this line, these lines have not been increased in a very long time. Um, we have our professional discretionary money. With, this is contractual. This is our reimbursement for teachers purchasing things for their classroom. And then finally, the musical instrument line. And if you attended the Memorial Day Parade this weekend, you saw how amazing our music program is. Again, it's a line that has not been increased in a very long time. And um, it definitely needs it in order to keep at the caliber that it is currently. And finally, we have increases for natural gas and electricity. Thank you, Mrs. Perkins, and thank you, Mr. Mullaney. And then lastly is just a summary page of the breakdown of the additional um, 8200000 uh, So you can see um, academic classroom teachers, four of those academic programs, 10.5 staff members under academic programs, 10 under academic support, 0.5 under non-academic support, and then you see the, um, the uh, increases for academic expenses and non-academic expenses, the percentages next to each increase for a total of 8200000 And again, that's kind of just at a glance for your uh, consideration. And with that, that is our presentation, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, any questions from counselors? Councilor President DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Superintendent Mulvey, Assistant Superintendent Perkins, Jim Blaney, as well as um, Vice Chair Santoro, good to see you up here tonight. Obviously, we can't, we would love to add to the budget, but we, we don't have the, uh, I guess, the protocol jurisdiction to do that. 
so we can only approve or decrease. Um, uh, just to get back on the 6.7 increase, $6.7 million increase of the budget from, uh, from last year to this year, and the previous year before that it was $6.55 million. Um, I see a lot of it in the contractual end of it and the salary increases. It almost looks identical, 6.7, 6.72 um, for that particular area. Um, obviously, you make up with some circuit breaker and stuff like that. Um, getting back to the high schools, um, you said there was an uptick and in increase at North Quincy High School. What We obviously have still the open enrollment, is that correct? Where we, yes. e each kid in the city can either pick between Quincy High School and North Quincy High School. Um, what do you see, is it, is it around 1,600 at Quincy and 1,500 at North? It's actually almost split evenly at this point. About 1,500, 1,500, plus or minus 1,550, 1,550. I see. So it's uh, pretty even at the moment. So, because I can remember it being 1,600 at Quincy and 1,200 at like North. And this wasn't many years ago. So there's right. been, what do you think is the reason why North is, I know they got the Junior Air Force ROTC program, which is not offered at Quincy, but what other reasons why the, the increase is coming at North? Um, believe it or not, the, uh, the increases really are, the increases in, in the shifting isn't really related necessarily to high numbers of requests for uh, open enrollment to North. It's actually residents living in North Quincy and actually going to North Quincy. And the same with Quincy High. Obviously the programming at Quincy High, the CVTE, uh, there are program, CVTE programs that are offered at Quincy High that are not offered at North Quincy and vice versa. So there is sometimes a um, desire for students to focus in on one school over the other based on the CVT programming that's there as well. Um, but um, student population for open enrollment um, is not the major factor for the shifting of the, uh, necessarily the shifting of those populations. Um, so the so population settled more closer to North Quincy High School and that's why you have an uptick really? At this point, we're seeing that the population, student populations, at both schools are, are pretty even, and it ebbs and flows, but um, we are seeing an uptick in student population <clears throat> in the neighborhoods for the North Quincy area for sure. Going back, you know, we're at high school, let's go down to kindergarten. How's the kindergarten classroom sizes? How's, how's that population going? So the kindergarten classrooms are uh, strong, uh, and we are, and we, we monitor them regularly to make sure that we're maintaining class size in those areas, but our kindergarten population is stable. Um, but strong at the moment. We obviously have had this conversation when I was on the school committee with my fellow counselors Mahoney and McCarthy, and that was always an issue um, at, way back then, 10 years ago and eight years ago. And it's obviously, obviously we have the St. Mary's um, school that we're looking to obviously do something with and, and, and help out with that uptick in kindergarten classes. Um, has any talk been about that obviously, um, uh, Superintendent? The uh, St. Mary's School has not necessarily been discussed, obviously, it's, it's on the horizon. Right now, with the MSBA project, we have the approval of the Squanum Elementary School, uh, as yep. well as the De Cristofaro Learning Center. So we've been focused on both of those. Um, both are moving along very well. Uh, the Learning Center, we're expected to have that probably opened, um, certainly by September of 24, if not sooner than that, um, and we're looking uh, it, the building itself may be ready as early as um, April, um, mm -hmm. but we're going to need time to do um, parent orientation, uh, walkthroughs, and also um, do a um, phasing of our programs over there as well. So that our goal would be that we would have the learning center opened by September of 24. Uh, with regard to the Squanum Elementary School, that's probably an estimate of about uh, four, oh, sorry, five years out, I would imagine, from this September. Um, Mr. Santoro is on the building committee with me, as well as uh, Mrs. Ms. Mrs. Perkins and Mr. Mullaney, and the, um, the process is going along very smoothly for that. So we're excited about the, uh, the design process, which is the next phase. Great. Um, this is probably a question for Jim Mullaney. How are we doing on the retirees? How many folks of looking to retire or haven't said anything yet or wait well, until We've budgeted June. for 25 this year. 25, wow. We have 19 who are currently uh, have already put in their papers uh, and we're anticipating that based on uh, the trends and the uh, <clears throat> demographics of the, of the uh, teaching population that we'll have 25 retirements. 
Wow. So you have to obviously be filling those positions yep. looking HR over the summer. Um, so that's always, that's, a, that's kind of a big number. So that's a, that's a challenge in itself. <laughs> um, obviously, paraprofessionals, um, I don't want to get into the salaries and all that other stuff that we, we did, but it's good to see that the folks have um, had a little salary increase to help those, those, those yes, positions out. If, is there anything, can you speak on that, or where it went from and how many, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that our paraprofessionals are, we couldn't do the job without them. They are truly amazing, you know, the work that they do every day for our, our classrooms. And I think that they are thrilled. Um, and we're hoping that with the new salary increase that we'd be able to attract some more paraprofessionals. Um, and uh, I think that it was just an amazing thing. And thank the city and everyone that was involved because they definitely deserve it and um, they definitely appreciate it. Real quick on the music program and the band and everything you've done, a, we've come a long way and um, it's really nice to see them out there, that combined group and um, look, they look fantastic. So I wanna thank everybody involved with that. Um, getting on to the athletic director. Um, we've switched back over to the one, one athletic director. I know Jim Rendell had it years ago as the one person we went to a phase where we had one in each high school, and then we made them full-time at one in each high school, and now we're back to one athletic director with two assistants. Yes. Um, along with the band program and all the extracurricular activities that these children have after school and stuff, we obviously have to look into the sports. And um, how, how is that working? And um, um, Kevin Mahoney is our athletic director, and he is a fabulous athletic director. Uh, he's working very well with his two assistants. Um, one assistant housed at Quincy High, one assistant housed at North Quincy High. Of course, Kevin um, splits his time between both, um, but uh, Kevin is a very efficient administrator, uh, and his love for the job and love for the students and love for sports is pretty evident in everything he does. Uh, so um, from my perspective and the SLT's perspective, he's doing a great job, and it's a, it's a great uh, team that they have. Um, with uh, QPS Athletics. I, uh, I actually concur with you on all three of them. They're, they're always around and they're very approachable and they're there at all the events. And um, if one of them can't make it because there's a conflict of a couple different sporting events going on at the same exact time, you got one covering and switching off. So exactly. they do a great job up there. Um, that's all the questions that I have. I'd just like to make a motion to approve. Motion has been made to approve Thank you. the education um, on the motion. Council Yang. Thank Council you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to so are we seeing um, increased enrollment across all the schools or just the high schools? Um, I would say we're seeing an increase in enrollment pretty much in all the schools, I would say. Okay. And what's the overall demographic of the increase that we're seeing? Or the, the overall demographic? The highest, I guess, yeah. Like what's the demographic breakout of the open or the, uh, the increased enrollment? Um, so it is. Um, so a specific demographic number, I, mm -hmm. I don't have that with me tonight, but I can get that with you, but I can get that to you. But I can tell you that the um, demographics are, have been pretty consistent um, over the past um, five years or so. And um, so we are seeing a, a very diverse um, demographic moving into the city of Quincy for sure. And again, I can get you those numbers specifically. Okay. And then for, um, I just wanted to follow up on Councilor Bonas' question about the retirements. And so we're estimating 25 retiring this fiscal year, right? Is that what we were thinking? That's what we're, that's what we're anticipating, yes. Okay. And what's the process for bringing on new staff then to cover that? Because you're, I'm looking at the breakout here and it's saying that um, we're anticipating a salary savings based off of 25 retirements at, at $40,000 per retirement. But I assume that we're obviously going to have to refill those positions. Are we not looking to fill them this fiscal year and we're waiting to fill them next fiscal year and we'll see that number go back up or just procedurally, I just want to understand how that works. We'll, we'll fill them next year and then, um, Super, Assistant Superintendent uh, Perkins can talk to the procedure for that. But what we're seeing is typically when somebody's retiring, they're going to be retiring at the top of the salary schedule. So you're seeing a person with a master's, um, with a six and a half level master's plus uh, 45 and they're out at around $100,000 and you'll be having new people coming in at step four. I see. Uh, okay. And a much lower level, so they'll be at the lower level of the sta stage, and they'll gradually work their way up. So, we're anticipating each new person coming in around somewhere between sixty and sixty-four thousand dollars. So that's where that savings comes in. Perfect. Okay, that actually answers my question. So I'm all set. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Council Mahoney. Thank you very much. 
I always love when education comes up because, you know, it brings back memories of the budget and it's still the same. It's the kind of, I like the layout, so I always like the layout. So I'm just going to start. I, I, I appreciate both um, Council Yang and Council Devona. They, um, could we just talk about the, the enrollment again? When you're saying there's the enrollments at North Quincy High School, it's probably because of some of the development that's happened over there. Are you seeing specific pockets in different schools that you're seeing more enrollment or is it across the board? Uh, we're seeing enrollment increasing across the board. Okay. So enrollment. And that's what, uh, what number are we up to? I know it's probably in your presentation. Um, it's about uh, a little over 10,000 students at the moment. It's like a whole thousand more than since, so, since I left. So um, then now just talking about, you know, when it comes to, I'm just going to, I'm going to start with Quincy College, kind of walk around. So for Quincy College, are, um, how, many Quin how many QPS teachers are teaching Quincy College classes um, during the school day? Um, I would say probably about six. 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 And then um, how many classes total? How many classes? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I think that the, the way they do it, so they may teach one period of early college, yep. but it, you know, like they have music across cultures, they have an English class, so, there's, so they, they, it's probably one period out of each of their day. So, but, so as the edu is the music part of Quincy College or is it just one Quincy College credited class? That's what I guess we're trying to get at. So our music teacher, like I'll, that's an example, our music teacher teaches it. Okay. Um, so it would be a credited class and the music teacher would be teaching. Yep. She teaches music across cultures and she teaches it to, so she does two periods because she does one for North and one for Quincy High. Okay. So then I guess, I guess the question that I have is why aren't Quincy educate, why aren't Quincy College educators teaching those classes? Because those are our teachers teaching for Quincy College. I mean, our students are getting the, the advantage, but our taxpayers are paying for Quincy College twice in that situation. So I guess, why wouldn't a Quincy College educator come in to teach those classes? Instead of, I realize that we can't send our students to Quincy College, I guess I'm just. So the, the Quincy College um, um, program that we're running is actually paid for through a, the State Street Grant. Okay. So it's paid for through private funding, donated to the Quincy Public Schools in the amount of 500,000 per year. Um, and again, we'll, we're projected to have another two years of that moving forward. So, okay. again, that's being so that covers for. the teachers. It covers the six classes yes. and the six teachers. Okay, that answers my question there because it's just always something that kind of comes up in that particular case. And then, you know, I realized that it's been a tough year, and I'm glad it ended well <laughs> with the teachers. I know it's 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 never easy when you're negotiating contracts, but we also have seen, um, and you talked about 25 teachers um, retiring. Have we seen other full-time or part-time? Um, employees of the city of Quincy leaving to go to other places for potential better pay, or is it strictly retirement that they're leaving for? So we are not seeing that. In fact, we are seeing um, that our um, retention rate is quite high. Um, and the um, large number of, um, of the, the small amount of staff that left, the majority of that, those staff left the teaching profession altogether. Okay. Um, so we are not seeing um, a high um, departure rate for teachers. It's just the opposite, actually. Same thing with um, paraprofessionals. And now with the increase that uh, Councilor DeBona had referenced with regard to the paraprofessional staff, we're actually seeing a very positive response to um, an uptick, a significant uptick in individuals wanting to be paras in the district, which is something we absolutely wanted to see because we absolutely needed it. And we see when you were seeing before, I think you were seeing paraprofessionals potentially going other places because of that salary. Uh, well, at least I was hearing that from paraprofessionals. Um, the vast majority of our paraprofessionals uh, stay with us. It's not only just the salary, but the benefits package. The benefits yeah. package in Quincy, as you know, is uh, fantastic. So that certainly was a draw. But now we have the additional draw of increased um, salary yeah. that we were able to successfully negotiate with the. Uh, Power union. I'm certainly not suggesting that it's the, the highest percentage of people, but I do know that there's some people who have left. No, um, certainly, as with um, you know, probably every, every profession during COVID, we certainly had um, significant some significant changes. Say, for instance, uh, uh, bus drivers during COVID, we lost a significant amount of bus drivers that we're still trying to recover from. We are steadily recovering from that. Uh, but with regard to our paraprofessional and teaching lines, uh, they're a group of very dedicated people, and we did not uh, see a significant movement in those lines like we did with the transportation department. And then we also had, I think last year, we saw a several principals leave to go to other districts. We are not seeing anything like that happening now. We have not had a single principal leave. This year? 
uh, to go to another district? No. Okay. Last year we did, though. So this year we, it's kind of stabilized. Um, it, we did not have any principals leave um, to go to another district. They may have uh, retired, but they did not leave to go to another district. Okay. And then um, of all the contracts in the schools, is it just the bus drivers, monitors, and security that's still not settled? Yes. Okay. And then the next question that I had, and, I'm, and I think you might have t t touched on this, because I know the Victor Christopher Building is still the, the Victor Christopher Learning Center. Sorry. <laughs> It's not this building, it's the learning center. Um, that's in the works, and it's going to open in the next fiscal year. We believe uh, we'll be ready for operation in September of 25. Five. Yep. So, you know, staffing up for something like that, you obviously can't do that. Is that part of your budget this year? Because I guess my concern is, you know, the programming and staffing up for a specialized building like that. Right. Um, it won't, it's not in, in this year's budget. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, current uh, programming is located already within our school system that will be shifted to the learning center. Okay. Um, so we will have uh, staffing increases um, for that, everything from custodians to nurses to teaching staff, but that is not in this year's budget. Is it going to be a, I thought it was going to be a 12 year program, a 12 month program as opposed to, as opposed to the learning year. center. Yeah. It, it has the potential to be that. Okay. Will it be when you open in 2025? I was just, I'm asking this question because that's a different, so that's a different model than what we have now. So that would be a different group. Uh, of people. We haven't made any decisions on the programming there. We're working with the state to make final determinations as to um, the programming that we'll have uh, in that school. But that's a process that myself and Mrs. Perkins and, Mr. Mullaney uh, and other members of the SLT are working with the state on to make sure that obviously we meet all the state requirements for school of this. Um, so you have to get the state to approve before we can actually start figuring out who we're going to hire. Um, we've been working for the last two years with the state on the development of the programming. And I can tell you that when the school does open, it will be a state of the art program. Oh, I'm, I don't doubt it. I just, I just know that it's been like when we, when we started to talk about this, we, I, I just remember being kind of floored because we I'd been on the school committee and we really hadn't had any plans for this. So I know you've been working diligently to do this. And that's that on top of having a pandemic and on top of having, you know, all of the things that go on. And, and by no means am I trying to make light of it. It's just a lot of stuff that's going on in the pandemic just exasperated even more because I don't think people realize how difficult it is to um, reallocate students at a young age back into classrooms. You know, they kind of they they were out and then they came back and and maybe some of their socialization and across the board from all different levels. I think everybody's seeing it, even new dog owners are seeing socialization problems with it. But so not to, not to compare dogs to kids, but I'm just saying it's just in general, people going back into the office, there's a lot of things that have, mm -hmm. you know, social cues have to be reworked on. So, but the schools itself had to kind of live through the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, no doubt the, the, the effort of our staff, our teaching staff, our custodians, our bus drivers, our security, the entire staff, our secretaries, uh, our food service workers, they all came together yeah. to make that transition from fully remote to hybrid to back full in person as smooth a transition as possible yeah. and as safely as possible while also maximizing the educational opportunities for our students. And I have to say that our staff did a phenomenal job and I think the state recognized that as well. So I'm, I'm very pleased with the response that our staff did in relation to the COVID pandemic. And I think our uh, students and families um, were served very well yeah. uh, during that time. And I still think you're, I, I think it's going to be, re, uh, like there's going to be reper repercussions from that for, for years to come. Certainly. And, and, you know, it's going to be, you'll all be learning from it, but I think it will be a great study to go back and look at, hopefully, when we don't have to ever worry about those things again. So I know the state gave us $10 million, the city $10 million for additional education funds. Is that correct? Um, Jim, do you want to talk mm -hmm. about it? Yes, the increase in Chapter 70 funding, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and the increase in your budget total this year was? Uh, 6.7, the appropriation. Yeah. So I guess I always ask this because it's just always been something, and I, I understand how it works, but why did the schools not get the full $10 million? Well, uh, when we, we present our full presentation, we like to also show uh, the amount of the budget uh, or the amount of the city budget that goes towards education. Mm -hmm. So on top of our appropriation, there's over $70 million coming from the city for health insurance, retirement, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, other services, police, um, and um, obviously the school construction, which we've been talking about, there's a huge number for that. So it almost works out that 50% of the entire budget, or just shy of 50%, 
uh, could, could be considered educational spending. Um, so there's, there's a significant expenses on the city side uh, that aren't in our budget. In other communities, you wind up with it. You have the health insurance on the school side. Mm -hmm. You have the pensions. You have all those other expenditures. Yep. And we're fortunate enough not to have those in our budget. Yep. So let me ask you, too. I know that with the opera, which is the, is the Esther monies that you get. Yes, the funds, um, yes. So what are, what are some of those uses being used for for those? Are there, is there any, are there any employees that are on that uh, There budget? are a few employees uh, that obviously will have a, uh, not, not too many, because we didn't want to put too many into that. Uh, because we'd have to do a reconciliation and either lose the positions <laughs> or get them into our budget. And they'll be coming in next year. Yep. Uh, the majority of it is being spent on uh, things like equipment uh, as well as text and learning. And a significant portion, about $3 million, was set aside a little bit more than that for uh, loss of learning uh, due to the COVID. So we have our like, very robust summer programs and the after-school programs that uh, Mrs. Perkins has been uh, basically in charge of, uh, it's about a million dollars a year on those. Uh, so uh, the vast majority of the, of the spending for ESSER is not on personnel, uh, but there will be a time that we'll have to look and see if we can keep up our summer programs or we'll have to cut back at some point. But right mm -hmm. now we've got spent, uh, funding for the next two years. And how much did you get total? Uh, in total, yep. uh, it was close to $26 million. Uh, there were three funds, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3. Uh, so, and how much is the schools? What do you, what do you have left in that budget? Uh, approximately five million dollars. We did a presentation on that to school committee the other day. And then, um, and then I know I didn't get to, if I could see. I could if I had time, I could see it all, couldn't I? <laughs> um, and then I think the city retracted around six million dollars of the Esther money back to the city. Correct. And what was that for? Uh, it was for items that was spent uh, from uh, March of twenty. Uh, through um, the current year. So uh, the vast majority of it was for uh, technology, uh, Chromebooks for every student. Uh, there was a huge amount that was spent uh, through to uh, upgrade uh, the uh, infrastructure through the city IT's department, as well as some uh, uh, PPE, protective, personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and there were significant other expenditures that weren't reimbursed. I, I think mainly of the construction ones, uh, fixing the heating and ventilating, mm -hmm. specifically at Broad Meadows, as well as in all the other buildings. So, and then my last question for that, didn't the city also, didn't you have to put back budgets, budgetary money for those Chromebooks too during that? Because I remember there was a time that you had a little extra money in your budget and that went back to the city as well. And that was before the opera monies or the Esther monies came in. Uh, I don't recall that, to be honest. Uh, I know we, we've, we've held aside money uh, because we weren't able to get Chromebooks and mm -hmm. the state had to get them for us. Mm -hmm. So it was an offset in our CARES funding. Okay. It might have been that. It might have been the offset in the CARES part. I just remember there was a, there was a uh, retraction for that right, as well. Because we, so. we weren't able to get Chromebooks ourselves and uh, the City superintendent, assistant superintendent working with uh, the uh, DZ, we were able to get us uh, the first uh, group of about uh, 2,500 uh, 2, Chromebooks when nobody had them. So, uh, and then that, what, what they did is a direct, direct payment by the DZ, and then they reduced our funding. Okay, I, I, was, just, I was just remembering, because uh, uh, you mentioned Chromebooks, and I just remembered there that was, was an a issue big amount, and, it was, and we were very fortunate to have that, otherwise we wouldn't have had. So have you built into your budget, let me make the promise, this is my last question. Have you built into your budget for, you know, obviously the Chromebooks will last for only so long before you have to start building into that budget? Um, uh, for we haven't. Budget. We're looking at uh, doing things. Uh, they've got a three-year warranty. We have people on staff. We've hired uh, somebody just specifically for refurbishing and, and uh, maintaining them. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously going forward, uh, we'll be looking at that, uh, whether through our text and learning lines or technology lines. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, with the additional funding uh, that the state's getting that they might be uh, um, inclined to have more grant funding available for that. Do you do a lot of web-based um, things where the kids can do things at home on their own computers or on their own electronics? Uh, they use, typically have to use ours because okay. uh, uh, we want to maintain control over what gets in and if you, they're not allowed to plug into our system. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has to be uh, our equipment. Okay. Well, thank you very much. As usual, it's very thorough. I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, Council Devine. Uh, I just had one question for uh, Assistant Superintendent Perkins. Uh, you mentioned about a music teacher, one needed. 
what school was that for? I didn't hear. It's district, actually. So our elementary school, they travel to different buildings, so they're all assigned multiple buildings. So we don't have a music teacher in every single school? We do, but because of a contractual prep time and some of the increases in enrollment, our, a music teacher can only do so many classes per week, and so in order to cover all of those classes, we need to add another one for the fall. Oh, okay. No, that's great. I was just concerned that maybe uh, I was worried. No, no, nope. they all. We have a great music program. It. They all, they all have it. Yep. Hey, that's great. Uh, you guys did a really good job through COVID. Too. My uh, son's about to graduate from Quincy High, and uh, my daughter recently graduated too. So uh, they went through COVID with you guys. They went through the Chromebooks. Uh, they came in, uh, you know, they, I know that they were kind of like squeaking in in the last second, but they were there on time. So you guys did an exceptional job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other councils? Hearing none, we have a motion on our report for, to, for the, to pass the FY24 education budget. I'll call all in favor. Aye. Aye. All opposed, hearing none. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, public safety. And Chief Keenan, point out that I believe this is your last budget with us, Chief. It is. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> uh, first off, I'd like to thank the councils for allowing me to present the, my last in 2024 fiscal budget. Uh, the budget that was submitted uh, through the mayor's office is basically a budget that's going to provide for the same level of services for the city of Quincy for the taxpayers and residents. Uh, there is an increase in one position in particular, and it's the uh, basically the mental health embedded clinician. We thought that it was a good way to go. He was a part time or he was a, a uh, grant employee through Aspire. And in order to retain him and keep him uh, from leaving, uh, we made him a full time city employee. However, that being said, we have a grant proposal in that we feel very confident we're going to get that will reimburse his entire salary as well as his uh, benefits. We are trying to t still maintain the second clinician, another clinician through Aspire, uh, which is a, a, so a mental health agency through a grant through the DA's office. However, they've been having a difficult time finding someone to fill that position. So I, I think it's a proactive and a progressive uh, program that we have. Uh, we put that through, uh, it's in the CP unit now, presently located in the CP unit. They respond to calls with the offices and has paid huge dividends. With the amount of homeless that we have, most of the homeless that we do deal with are either addiction issues or mental health issues, with the mental health being more and more prevalent. So he's a, <clears throat> he's a very busy clinician, and I think uh, it's a very worthwhile program. And again, I think we're going to get, uh, it's anticipated we'll get reimbursed for that position. Other than that, it's basically the... Uh, the contractual salary increases that drove a little of the, that drove the budget up from where it was, uh, both or all the civilian unions as well as the sworn unions, superiors, patrol offices, and QPA all um, uh, settled their contracts this year. So, and I believe they're all happy with them. So, I'll be glad to take any questions. Motion to approve. Okay, Councilor McCarthy makes a motion to approve. Uh, on the motion, Councilor Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Chief. Thanks. I uh, just say few questions on the specific line items that are laid out here. So I can see that uh, the line item labeled Patrolman 1 and another one labeled Bookkeeper are removed for this year, but there are two other ones that were added, the vacation, I believe it's paid term civilians and then crisis response 1. I'm having trouble hearing it. So, uh, just looking at the different line items that are in here in our budget book. So one of them labeled Patrolman 1, that's actually not funded this year, it's removed. And Correct. so Everybody isn't the moved. Bookkeeper 1? Everybody has moved up. We're, we're presently staffed with 182 patrol offices. We have budgeted for 180, but um, we actually pre-hired for the first time in my 15 years as chief, we actually are fully staffed in the patrol officer line. Those offices now have aged up with their time into the patrol officers three line. Uh, we do anticipate, I, today we have staffed fully. Within the next two to three weeks, we'll be looking to be hiring again. We'll be understaffed one, by one or two. Um, so we anticipate that we're going to lose several offices to retirement, myself being one, two, two captains, uh, several patrol offices, and there are several that are in the disability process to get their disability pensions. So uh, I believe when everything sorts out, we'll be at uh, 178, 177 mm -hmm. going forward. Okay. Well, we're not letting you leave, so we won't have that problem. <laughs> uh, what about the bookkeeper line? 
the bookkeeper line. Mm -hmm. That uh, one's also removed for this year. I think what why it's not funded. Mm -hmm. We actually changed detail systems. Um, we went to an outside vendor that's been very, very successful. Uh, what, the, what happened was that position was uh, a woman that billed the details, did all the detail billing for us. Mm -hmm. The company now does all the billing and, uh, and they assign all the details. The people call them directly, so we have little or nothing to do with the detail process now, other than making sure what areas they're in and that type of thing. So we work with the company. So that's why that position was not funded. Great, and how long have we been using the, the outside service for that? Sorry? How long have we been using the outside service for that, for the detail uh, it's, booking? It's been since, I believe, November. Great. I think okay. we sat in November. And, and then uh, there are two that were added. One is vacation paid term civilians, and another is crisis response one. Can you just let me know what those ones are? The vacation? I believe it's paid, right? Is that what PD is for? So vacation PD, to, oh, well, please don't remember. Vacation PD term civilians, and then crisis response one. The crisis response one is the, uh, the new clinician, mental health clinician. And what was the other one you asked about? Uh, vacation PD term civilians. Vacation PD term? Mm -hmm. That's a, a payout for um, vacation uh, buyback, that line is. Okay. Those are the only ones I had. Um, every year when you come in front of us, I always comment about how, and this is to Councilor Bono's earlier point, that we can't add to the budget, or, you know, specifically when it comes to looking at the percentage of how much you've used and spent in your budget relative to where we are in our fiscal year, and you're always right there you know, at this point in time, we've got a month left in the fiscal year, and you're pretty much at 100% of spending um, over, the, you know, all of these lines. Over time, it's always a little bit over, and yet you still come back, and you're still always making conservative asks. And I think that believe, you know, I, I believe that it speaks to your leadership, right? That you're always going to be mindful of, okay, this is what we spent in the last few fiscal years, but moving forward, we can continue to be conservative and try to manage our spending as much as possible with a, a job that is, I think, beyond comprehension how to even handle it. And so... I just commend you for, for always being so mindful about that when it comes to you want to deliver on the job and give the best quality <clears throat> of service, but also being mindful of the spending of taxpayer dollars. And, um, you know, I, I've been joking with you a lot this past year uh, about not letting you leave, but I really, um, you know, I just want to take this opportunity if I could just say thank you for everything you've done. Um, you know, there's been a lot that's been happening in the last few years in the city, but, you know, particularly in, in um, I always take an opportunity to share with folks. There's this video that's out there um, that was posted on social media when, uh, you know, there were all those protests happening across the country, and it was a, an exceptionally difficult time, especially for folks in your department. And um, we had, you know, the, the protests here in the city as well, and it was meant to be just, you know, a, a demonstration outside that ended up turning into a march up the entirety of Hancock Street and back, right? And that was sort of on the fly. I don't think anybody anticipated it, including the organizers. Um, and there's this video posted on social media of folks coming back into the center and the line of your officers just lined up and all of these folks coming right back down and everyone just kneeling and, and hugging and just embracing one another. And I think that video in and of itself just, just captures your leadership and what you've done, right? In a moment when tensions are so high and it, there's so much that's unknown, right? And, and then so much, you know, emotion out there, like for that to have happened is, is just incredible. And again, it speaks to, not by, you know, it's circumstance or chance or luck, it, it speaks to your leadership, right? Above and beyond everything else. And in, even more recently with the uptick in, 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 in crimes, particularly against Asian Americans and even more specifically against Asian American women, you know, you came out to the community without hesitation. You met with a number of residents across the city, you know, who've lived here for years, who, like myself, were born and raised here but are still fearful, right? Um, all the way to folks who can't speak English but, you know, decided to make Quincy their home. And you've spoken with every single one of those residents to assure them that you and every single person in the police department would be here to help them and to protect them and to give them all the resources they need. And, again, these are just two small but really important, I think, instances I speak to, again, the leadership that you bring to the table. Um, and that's why, again, when I, you know, say to you jokingly, but not jokingly that I don't want you to leave, th this is why, right? These are two reasons, but, you know, even beyond that, we're, what, the seventh or eighth largest city in this commonwealth, and you feel safe. You don't feel like we're this major city with, you know, immense crime, because, again, it's, it's the leadership that you bring to the table. And so I am... Um, I'm sort of on a soapbox here to really just I can't say thank you enough for, for what you've done. Thank and you for the good words, I counselor. think whoever comes after you has major, major, major shoes to fill. I don't know that anybody could, but I just hope that um, in any capacity we continue to stay on and support um, 
whoever comes next and, you know, to continue to just be an example really for everyone in the department because it's incredible the work that you've done and what you've accomplished and, you know, the standard that you've really set in the city. All of us, we're, we're really, really lucky to have you. I don't say that lightly and just, I can go on forever, so I'm just going to stop there and again just... From the bottom of my heart, really, thank you for everything you've thank done you, and, and for thank your Thank you, Thank you for your support. I'll take just a little bit of the credit, but most of the credit goes to the men and women that show up every day for work and do the right things. They're well-educated, they're well-trained, they're smart offices, and I think the city and the department right now is well-positioned to have a seamless transition to the next leader. But thank you for the kind no, of No, thank you. Thank you for everything, really. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Council President DeBona, and then Council Harris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chief. Um, done a fantastic job um, now being chief. How many years has it been being chief? Mm -hmm. 15 years. It comes. Um, thank you for all your hard quick. work. It was quick, wasn't it? Was it? Quite quick. <laughs> um, getting to the retirees, how many retirees over this last fiscal year do you think it's been in the department? Eight or nine. Eight or nine. Uh, we have probably four or five more, six more pending wow. in, within the next six we months. I see a little bit of a shift. I see uh, Captain Rick McCusker, he's in the same situation. Yeah, retiring in the end of June. Yeah. Lieutenant Tarowski, Lieutenant Tobin retired, Lieutenant Glenn, I Captain Dugan, uh, Captain Steele. They're all, those are just the, some of the superior officers that are going. Wow, it's kind of like the city council's kind of turned over a little bit. It's, it's happening, it's, it's, I guess, when you're up here a little longer in time that that, that just happens. Um, you're, you're losing a lot of knowledge and experience, mm -hmm. I can tell you that much. Um, I always ask you every year, how are we doing with the substance use disorder, the, the opiate overdoses? How, how are we doing out there on the street in the I last? It's been consistent. We haven't seen any real significant spikes, but it's still definitely an issue. Uh, th but we haven't had any major dips or, or the, the numbers are fairly consistent and have been over the last several years, but it is still a problem. I know you guys are, are losing the, lives. You're the pioneers of the Narcan and Lieutenant Glenn, which obviously is retired as well. It's mm -hmm. been, I think, two years now, three. Um, who who kind of went into that position that he kind of was in, um, which he was kind of overseeing this kind of area? Uh, Lieutenant Glenn was in charge of two areas of responsibility, the domestic violence unit or the special investigations, yep. as well as the narcotics, the drug control unit. Yep. Um, he, the gentleman that took over for him is uh, Lieutenant Mike Duran, okay. yeah, recently promoted lieutenant. He took over the, um, the drug part of it, and I've separated the job, and uh, Sergeant Jen Tappa will be uh, taking over the uh, domestic violence and the special investigations area. How do you think we, um, obviously there's been a little transition. Does it, does it seem like it's a good transition for the two folks going in that, those positions? It's been seamless. I mean, uh, the, the people that were replaced that retired, we put the people in, in, uh, in those positions prior to them retiring so that they were able to mentor them and work through uh, and guide them and give them direction going forward. So it's been fairly seamless. So obviously we have chief, we have five captains. 14 Correct. lieutenants, 31 sergeants, Correct. and 180 patrols, patrol officers? Correct. We have 182 now, but 182, by the okay. end of the month, we'll be down to 180. <laughs> Are we looking good for amount of uh, police officers in total? I feel comfortable with that amount. I think when I took over, it was 144 officers, uh, sworn uh, patrol officers. Now we're at 180, thereabouts, and uh, I feel pretty comfortable with that level. The city has grown, it's gotten a lot more sophisticated. Policing in general has got quite a bit more sophisticated, so I feel very confident that we're well positioned uh, numbers-wise. Have we ever been over that mark? Uh, have we ever been over that 182, or the total of officers in general? Back in 1971, they had 188, and that was the highest, I believe, that we 1971. It's right. funny, you just had education in here, and they talk about enrollment. Enrollment was the last time they had 10,000 was 1970. So you just said 71, we had 188. Correct. Um, so it kind of seems the time frame is, is rolling over here now in the, in the 23. Um, I just thank you, thank of all police officers out there for all their hard work out there. Um, as we obviously have, you know, the downtown, the Hancock Adams Common outside, we've, we've come into the areas and make it more open space. Um, but you guys, um, obviously, Lieutenant Mitten, we miss over here. They used to be over at the library and outside. Um, and everything that we've done, um, do you think the city um, has done a pretty good job with, with basically cleaning up the areas to make it more police, um, police friendly, I guess I could say? I would say yes. I think, you know, most of the areas you feel very comfortable and safe walking anywhere in the downtown area night or day. And most of the neighborhoods are still rock solid. Um, so I think the city is heading in a tremendous direction. 
I was concerned years ago when I was a patrol officer, sergeant, lieutenant, captain on the way up that Quincy Square with the lack of development up there would lead us to other communities that just aren't, aren't as nice to live in. And I think the way the city's been grown, the, the city has grown, the development that's been had in the city, I think it's well planned and it's a beautiful city. When you, when you look out the window and you see outside there, of course, it's an attractive nuisance because now I have the police officers <laughs> there. But um, and I think th the things are going in the right direction. Yeah, I can remember the trees were out here, and it would it was real dark, and it was mm -hmm. it was tough out here. Um, and obviously, as we revitalized the downtown over here in this right side here, um, obviously, if you didn't have anything entertainment at night, it wasn't good. You'd have problems at night, nighttime, constantly policing the area. Correct, and that was the direction it was heading in. Yep. But um, thank you for everything. Thank all the police officers out there for everything that you do every day, helping and protecting our citizens here in Quincy. Thank you. Thank you, Council. On the motion, Council Harris. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman Phelan. Um, Chief, um, I'm going to make it as brief as I can. Um, since I've been in office, uh, you uh, have always responded to me very quickly. It would be on the weekends, and I wasn't expecting a... Uh, an e email back or, or from our phones and um, especially questions that my constituents had concerns throughout the different neighborhoods, whether it be North Quincy, Squanum, uh, along Wallace and Beach, um, which is in Ward 6. And, uh, and you always got back to me. And How I roll. Uh, that was, I wish that, uh, and I'm, I'm not taking shots at anybody, but they can understand if every department had followed your lead and was able to be responsive to us as you have been, and the conduct of your department um, is impeccable. When I was, the, the brief time I was watching the parade go by yesterday, when your, when your group went by, you had the loud, loudest chair of anybody. And, um, and it just proves that, you know, because of obviously your leadership, but again, it, as you have mentioned, and every good leader always mentions to people that are underneath them, uh, as you just did uh, briefly earlier, um, that is what makes a great leader a great department head. And um, I'm certainly, I'm really going to, uh, miss you, um, you know, if if I'm if I'm in this job any further. But thank you for everything you've done, and and um, obviously Next I'm going to be saying Keenan who. Uh, that's what happens. That's <laughs> what happens. I've already found that out when I retired from one job. So mm -hmm. thanks. Thank you. thank you so much, Chief. Council Mahoney. Thank you, Chief. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'll hold back on doing too much, but thank you. Um, I do have a quick question. So for the crisis response, is it just one person? Right now, yes. Yeah. Is it, has it been something you've person. done before? You said part-time. You did it with part-time. One, one full-time, okay. uh, and we're looking to get another one through that grant through the, the Norfolk DA's office. They're just having trouble filling that position. Okay. We were lucky to keep the one that we have. He's outstanding. Yep. The guys like him, the, or the men and women like him. Uh, he's good with the public, really good with the public. He's taken care of some in-house situations with offices yeah. and their families. So he's a valuable resource. I think it's an, that's an incredible ad to the, to the police department because I can't imagine being a police officer with some of the things that they potentially have to go to. And you just can't predict what you're going to. You think it might be something, but you have no idea how fast it's going to escalate. And I know they have to de-escalate and they get trained for that, but it's still just, it's an, it's an incredibly difficult job when you have to do that. And having somebody that's trained in mental health could be, you know, the difference between a really dangerous thing and, and potentially being able to de-escalate that really fast. And I think um, I'm pretty pleased with this model. There were yeah. a bunch of different models that were being floated around throughout mm -hmm. the country where people would respond, uh, mental health clinicians would respond first before offices. That never would have worked. This mm -hmm. one does work. So they the, respond with the offices. They call to the different scenes. Some, they work directly with our community police officers on a day-to-day -day basis. He does a lot of the, um, the uh, overdose follow-ups. So if someone's to overdose, we go down with a police officer and with Tim. He goes down, meets with the family, offers them any kind of assistance that they may need. So yeah. I'm pretty pleased with that model. It was, a lot of the research was done by uh, Lieutenant Jim Flaherty 
in our community police unit, and Christine Hurton, who was our grant writer. She was a, she's tremendous. She brings a lot of money into the city. Uh, she just was able to secure the grant. She's filed for the grant. We're very confident that we're going to get it. Yep. Not guaranteed, but we're very confident. And we're very confident that we'll keep the other grants through Aspire if we can actually get uh, somebody hired. And is that something we're going to be checking with to see how often we're using them to see if that's something we have to grow potentially? I know you won't be, you know, unfortunately you won't be here, but, you know, I would hope that that's something that we're going to, how would you track that to be able to figure out if you need more people to be helping in that situation? How many calls do you get that with this one person, do you see the need for more than two or? I would say yes. I think it's an area that could be expanded upon yeah. because I think it's a valuable, valuable asset. I see the difference that it makes. Uh, he has direct access to be able to section 12 somebody to commit them to a, a mental health facility or an alcohol facility. Mm -hmm. So and he does that fairly frequently. Yeah. Um, so it's a good resource to have. It kind of cuts out the middleman. It gets the person in crisis okay. off the street into a program and hopefully gets them the help that they need. Yeah, I just, and, and this is happening all over, but you can see people, and it happened in my own, it happens in everybody's neighborhood, but in my neighborhood, there was somebody that was kind of just, it was kind of like a, they dumped the person in my neighborhood, and it's really sad when you see that, because the person is in crisis, and I witnessed firsthand, you know, the Quincy police coming, and, and then the ambulance coming and taking the person, it's just, it's heartbreaking to see, because, you know, it's freezing cold outside, they don't, they, they don't have their, they don't have a jacket or shoes, and they're just right. and as I said, a lot of, of the, the Father Bills people, or the homeless population that we deal with, yeah. uh, a lot of it's directly related to mental illness. Yeah, it all, it, it, a lot of it is. So I, I, just, um, I just applaud that, that, that addition in your budget. And then also I just had a quick question because it, it just made me think about it, but I'm not even sure if it would be coming. So the AG and the opioid, um, the monies that we were getting from the state, has any of that money come in? And has any of it gone into the police department directly or do we know? The directly, no. Yeah. You mean the opioid money from... The, the state settlement, is that yeah. what you're referencing? Yeah. No, not, not directly. Not directly. So we're not being able to, maybe through Mr. Walker, if he may has any information on that. I was just curious to know if we've received any and how it's benefiting. Because I know you do a lot um, with the, the DARE officers and different things that we do that, that could benefit, but also just your police officers training and different right. things that you do. The DARE officer, we're one of the few communities that still maintains the DARE officer positions. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have gotten away from that. Yeah. And it seems like it's paying dividends. It seems like it's a good program and it makes a difference. And your community police officers too, right? You saw Correct. Them. We have community police officers as well. They do a, a, a very, a, they, they do a, a variety of different tasks and jobs. They're assigned to each, usually each ward, yeah. uh, in Quincy Square as well. <clears throat> they patrol on bicycles a lot of the time. Yeah. But um, they'll do a lot of the follow-up for the uh, the opioid addiction uh, overdoses as well. I think that's another area that's really important because very oftentimes people can either be frightened by, you know, it's a police officer when you realize if you know the person by name or you can feel comfortable with them or you don't feel like you can, you can kind of bring a situation that you wouldn't normally bring to a police officer because you're just police is excellent because they can spend a little bit more time on a mm -hmm. call than the patrol officers get the call, they go down, quell the disturbance, take care of what's, what's going on at the time, write mm -hmm. a report, make an arrest, whatever they have to do. The community police officers can follow up and then they can spend a little bit more time with problems that may be neighbor problems or, you know, things of that nature. So they can hopefully bring the people together, some, come to some kind of a, of a resolution so that we're not continuously going back to the same homes. Yeah. So I just wanted to thank you because I think all of those things, many of them, some of them were here when you came, but some of them you've developed while you've been here as chief and those don't go unrecognized. And I know that they'll grow as, as you go away, but maybe you, as fast as Ms. Uh, Councilor Harris is saying, you, you might forget us, but you know, you can pay attention. <laughs> so. Maybe Mr. Walker, if you could just let us know where the opioid, um, no? Is there a question? The, yeah. So I was just asking in regards to the, the FUDs. For oh, the, sure. Um, I know we're in, through you, Mr. Chairman, we're in the process of planning that. I don't know with 100% certainty if that money started to flow yet, Council, I can certainly find out. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure either. I just, it was just because Chief Keenan was here and he was talking about some things that just uh, perked my interest. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And congratulations. Thank you. What's your last? Any other councils on the motion? Uh, Chair, I would like to take a minute of privilege here. Uh, Chief, it's been great working with you. Uh, I was a department head when you came on in 08 and, uh, a lot of my people are all there, always supporting Joe and making sure he, he gets everything he needs. So um, it's been great. You've been a real pro, a real professional, and it's been a pleasure to work with you over all these years as both a department head and a city councilor. Thank and, you, Councilor. Um, I wish you luck. There's only one thing I wanted to mention to the councilors tonight. We took a vote the last finance committee meeting that we would hold any pay raises, and there are a couple in this that are non-union that go part of the 
the compensation packages the mayor given, and we're going to hold that for a separate council meeting on June fifteenth. All the unions, all those, those are gonna, those are all done. But it's just the, the 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 people that aren't in the union or anything, and those that's actually more done with the administration and uh, municipal finance. So I would just mention that that we have a motion on the floor to approve, but this is one of the budgets we. Uh, collective committees diligently worked down and ch checked them all out. So those will be held and we'll be taking that up at a separate meeting of the finance committee on, uh, on June 15th. Okay. So any other counselors seeing none all in favor. Aye. All thank opposed? you counselors. And I just like to say thank you for your support over the last 40 years, but in particular the last 15 years, I always enjoy coming up to this meeting, which seems a little odd, but, uh, because you do support us, you have support of this council's past and present. Thank you very much for your support. Take care. Uh, Chief, I don't know if you, Chief? One more. One more, we got animal control. Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, we have changed. a- Oh, and just on that note, uh, yep. our animal control officer, Don Conboy, will be leaving the end of June, so uh, we're looking to replace him. We'll be looking to replace him uh, very soon. But other than that, it's just a level funded budget. All right. Thank you, Council President DeBona. Motion to approve. Thank you for uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just Mr. Conboy has done a good job over the years. I know um, um, former councilors have given him a little bit of hard, hard time, and I think he's done a great job. It was very difficult out there at the time. He's a good man. He's a good man. He is a good man. I used to see him all the time out in the streets. So, um, but yeah, with motion to approve. Motion to approve on the motion. Council DeBona. Sure. So while well, you're still standing up there, uh, thank you very much for everything you've done. Uh, and uh, it's pretty impressive, too, that we, uh, we don't even have a patrolman one, is what you're saying. They are basically all patrolman three. Mm -hmm. Is that it? So they, they're all super experienced. So uh, that's Well, they're great. getting there. Well, they're more experienced than patrolman one. Mm -hmm. So thank you for all that. Thank you. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Seeing none. Thank you, Chief. Good night. Thank you, folks. Okay. Next item on the agenda. And the library will be coming up. And I'll also point out, again, I, just, I bring it up because this is going to be for a lot of the ones now that are coming up that we're going to be holding the pay raises, and that will be taken up on June 15th. So we have a library director, Sarah. And this is, I believe this is your first time, Sarah. So yes, welcome. Yes, it is. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me this evening. I am honored to be here for my first budget presentation as the new library director of the Thomas Crane. Um, we've had a very eventful year at the library. We're seeing our attendance and circulation numbers trend slowly up and are approaching pre-COVID numbers in a, a variety of metrics. Uh, we're proud to have completed several key projects at the library this year. We did a complete cosmetic overhaul of the Adam Shore branch, replacing the carpets, recreating the design that was original to the building, although we did skip at re-adding the aqua shag that was there. Um, but the design now matches the spokes in the ceiling um, with the floor. There's new furniture, dramatic improvements to the lighting, um, including pendant lights in the center and newly refurbished uplighting in the cupola, um, all done in a palette reminiscent of the sea and the beach since it's out there near the beach. Um, the North Quincy Community Center has been returned to the library and has completed its renovation, including um, a new bathroom, new sink for cleanup from craft hours, carpet, furniture, floor, and lighting. And the existing programming room there was doubled in size and looks amazing. Um, we have also soundproofed and fireproofed the basement ceiling below the Richardson building. Um, which is going to provide a much better experience for our patrons using the facility upstairs and a safer situation for the preservation of our crown jewel facility. Um, additionally, we built a very nice break room um, furnished uh, through gifts from the Turner, I'm sorry, the Thomas Crane Public Library Foundation. Um, all our projects were made possible by Paul Hines and his staff who were generous with their time, advice, and labor. We definitely couldn't have done it without them. Uh, we also settled a union contract with gracious goodwill I very much enjoyed working with the union committee and the human resources department to achieve goals that benefit the library's patronage, the city, and the staff. 
There's a new org chart which distributes responsibilities across a flatter hierarchy than we had before and gives myself, the deputy director, and the technology director each a manageable amount of direct reports in an effort to be able to spend more time devoted to development of services and programming in each department. Um, due to the great resignation, we experienced significant breakage this year and consequently spent the year hiring and training and then hiring and training. Um, the silver lining is that we refined our employee handbook significantly. Um, we created an onboarding process and manual and added 30, 60, 90 day reviews for all new staff um, to make sure goals and responsibilities were clear, well understood and being met. Um, all our work with the personnel um, items couldn't have been done without the excellent generous help of Patty McGowan and her team in the HR department. In the pipeline for next year at the library, we are, um, we are going to find out any day now if we received an LSTA grant to build a maker space. We don't currently have one in Quincy and um, that would provide um, services so that folks could try cutting edge technologies at the library and learn how to use things like 3D printers um, for free. Um, we're also building for the first time at the TCPL, the main library, a dedicated teen room. So we're gonna give them their own actual space with a door and like decorated for them. They've sort of been shunted around to these little areas and we have a high school right next to us and yet we see about a dozen teens a day. We should be seeing a hundred. Um, we are also gonna embark on an exterior rejuvenation of Adam Shore. Um, again, with the help of Paul Hines and his folks and Dave Murphy over at Natural Resources. We're gonna start to survey, uh, do a needs assessment for the Wollaston branch, which um, has long needed a shot in the arm. We are um, providing a library of things, which is the idea, if you're not familiar with it, is to sort of use collective resources for collective goods. So folks who live in very dense, areas and apartments, we would lend you a stand mixer and a cake pan. So, you know, you only need to make a birthday cake for your kid once a year. You live in cramped quarters. You don't want to make the investment, can't make the investment, or you want to, you don't have a place to store things. You can just borrow it from the library, return it. Um, and also we're hoping to create an archives and special collections department. Um, I couldn't have done any of this without the staff at the library. I'm honored to work alongside this group of innovative, empathetic, and enthusiastic professionals who show up every day under, um, even under extremely trying circumstances. Uh, I wanna thank Mayor Cope for his generous attention during my first year, all of my fellow department heads and their staffs for being so welcoming and supportive, and all of you for your kind attention. Motion, motion has been made to approve by Councilor Kane on the motion. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah. I, um, I, I've always appreciated the programming that the entire library system has to offer, but it's been a pleasure to watch you step into this role and to take over and to add your own flair uh, to the entire system. So I appreciate that. Um, so I'm happy to support this budget. And it's just such a, a great service that the entire system offers to every type of resident uh, in the city, and I always encourage people to pay close attention uh, to the valuable uh, programming that we have going on here. So, thank you. Thank you. Con Council Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Welcome. Um, I just wanted to understand and make sure that I, I didn't want to make any assumptions here. For one of the line items here, it says our, it's labeled Chief Tech Serve, and that is removed for this year, but there's a new line item for Director of Technology. And so, is that is that the same position, but we're relabeling? I mean, you talked extensively about how you're, you know, really going in and cleaning up operations, right? Creating systems, which I love. Like my ears perked up when you were talking about creating onboarding processes and essentially things that will outlive all of us, right? And making sure that there are smooth transitions for your staff. So that's incredible. And so I'm putting two and two together. Is that am I correct in saying that yes. it's the same position, but we're, we're we're cleaning up operations, right? With titles and processes and half and half okay. so it was originally a librarian five position at, which is our department head class um and that was called the coordinate some of our munis titles are outdated and i know muni five is working on getting those they've also been great this year um <laughs> updated so mm -hmm. that they're reflecting what people's actual job titles are in practice so the title that we used for a long time was coordinator of information technology and that's that chief of technical services yep. job that you're seeing but it's been bumped up. Um, it got bumped up during union negotiations to an administrative position. So, mm -hmm. so we're 
that's a technology director position. It sits at the same level as the deputy director. And um, the outgoing coordinator of information technology was recruited heavily by the Boston Athenaeum and left us in August. And between trying to figure out what we were gonna do with the position and the union contract, we have the new technology director starting next Monday. Right. So okay. it's, yeah. Okay, thank you. And and this uh, the last question I have is just, um, it's it's very, very small, but it just had never been funded in the past, the clothing line. It, yes, that was the product of the CBA. So they it's for the custodians. Mm -hmm. um, okay. The library will still provide their um, shirts, which have the library logo, but this gives them money to purchase. Um, and it was always in the contract, but it was never funded, which I didn't understand when I was going okay. through it. But, you know, they plow our, our snow on all of our sidewalks and stuff, so they get a small stipend every year. And if they want to spend it on work boots mm -hmm. or on, like, a really good parka, that's up to their discretion. But it's um, only for the four custodial positions. Gotcha. Okay. Again, I just wanted to understand what those sure. are for. And I um, just Absolutely. quickly wanted to just, you know, echo my colleagues' uh, points that you know, the, the library is such an incredible asset to the city. Um, I'm in particular very fond of the literacy program that you all have. And I've just, there's been absolutely no hiccups and, and no breaks at all. And the transition has been seamless. And I, I just am really excited to continue to work with you. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Council Mahoney. Welcome. Welcome thank to you. your first budget. <laughs> um, I think we're all fond of the libraries here in Quincy, and and um, and it, it's just I spent a lot of time with my kids going to the library when they, they were growing up, and I love seeing the new families going and using the library. And then, um, so I had a quick question for you in regards to I, I was following up with Council Liang with the tech, director of technology. Is that a union job? Because you just mentioned um, the technology. No, that one came out of the that union. came out of the union. And what about um, the archivist? librarians is that those are union those jobs. will be union yes. and then in your budget which are, is could you just kind of identify to me I didn't get to go through your budget I kind of check when I do it could you just kind of give me an idea of like of what majority of it is union and what's not yep absolutely I actually have the exact statistics for you in one of these piles of paper okay so we have three exempt employees the library director the deputy director and the technology director one confidential employee, which is the executive assistant for administration, and then the remaining 49 positions are union okay. positions. Okay. And so then essentially and my administrative team is non-union and everyone else is. So when I'm going through it, I, I, I guess this, and this was a question I was working with the auditor in regards to, so the 3% raises, there's some that have step and level raises in there too, right? I'm sorry, I'm having a hard so time. So with your raises, it. the raises that went in from 2023 to 2024, the negotiated raises were all about 3%, but there's some steps. 3%. And yep, steps. they've settled the 3, 3, and 3. And there's some, ste there's some steps and levels in some of these jobs, is that correct? Um, everyone except the administrative team does steps, yes. Everyone but the administrative team, okay. All right, that's all I had. That's, and I, I guess with the archi one more question, with the archivist librarians, they're new to the budget completely. They'll be in the union. Could you tell me a little bit what your anticipation is with those? Yeah, two? absolutely. Um, so Quincy is such an, an essential part of our nation's history. And um, when I arrived, we had deeply siloed our archives and special collections um, services, basically with one person. Um, and there was a turnaround time of nearly a year to get a basic genealogy or local history question answered. Um, and that's just unacceptable. Like that's always been unacceptable, but for today's day and age, it's just, I mean, people, you get your Amazon like later that day, you can't wait a year for someone to hand over like a street list, you know? Um, so there was only one person available and permitted to answer local history and special collections archives questions. No services could be offered when that person was off sick or out on one of their four weeks of vacation. Um, the special collections additionally are difficult to access uh, both virtually and physically. They've been siloed into the back of the house. A lot of them have gone uncatalogued, so they're not discoverable. We want to make those hidden collections visible, including handwritten letters that we own um, from John Quincy Adams, Frederick Law Olmsted, and several, several other very important figures. We are not, we're not able to provide digital exhibits or displays, which is really considered a very basic service at, in this day and age for a public library. Um, no staff capacity for docent tours of the exquisite architecture of Richardson and Coletti. 
uh, no staff capacity to do outreach and programming. So when the, his, um, the Quincy Historical Society or our excellent city historian asked us to partner for things, we just didn't have the capacity to do it. Um, and limited capacity to support city initiatives, including the very important upcoming Quincy 400, which we really wanna have a seat at the table to help ensure that it's excellent and that we can showcase um, our little piece of the city to the best of its ability. So these folks would work under um, a department head who that department head already exists. Um, we just promoted internally a very capable and talented and experienced candidate who's been with our reference department for about seven years. And what I'd like to be able to do is give her full, two full-time staff people to meet these unmet needs for the community and also perhaps augment um, that department with internships for library school students. Um, who's a person, which, which, which? Where? She is the, the, her current title is Archives and Special Collections Coordinator, and I think her old title was, oh Lord, it, it didn't, um, Acquisition Librarian, I think was her, her previous title. So she's going to, the Acquisition Librarian is going to change to a different title, is it? Yes. And has that happened already, or? So a lot of our titles in Munis, which is where we all see our budget reports from, yeah. were very dated. They weren't the titles we were using in practice. So I spoke to Eric Mason about that um, moving forward into this year. So I think you'll see a bunch of title changes, but they're the same jobs, okay. um, but they haven't reflected yet. So they've been, this person, when did this, just, just for me to understand, so when did this person change? Because this person's been the acquisition librarian, but you're saying j just this year it changed? No, that the, the incumbent um, resigned. Oh, the incumbent. So we promoted someone, oh, sorry, <laughs> into that. And, um, and the, from our reference staff, she was a reference librarian. So okay. I have two vacancies right now. The most recently vacated is this um, wonderful woman who's been promoted to department head and I have a part-time library assistant vacant okay. right now. And just bear with me. So you're somebody that part, the acquisition librarian retired, you changed the title and promoted somebody. And where's that, where's, where are the two positions that you have available? Are they, that are, can I just identify who they are? Um, and your budget, just, just. So it's um, the reference librarian two, marketing and social media, which would fall under um, 5120042. Reference librarians yep. and um, senior library assistant for 30 hours is going to be there's a senior library assistant line, <laughs> sort of towards the bottom. It's uh, senior five one two zero five zero zero five zero. I think so. Okay. Yep. Okay. And those titles will be updated, um, hopefully. Right. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Make it less confusing when we have these conversations. Yeah. I mean that's that. That's too bad that <laughs> it's yeah. probably confusing for yourself when you're going through your budget. I wish I could do it myself, but I don't have that level of access into Munis. Maybe you could if they just didn't do it through Munis. They could have done oh, it through know. something else. I, oh. Eric's happy to do it for me, so we'll get it. I'm sure it'll get done. There are ways to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much for explaining that to me. I really do appreciate it. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the councilors? Seeing none, uh, take a moment of privilege here as the chair. Um, it was a great time not too long ago. We had the 100th anniversary of the Wallace Library, and I'm glad to see that that's finally going to get a needs assessment. Um, it's a very heavily used, and it's, it needs a shot in the arm. It's great what your staff does. They do a good job there, but um, really would like to see that in a, better, in a better condition. So I wholeheartedly support that. And Sarah, welcome aboard. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. And um, at this point, we have a motion on the floor, I would note that the motion is everything but the uh, the pay raises, and those are going to be on June 12th. I said June 15th. It was a mistake. It was June 12th. So I thank God I have I have Jen sitting here to correct me. Uh, June 12th. All right. Uh, I said the 15th, but um, I'd probably be the only one here. But thank God we have Jen to keep everything straight. Okay. So. Um, so at this point, uh, we have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Seeing none. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. Okay, next up, uh, 
Emergency management. Mr. Chairman, this is level funded. Motion to approve. Okay, there's been a motion to approve made by um, made by Council DeBona. Um, let him do a, Ali, do your presentation. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Uh, good evening, Councilors. Uh, yes, our budget is level funded. No increases or decreases from last year. Uh, happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, we have uh, Councilor Duranico. And then Thank you. Ellie, thanks for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Um, you know, after the uh, Clean Harbors incident in, in Braintree, I had a few folks reach out um, just with some general concerns. And, uh, you know, I did let them know at the time we have a few different emergency management plans. You know, we have the Comprehensive Management Emergency Management Plan, the Hazardous Materials Emergency Response Plan. We have the Weymouth Compressor Contingency Plan on top of that. Uh, I was just hoping very briefly, could you walk us through the process of developing those plans, reviewing them, and then how often that you're actually testing uh, those plans to make sure that you know, the city of Quincy is prepared for whatever situation could arise, whether that's in the floor of a basin or all the way on the other end in Council Harris, Harris's area in Squanum. Sure, yeah, thanks for the question. So um, we have a number of plans. Um, uh, dating back to 2018, we started working on these plans collaboratively with you know, city departments. Um, you mentioned the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan. We have the Hazardous Material Plan. We have a citywide evacuation plan. Uh, we have a city continuity of operations plan. Uh, we have the compressor station contingency plan. We have a sheltering and mass care operations plan. Uh, and then there's some other plans as well, some smaller plans. Um, all our plans are reviewed annually and updated once, once yearly. And we try to um, review them with um, other departments and test them uh, through tabletop exercises. We just had two tabletop exercises, one in Boston with the Metro Boston region, uh, testing evacuation plans, and then also one we did multi-jurisdictional with Weymouth and Braintree last month. Okay. Um, and I was also curious just what the collaboration potentially has been like with neighboring towns when it came to uh, the Clean Harbors incident in particular. So we were, we were directly in touch with Braintree Weymouth the next day. Um, I was in touch with multiple state agencies, DEP, uh, the Mass uh, Department of Fire Services and also the U.S. Coast Guard that were all there on scene uh, and got their air monitoring readings, which were all within normal range. So, Okay. Thank you. Council Devine. Hello, Ali. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I want to thank you very much for uh, responding also to uh, Willard Street. I don't think people understand that the uh, emergency management is uh, – not just when all of a sudden something catastrophic happens, even though this was catastrophic to the people that live in that building. And uh, I understand that you responded to that. Is that accurate? Uh, we did. We try to respond to all, uh, all fires above two alarms, uh, particularly if there are multi-structures like that building. Uh, I think it was 42 units. Um, we work with the Red Cross just trying to help people uh, that is placed to connect them with, uh, with resources uh, for housing, et cetera. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate everything you do for the city. Thank you. Any other councils? Council Mahoney. Good job yesterday. Um, so I have a quick question. So your operations manager, is that a union job? Uh, it is not. It was. Um, it was changed a couple of years ago. We changed a couple of years ago. Okay. Yeah. okay. That's it. That's my, that was my question. Thank you. Seeing no others, we have a motion on the floor to approve. I just point out that uh, that there are raises in this, and this is being held, and we'll be bringing it up on June 12th before the council meeting, we'll be going through all the raises. So, um, motion to approve. Uh, we have a motion to approve, all in favor? Aye. All opposed, seeing none, the ayes have it. Okay, thank you, Ali. Thank you. Next, we'll move to the next item. Next item is information technology. This is level funded, motion to approve. I'm, I'm going to Council Harris. He had, he had requested that you had to stand up first. You, Council Harris. You yield to me, really? Um, a, motion to approve. Um, I just want to say, uh, Brian, uh, your, 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 uh, your department is very responsive to me, very helpful. Um, uh, again, uh, responsiveness, that's what is so important to a city councilor. Um, from the department heads uh, and uh, and the folks that work for you, they've helped me several times get out of my 
uh, IT problems and uh, and and also you, you, you know the whole the whole spectrum of your department does a great job. And Thanks. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Council DeBona can speak now. Okay. <laughs> Council President DeBona. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Harris. I just um, just thank you for all your hard work out there. Obviously, um, I know it's a level funded budget, and there's not much more into it to, to, to dive into. But thank you for all your hard work. Thanks. Thank you, the entire IT department. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other comments, Council Mahoney? Nice to, see you. nice to see you. We're not going to be talking about salary, so I'm okay. We're okay. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. So. Um, so one of the things that people will say, I know that we changed our email service last year and we had the email kind of, um, the phishing scheme. We changed the way we do emails. And one of the things that people constantly get frustrated with is that when they're trying to email us, they can't get it through or they can't email all of us. Something happens and the emails don't come through. They don't know if the emails are coming through. I don't know what happens because I'm not, I'm not doing it on that end, but, I'm, but I was just wondering if you ever hear Do you have a spam filter on, so depending on what they're sending, we will yeah. stop it. Like if, yeah. if you knew you were missing an email, we can look at it and just safe lift that It's usually sender. from constituents, so it's usually like they're probably grouping all of yeah, us it together. it could be like Gmail, sometimes we stop. Okay, so it could be, um, yeah. Or something in the email, if it has a certain word that triggers something, it will stop it. Okay. We, we have them there, we can release them, but. Yeah. The only reason why I bring it up is it used to be, I think it, for, for constituents, they say it used to be easier to be able to reach out to us, and now it's more cumbersome. From we the... stopped nothing before. Yeah. yeah but so... we could always show you what is in your box that hasn't made it to you, and you yeah. could say, I think these ones are safe. I think it's less I'm concerned about what's not in my box I haven't made it to me. It's more to be able to, like, I try to make sure everybody has my phone number. Like, there's just other ways you can get people to know, but I can't let, you know, 100,000 people have that. I could, but, I, right. <laughs> but you know, I just, I guess I'm just bringing it up because that's one thing that has come to me from constituents that it can be very difficult for them to um, email us. Or sometimes I, I know for a fact that they'll say things like it bounced back to them. Like, and that's probably because it's, the, I don't know if it's the spam or if it's could be on their end or it could be our filtering. But if it was our filtering, we'd stop it, we'd receive it. It would just be in hold in a hold pattern. Until Does it get delayed? It. Is that what happens to it? Is, is there any chance that it gets delayed before it gets to us? Because... Uh, I'm just not asking. Really. We would stop it, and okay. I would, would have to go in and release it to you. Okay. And again, I'm just asking. But if it, it gets rejected on the user end, typically it's something with their email service. Okay. I'm just, again, just asking because it's a, since we've made that change, um, that's the only, that's the only kind of negative, and I wouldn't say negative, it's just more of a, you know, why can't, we can't reach out to people as easy as we used to be able to. And then they think that we're trying to not. You know, I can only speak for myself because I retired to respond to, to, to their emails and then, you know, sometimes they're frustrated or I'll say, here's my phone number for the future that you can call me because I don't want people to get frustrated about, about something like that. And then that last question I have is, you know, when we talk about some of the contractual lines or some of our web-based products that we have that other, other departments might use, does that come through your department or does it go through other departments? Uh, depends on the department. <laughs> okay, so a lot, a lot of it comes through us. So, like Claire Gov, I, uh, Mr. Mason said that they, we use Claire Gov, and I know it's eighteen thousand dollars we're spending. Is that through his budget or That's through yours? That's through his budget. That's through his budget. Okay. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Council Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, Doctor, but I just wanted to say thank you because um, Council Mahoney brings up a good point. But I, it reminded me that there were a couple of times when I was trying to respond to constituents, and we were going back and forth. Um, for quite a bit trying to figure it out because it wasn't just one email. It happened like sporadically and randomly where we were trying to respond to folks and you just like took over and helped me get the message directly back to the constituent. And you didn't have to do that. I mean, you've got a lot to worry about across the whole city with IT and, you know, just sit there and go. I think it was like over the course of like a few days where you were like going back and forth with like individual emails being like, I got this one email out for you. Don't worry about it. And so you're just, regardless of the issues, you're always, um, you and your staff really, but I just... I appreciate that you personally always take the initiative to make sure that we are able to communicate with constituents. So thank you for your help with that and everything else you always take care of for us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, any other councils? Hearing none, um, all in favor? Aye. All opposed, hearing none. And again, just to remind everyone, there's the one hold that we put on in the beginning on the, uh, on the thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Brian. Okay, next item on the agenda, uh, veteran services. Christine? Okay, there's been a motion to approve uh, by Councilor Liang. Um, on the motion, Councilor Devon. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Christine, Christine you go. Okay. 
I have nothing except that we are level funded and just want to say thank you uh, for all the support for our veterans uh, and their families in the city of Quincy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Christine, thank you for all your hard work with the veteran services. You've done such a great job coming into the position last year and, uh, you know, um, just being out at the parade yesterday, was it yes, yesterday, um, just having it outside right here at Hancock Adams Common for the first time since we've used to do it at Mount Wallace and Cemetery going through the revitalization and just seeing the amount of folks out here and the space being really well used um, and, and just the veteran services across the city. Um, uh, just everything that you've done. Uh, I appreciate all that you've been doing and continuously doing throughout. I love what I do, so thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anybody else? Council Devine. Um, oh. I had Council Devine, oh, sorry. and then you oh, next is Council Mahoney. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to reiterate on uh, Councilor. Uh, at large, President Noel DeBono said, uh, it's exceptional what you do. Uh, I've only been in this very recently, and uh, I got chills in the back of my neck listening to the singers. And uh, it's another shout out to the schools, too, because there are three students from our Quincy program, and they were phenomenal. Uh, it's uh, it's just amazing to see even the young people that they're attending. And uh, the respect that you're um, department shows towards our uh, valued um, people from past and present is huge. So I really, really appreciate everything you've done. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Council Mahoney. Yeah, thank you, sorry about that, Council Devine. Um, 512141, clerk typist two. I just noticed that it went down from 47030 to 45173. She, um, She's a new employee, so I think it's just um, where she f fell in the step. In the steps. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. That's all I needed. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Um, anything else from any of the councilors? Uh, we have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Seeing none. The ayes have it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, inspectional services. Council Harris. Obviously, right off the get-go, I want to um, I want to make a motion to approve, and on the motion, um, just say um, uh, you have it, it, I, it, Jay Jay's here, and if he was standing next to you, I'd say you have big shoes to fill, but that would be kind of uh, 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 bro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I just want to say um, responsiveness. Uh, from the get-go since you've taken office, your department is, is one of the most important, important to, uh, again, uh, uh, any of the councilors, whether you're a ward councilor or, or at-large councilor. Um, going out there, uh, again, uh, going out there, the, the folks that aren't doing the right thing, whether it's, whether it's uh, trash, whether it's dumpsters, uh, mentioning the things off the top of my head that is going through, going on right now, dumpsters, um, uh, building, uh, building permits, not not doing what they're supposed to, what the permits, uh, going out and and uh, the Airbnb situation that I have out, and especially that stands in the first first and foremost of of Quincy is the one in Ward Six down on Bayview, um, how your department. Um, has has been so responsive to me. I had a I had a interview with one of the newspapers that um, I got the information and updated, and I keep getting updated, and that's what's important. So I can at least make my job easier to let folks know what's going on. And I want to thank you. So um, I, I see I see your budget being just fine, and and thank thank you for. Stepping into real big shoes, and again, uh, congratulations, uh, Jay, on your retirement. Um, appreciate everything you've done while I was in office, while I'm with you at the at the helm. And I'm looking forward to continued good success with Rob. Thank you, thank you. Okay, 
Uh, would you like to make a presentation? Uh, Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm here tonight to submit my budget for fiscal for year 24. I'd like to give you a brief summary of what my department does. There are several departments that make up the special services. There's the wiring, plumbing and gas, conservation, weights and measures, zoning board of appeals, code enforcement, and the building department. The plumbing, wiring, and building department work together to help ensure that all types of construction work throughout the city is carried out in conformance with all the applicable codes. The Wage and Measures Department ensures that price scanners and scales are accurate so our citizens can feel confident that the prices they pay are correct. Wage and Measures Department verified the accuracy of over 1,000 various measuring devices last year. It's a one-man department. The Building Department also performs regular public safety inspections of various buildings such as restaurants, all our schools, child care facilities. We check licenses, prevailing wage jobs for compliance. Our staff also checks construction sites for safety, sanitary facilities, erosion, dust, rodent control. Quincy is the seventh largest city in the Commonwealth with over 25,000 commercial, residential, and public buildings. ISD processed over 1,500 complaints and code violations in fiscal year 23. New to us is the regulation, as Councilor Harris alluded to, of short-term rentals, more commonly known as Airbnbs or STRs. This has resulted in an increase in ZBA cases as well as court hearings, violations, inspections, and ticketing for enforcement. Our host compliance software monitors 85 social media sites and has identified 147 short-term rental listings. As a result of our enforcement actions, over 65 have discontinued operating completely. The Zoning Board of Appeals and Conservation Commission heard over 180 cases last year. Inspectional Services collectively issued over 6,000 permits and performed over 18,000 inspections. My fiscal year budget figures have that I have submitted an overall increase of 1.5% over last year. And I'd be happy to answer any questions for the council, and I'd also like the opportunity to thank Mr. Duca for making this transition easy. Okay. All right. Thank you. Council Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. I just had a question about the, two, there's two line items here. One had gone way down, one went way up, and then I just have a, a second question for you. So the first one is on longevity. That went way down from last year. Last year it was funded, and the year before that, around 10,000. This year you're going down to 500. And then the line right after that for education pay, you're going from 2,000, around 2,000 the last couple of years, up to 14,000. So do those two have anything to do with one another since one is going way down, the other is going way up, or they don't have anything to do with each other? Know. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, what was the question I can wrote? It's, uh, so it's the line for longevity. For longevity? Yeah, that's going way down from 10,000 down to $500. The longevity, uh, well, I hear more people going to reach longevity in the next year or so, so that will be going up. Okay, so the next fiscal year it will go back up? Yes. Okay, and then for the line right after that, it's the education pay one. We are roughly around 2000 the last couple of fiscal years, and this year we're going way up to about 14000 Can you just let me know what that line item's for? Sorry, which line item was that? That's the education pay one. Pardon? Education pay? Education. I have a couple of new inspectors. There's a lot, there's a new code cycle coming up. We're going to have to get a lot of books. There'll be a lot more training. They've gone, we went from one code book to a, a family of code books, the ICC. There's about a dozen books for that, for 15 inspectors, it's gonna be expensive. Great, okay, and then the last question I had was with overtime. So looking at this current fiscal year for um, how much was spent thus far, we've gone, we've gone significantly over, right? We've, I think, according to this, we've spent, uh, the amount that's budgeted for overtime in this current fiscal year was a little over 16,000, and we spent about 36,000. And this year, you're not asking for any more money for overtime. So we can't add to the budget, but I'm always curious to see, is that something that you think you would need for this coming fiscal year? Or do you think Hopefully that where not. we... I mean, it all depends on the weather, with fires, what's going on in the city. I see. Oh, so what was the reason for uh, such a... Do, do you know what the reason was for such a dramatic increase in spending this past fiscal year and that you don't anticipate for next year? I don't year? remember to tell you the truth. I, I know that we had a, a lot more inspections. And with COVID, we were in the office a lot later with more people. Okay. Okay, uh, those are the only two increases I had. Again, you didn't ask for any more money, so I, I, you know, if you did, it would make sense. Um, considering what you spent this past year, I was just curious as to what the spike was this year and why we're not looking for it this year. But um, yeah, that was all I had. And uh, Jay, I, you know, echoing Council Harris's point, not surprised at all that you're here. And um, I think that the job that you've done across the city is tremendous. And yeah, congratulations. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay, Thank you, Mr. Motion, Council Mahoney. Thank you. Um, so I just looked at the education pay. It looks like you were. 566% over in your budget, so Which? education pay. So that might be why you went up to 14,000, because it looks like you spent, up, it looks like you spent about $11,220 too much last year. So 
That's my guess. That's why I went up to 14,000. I don't know why I went up. I'm just yeah. So I guess one of the questions I have is, um, so when I'm looking at some of these, these jobs, I'm just trying to figure out, like, um, you have a, a chief wire inspector, and then you have a, an assistant wire inspector. And last year, the chief wire inspector was making 93. It's, it's leveled as one. And the assistant was making 122. And this year, the assistant dropped down to $87,000. So it's a pretty big decline. So what's happening? There's a part-time inspector that comes under the assistant. Pardon me? There's a part-time inspector that's paid out of that same line item as the assistant. So do you only have a half person working now? No, no I have, they're both on now. Okay, so the, so I guess what I'm trying to so say, the chief wire inspector was a half-time? Who was a half-time? Chief wire inspector is full-time. The assistant wire inspector is full-time, and he has an assistant that comes on on Fridays. But the, so he still has the, he still has the half-time person? Yes. Okay, but your budget went from 122621 in 2023 down to 87158 Yes, last year, one of my, the chief inspector was out quite a bit with medical issues, so I had him in a lot more often. Okay, so that budget that you have is 87154 is for one and a half people? Yes. It still doesn't really make sense. What, what, it's budget, in the, in the proposed positions, there's only one person there. And the other thing is, I, I looked into a few other things. I, I'm just concerned that that line might actually, I know we can't add to it, but I'm just it, asking it, you to it, double check that line because I think that line might be off a little bit. And then the other thing I was looking at, um, for your local building inspectors and then also for your compliance officer, um, could you explain the changes in there, the, the salaries there? That's all union, I'm not sure. So you weren't part of the, you weren't part of the new union negotiations? You don't know how that, no. you don't read the union when you're making your budget, you don't check to see what the steps and levels are for? Okay. Um, Council Mahoney? Yeah. Um, I just got from the auditor. Yeah. She has some explanation on sure. that. Sure, that'd it'll, be great. Be Thank you, Council. Um, to go back to the education line, yep. in the contracts that were negotiated um, and settled this year, yep. um, that is an increase in the, the employee's education. So that's why you're seeing um, in the FY23 budget a negative in that line. Mm -hmm. I believe that either you or Council Liang was asking about that. It's because the contracts are now settled, so the employees got what they were, what was negotiated. Okay. Yep. Um, in regards to the compliance officer mm -hmm. line, mm -hmm. that is due to the contract negotiations. Um, in, I believe this person is in the QPEA union. Those unions used to go to step 10. They're now, I believe, going out to step 20. Okay. So there is an increase when those, depending on the length of years the employee is there, why there's probably that large increase. Okay. Then can we talk about the assistant wire inspector as well? Because I know, Susan, okay, you, you so, and I talked about that this, this afternoon. Yep, so the assistant wire inspector, there is one full-time employee, and it, and it appears that this, with it, in this fiscal year budget, um, that person was also getting a higher rate, which I believe was because somebody was out of the office. Yes. So he was receiving a higher rate, so he probably will not be receiving that next year if the person is back. And then they do have a part-time employee that works various hours. It's not a set amount of hours each week. Some weeks it might be seven hours. Other weeks it might be 14 hours. Okay. I'm just concerned we don't have enough in that budget. What about the um, 512-102? I know those steps and levels, too. I know there's people in that that are also hitting the 15 and 20 mark. Um, and when I was kind of running the numbers for the ones that I knew, I think that that, that budget 446 877 seven might be too low with the people who have the steps and levels on that. I know we can't add to it, but it's just something I was I was checking. So I, I believe that I, without me going through and looking at the individuals that are being paid out of that line, mm -hmm. um, I believe that the reason why it is going up to that level is because of the fact that these steps in have increased to due to contract negotiations. Yeah, I'm not I, sure what their current salaries are. I'd have to look yeah, and go if back. We, I think we I can should, look at that line for we're you. We're going to be coming back for salaries. I think we should probably look at that line because okay. I think that line might be off. Um, okay, and then I think that's it. Oh, I guess the one other question is the assistant building commissioner. Was that you, Rob, before? And um, is is that in the process of being hired or what's happening? I'm trying to find another one. It's okay. not easy. And then um, in the contractual, I know Mr. Duca is back as a, Contractual employee, is he being paid out of the contractual line items? He's back as a part-time. Is he, where's he being paid out of though? I'm just curious. He'll be paid out of the assistant 
building the spec list until I find one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Rob, good evening. Mr. Duca, always a pleasure. I don't think I'm in the office as much, Jay. Uh, I really don't. Rob might argue about that, but uh, um, I just want to say thanks, um, especially from the ward counselors. Uh, I know that we're the ones that predominantly bother you guys all the time. And um, as um, Councilor Harris was saying earlier about Chief Keenan, um, you know, you're right there in regards to responding uh, to uh, to us, either code enforcement, uh, a small issue, a big issue, and um, you're great allowing uh, myself and my fellow counselors the time, as Jay did, to to come in and explain a lot of things uh, that um, you know, sometimes are, are bigger developments and some are, are small, but uh, uh, it's really nice to have that relationship to be able to get on there and uh, and go in and, and, and go over some things with you. It makes it easier uh, in regards to understanding a lot of things that uh, happen uh, with planning and, and zoning, concom, et cetera. So thanks, Rob. You, uh, Jay told me you were a good one, and, and he was right. So thank you very much. Thank you. Council President Tibono. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Um, Rob, good to see you up here tonight. Um, uh, you're one, as an at-large, you're one of the departments I really rely on for obviously enforcement. Um, I talked to Jay quite a bit throughout the years that he was on. Thank you so much for all your, your help, especially with those short-term rental Airbnbs um, and the blighted properties. I mean, those are the questions I would always ask. Um, and I'm gonna ask you that. Um, how are we doing in the short-term rentals and the legislation we put in uh, with the help of our, our, our Chairman Phelan here? Um, how are we doing in general across the city? Well, pretty well. I mean, we've gotten rid of more than half of them. Or just they'll just stopped advertising, or they've gone to long-term rentals just by getting the violation notices in the uh, paper or, the, or a warning letter. I think we've got a the 65 that have discontinued operating. We've got 13 right now in Residence A that are in various stages of either in court or going to court. So we start first of all with the warning letters and the fines and whatnot to try and get them to either apply to the zoning board and get a variance if they're going to get that. Or if we, that doesn't work, we keep writing the fines. If that doesn't work after four or five instances, we send it up to the legal department, give it to uh, Jim Timmons and Janet Petka. So we got we thir 13 right now? In we have 13 of residents A that we're chase chasing. Chasing. We two that are okay. pretty, pretty much ignoring us. And they're right now in legal. Obviously, we put that legislation um, in order here as an ordinance change. And um, I know it's obviously helped you give you the toolbox to do these things, to go to court. Um, it's very important and vital in our city because you're living around folks that are, you know, owner ox that are that are, have children and they're playing in the neighborhood. And sometimes you just don't know who's coming in and out of the Airbnbs. You know, hopefully we, we, we hope and we think that it's going to be a good Airbnb or a short term rental. Uh, but sometimes it, it, it throws over into uh, a slash party. And we, we don't want that. And I've, I've had some calls over the years with that particular situation with, um, you know, extra vehicles out on the, uh, on the streets and not knowing and, and stuff like that. So it's a big public safety um, component that we have to take, you know, really, really uh, dive into. And I hope and I think you're going to do a great job with taking it over from Jay. Um, blighted properties. How are we doing out there with the blights? We, 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 had, we had a ton down in Howe's Neck. Um, over the years um, that we really took care of. <laughs> and then I would constantly get calls. He would get calls. I mean, um, how are we doing across the city? Is there clusters of them? Uh, where, where are we? We probably have 20, 25 blighted properties throughout the city. Uh, half of them have medical issues. Uh, they're okay. And there's really nothing we can do with them at this point here, except I think the new treasurer, Molly Smith, is trying to lean these properties to get them more yep. into compliance and, and force the issue sooner. But right now, there's sure. not a lot we can do with them because of the issues. They're medical, they're, they're uh, in probate, there are family issues. So we just keep writing the tickets and hopefully at keep some on point they'll the sell a, I think one we just recently sold. So one by one, we're getting there. They're How many do many. we have? Do many do you think we have out there? Right about now? Maybe two dozen. Two dozen, so about 24, 25 of them out there. Um, no, no, the ones in Housenack have been, most of them have been all taken care of, which has been great. I mean, 
<laughs> you know, um, but we usually get clusters. We'll get them in, in you know, um, in certain neighborhoods and, and we get a little cluster all of a sudden, you know, when one, when one blighted property doesn't want to do their lawns or, or and it's up to here, um, a couple doors down, they want to do the same thing. And it's also the opposite effect. So if somebody mows their lawn and makes it look nice and puts the flowers out there, your kind of neighbor does it. I know that we do the good neighbor with um, uh, Director Murphy and, and, and the gang, um, Commissioner Murphy does it across the city where you know, you're rewarding people with doing their lawns over. But then there's also the cluster of blights. <laughs> and we don't want them. So um, I know I'm going to be talking to you over the next, and I've, it's funny, I, I won't talk to you for, I won't talk to Jay for a month, and then all of a sudden, one week, I'll have three things going on, and it'll just boom, boom, boom. So I guess it happened in the last 24 hours with you, Rob. So I thank, I thank you for getting back to me and, and taking care of some of those issues out there in the city, because this is a very important um, department in the city, um, the code enforcement. And um, Ken Burke does a fantastic job. Oh, yes, he does. Yes, yes he does. Um, so thank you for Ken and, and your whole department for everything that you guys will do moving forward. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Council Devine. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much for everything you do. As a uh, small general contractor, uh, I've dealt with uh, a lot of inspectional departments uh, throughout the area, and you guys are clearly one of the exceptional ones, uh, both you and Jay. Um, thank you for responding. You guys did uh, respond to a, um, an illegal Airbnb over in, I believe, Councilor Andronico's ward, but it's one street away from mine, and you guys have maintained uh, correspondence with me to keep me informed, so I really appreciate that. And uh, I had one more thing, but I already forgot, so. It's not that important. Thank you very much. Okay. Chicken down around Council Mahoney. So sorry, I had a, I, there was a, two, it was just triggered by blighted houses. It triggered me a couple of questions. Um, how does the permitting process work? Do we, do we put the permit, do we collect the permit money up front or do we collect it when the, the, the project's complete? You get the permit up front so we know what you're doing. So when do you collect the fee on the permits, or how do you collect the revenues? How do you collect the revenues for those permits? Like, how's that done? It's everything's online. They go online. They apply for what their permit, whether it's to repair their roof or to repair their stairs or whatnot. If there are, we have any comments, if they're missing their insurance, if there's a contract, a license, or something needed. So the permits are paid up front, and then when you close out the permits, when you go to, to do the inspections to close out the permits, how do those work? It depends on the job. I mean, if it's a roof, it's usually it's simply go up there and verify that it's been done. If it's a new house, you're out there for the excavation, for the footing, for the steel, for the mm -hmm. foundation wall itself, for the rough, for the insulation. For the what, about, what about the projects that stall? Because there's a lot of projects that you'll see, and they'll, you know, part of it might be that they're having supply issues, but really what happens is it's like they start, they stop, they start again, they get a little, it looks like they might run out of money. I don't know what's happening. It's just, it does happen. On, yeah, so on, what happens in that situation? How long, how long do they have? You're supposed to keep the work going continuously. If they stop for six months, pretty much, technically their permit has failed. But with COVID and everything else that's happened in the last couple of years, we haven't enforced that. Okay. So, because there's a few of those that's going on. What about, um, and we talk about this all the time, like there's certain rules, and I think you're just talking about Ken Burke, but there's certain rules, like if you take out your full lawn and you cover it with, like you can't fill in your lawn with hard pavement, correct? That's part of the paving ordinance. So even gravel is considered paving under the ordinance. So what about people who have, like I have one of mine, but them tickets and most of them are pretty responsive and they rip it out. They rip it up. So they put grass back in, you mean? Yes. Okay. So if they have hard stone for the last two or three years, they should they can, probably. If the, if the, well, if it predates the ordinance, we really can't do a lot with it. We can well, when did the it. ordinance come into play? Pardon? When did the or that ordinance come into play? I forget. I think it was uh, Councilor Keenan that put it in. So it's been in quite a oh, while. So it's, it's not predating. So yeah. It's the last couple of years. I'm just, I'm just curious because it's another thing. I either see, it's just, it was just something that was brought to my attention. And I was like, I, I don't know how long. It's been a couple of years that the that they were doing work and it looked like they might be doing some more work and then the work just stopped and then has not ever started up again. So it was. Well, give me a call with the address and we'll yeah. send someone out and find out what's going on. Okay, and then as far as the, um, uh, and the same thing with the stall developments, I was just curious. So it's six months, but it could be longer because of COVID? Yes. Okay. And then how long does a permit before, if you can pull a permit, how long do they have before the permit, if they don't do any work? They, is there a certain time period they have the permit for? 180 that, days they have okay. to get started. Within 180 days they have to get started? Okay, thank you. All right, we have a chair will just to take a minute, no other counselors. Uh, Jay? Thank you for all your great work. Um, as a ward counselor, you live down the inspectional services department. And Jay, Jay and me have got very familiar over the last couple of months with a couple of projects we got. So 
you're continuing on some great great work at the inspectional services department so uh thank you for sticking around and giving some mentorship and rob thank you for jumping in and doing a great job so um at this time uh we have a motion uh all in favor Aye. all opposed seeing none thank you rob thank you thank you thank you jay okay next up Council Clasby. Okay, uh, there's a motion to approve on the floor, but we'll give the department head a chance to uh, make his presentation. Well, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, and through you, good evening to the councilors. I have no presentation, it's level funded budget, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, Councilor Yang. Good evening. Is that a, a, a question more out of curiosity rather than the budget? Uh, what's the process for folks? Um, I know that we provide um, a tremendous service to the seniors across the city provides if they need them. Um, since you're here tonight, if you could just share uh, with folks tuning in at home and you know people who we're connecting with as well, what the process is for them to connect with your department should they need uh, that service? Sure, so it would depend on what the service is. If they wanted to become a member of the Kennedy Center, mm -hmm. they would come down and fill out an application. But generally speaking, it's just a matter of a phone call to the to the main number and then regard whatever that particular services that they need we would either be the conduit to another agency or take care of it ourselves okay oh, sorry i was talking specifically about uh trans transportation services oh transportation mm -hmm. yeah they, uh, if they if they are well there's two types of transportation services uh, one's completely free that's the mm -hmm. medical service we go to every major hospital in boston all the medical facilities and medical facility can be anything from uh, your general practitioner, could be podiatrist, psychiatrist, any, anything that's uh, uh, you know, medically related. Uh, we transport a lot of dialysis. All that's free, and they need only to call, um, let us know when their appointment is, and, and we'll take them in and, and, and pick them up, bring them home. Um, we like a two-week notice on that. If we can do it in a matter of hours, and sometimes we can, we certainly would, would do that. The other service is a paid service. It doesn't operate beyond the city um, boundaries. Uh, it's called the Transvan. That would be anything from medical, I mean, other than medical, uh, so shopping, uh, visiting a friend, um, going to the beauty salon, a barber shop, um, anything that's non-medical, shopping. Um, and that's $80 um, a year, uh, quite affordable. There is a waiting list for that um, service. And the reason there is, if we were to increase that service, we would be cutting into medical. Mm. Our priority is medical. Okay. Would you ever look to hire more staff uh, to expand on that secondary service? You know, I is the need there, I, I, I guess. I, I, right? I think, you know, with transportation, um, anytime there's a survey, um, it's one, two, or three anywhere in the nation. Mm -hmm. So the need is, is great. Um, having said that, though, we're seeing more and more as the baby boomers are now entering the senior uh, market, they're much more familiar with things like Uber and Lyft, and that's kind of alleviating um, that issue. So uh, I hope that answers the question. No, 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 it does. Yeah. I think it's tremendous. I mean, I. I you all do a, a great job to service the residents here in the city, and then to have this on top of that for them, particularly the one that's free to go to any medical appointments, I mean, that's that's phenomenal. So I just wanna make sure, again, that we're clear on that process and that folks tuning in know that sure. that is something that you do provide for them should they ever need it. So. And, and you should mention, too, that you know we're way ahead of most of the other communities, even communities our own size don't have the kind of transportation service that we do. So. Yeah. No, it's great. I hope more people uh, take advantage of it. And should you ever come in front of us and ask for uh, more resources to increase the transportation service to residents across the city, I'm all for it. So keep it up. I'm, I'm really grateful that we that we have that. So Noted. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Council President DeBono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tom, good to see you up here tonight. Um, always great to, to do all the senior activities over at the Council on Aging. Um, obviously, you just had the Senior Olympics uh, which has always been a good, um, um, just asking, did, did the, the mayor's team, volleyball team, did, did the seniors win again? The seniors did win, and I, I tell you, of, we've had some pretty horrendous teams, um, the mayor has, I should say. I bet. This, this was by far the worst. <laughs> 
when I was on the Park and Recreation Board, I played for two years on that team, and we couldn't win. Well, they have the home. We court stacked advantage. our team like with, with height. We had Larry like Liuzzo on the team. We we just couldn't win. <laughs> yeah, it's like the old. So the seniors would the beat us every time. So I guess they have a win streak going. Another question I have for you: Are you still singing at all to the seniors? <laughs> St. Patrick's Day for sure. Okay. And, and occasionally, if, if somebody doesn't show up, and yeah. people love your voice, you know. And I would come in and see you and then making the presentation activities for the, all the seniors. So it's a very vital, important part of our community. Obviously, getting through the COVID um, for the last three and a half years, um, it's very important that we obviously reopened and allowed the seniors to get back into the activities because I think it it longevity it gives you a longevity of life. If I just may, since sure. we've reopened, we have a little over 800 new members since we reopened since you know COVID. That's been fantastic, um, you know and. I thank you for all your hard work over there, and it's, it's a great feeling in, in general. And uh, how's it been to have the animal shelter out, out near you? Has any any of the folks gone over there to take a look? I know I'm sitting next to Susan. She loves yeah. all animals, so yeah. you know. We, we're certainly entertained as they walk the dogs in front of uh, in front of the Kennedy Center, and we'll 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 see them. So I know yeah, it's, it's a great it's, it's, it's nice. It's been a great addition to Ward Six and Council Harris's area for you know to allow that uh, animal shelter there to for, until we get to the new animal sh shelter. Obviously, make the make the transition. Um, but thank you for everything you do in the city. It's a very important department as well. Thanks, well, Tom. Thank you. I have a tremendous staff. So thank you. Great to, to all of you. Thank you to everybody over there. Okay, uh, Council Mahoney. Thank you. Um, nice to see you, Tom. Likewise. So, um, just a quick question. So for your union members, are how many people in your budget are union and how many are non-union? So it's easy, I suppose, to say uh, those that aren't. Obviously, uh, myself, that salary wage temp uh, line, Yeah. they are not union. And social service aid, agent, not union. Everything else is union. So the so social service, which one? The, the technicians or...? Social service technicians are the drivers. Okay, and so they're non. They're they not, are. They are a union. They are a union. Yes. Okay, and everybody else is not. Is it you said? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll go through all the positions if you want. That's the, fine. Those that are non-union. Yep. Would be myself, director. Yep. Salary wage perm there. That's a part-time position. That's a non-union, and then below where it says social service agent. That's non-union. Okay. The social service technicians are the drivers. That they are union. Um, head administrative clerk, manager of transportation, um, senior clerk typist. Those are all union positions. Okay. And then, you know, I appreciate all that you do for the seniors. I, I love seeing the photos of the um, the the senior Olympics. That's just kind of fun. It's sad too, because then I don't see some people and it makes me very sad yep. because that's what happens. Yep. Um, but I do have a question because prior to COVID, I know the four river clubhouse has been, you know, in an extensive long renovation that's been going on. But before that we did have some services down there for seniors. Mm -hmm. And I know that's something that's really, really bothersome to people on that side of the city because we talked about having that and now there's nothing going on down at the right. clubhouse. And they're told that they have to go all the way across the city to Kennedy Center, which I know that that sounds like it's it's really it sounds like you're going from like, you know, Massachusetts to New Hampshire. Absolutely. But it's a really long because for some people who it's a long ride for them. You know, they just, they're just looking for something closer to their home. Is there any chance that that's going to be coming back online? There is actually. And I just had a conversation with Mr. Hines. Uh, you want to, you know, make sure that the building was, you know, sufficient to do that. So yes, we just had a conversation last week and we are planning on bringing back some of the programming. So, so and then in that, so that would be in the room with the fireplaces. Is that that's correct? Yep. Yeah. So, and when do you think that's, is that going to be in this budget or is that going to be, when do you think that program? It, it, it would be, it, it, there's no additional cost. We just utilize staff and much primarily volunteers. The blind center was a, a, a big user of that facility. And then mm -hmm. the others are just, classes that we've absorbed into the Kennedy Center, so we'll move them back over there. But that'd be great, because mm -hmm. that is one thing that um, people have called about and asked about and have been patient about, and then when they were told that the room was going to be available and open, they were told, you know, that they could use it themselves, but that's not really what they were looking for. They were looking for that opportunity to go back and do their exercise classes or the things that they were doing, and when they were told they had to go across, across the way to the Kennedy Center, again, it, you know, although I sometimes say, like, just coming from my side of the city, just to even downtown Quincy, sure. it can take you forever, so they, yeah. they you know... 
So I just, it's, it's, it's not unusual to, to say that, but I do appreciate that that's something that's going to be coming back and it's, and, and you, and probably within a month or so, is it you said? Um, maybe in this budget, yeah, so maybe it, we it, can start yeah, in July. Yes. <laughs> It'll happen within the next few months. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you could let me know when it happens that way. Sure, I can, I'd be happy to. If I know it's happening, then I can actually just say to the people who are, that have been got in touch with me, I can let them know it's happening too. Just we'd, a time frame, okay? We'd, we'd be happy to do that. Thank sure. you so very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Councilman Dronico. Thank you. Just touching off of what Councilor Mahoney was chatting about uh, last week. I know he's last on the list here, but uh, Mr. Hines and I had the opportunity to do a walkthrough of the Four of a Clubhouse and mm -hmm. talk about the progress that's been made over the past three years. And you know, we can get more into why the delay has happened, but I know a lot of seniors are looking forward to having some of that satellite programming coming back. Uh, as Councilor Mahoney mentioned, we are getting calls about it. and. I would very much love to see that programming return sooner than later. Uh, my understanding is that the fireplace room is open and good to go. The bathrooms uh, are readily accessible from the main entrance uh, as well. So I, I think we're all set as far as um, space is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, and sooner rather than later would mean a great deal, not only uh, to myself and my colleagues, but also to those who actually utilize those services. Uh, but outside of that, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us tonight. I appreciate all you do for the city. Thank Likewise, you. thank you. Any other councilors? Uh, seeing none, we've already had a motion from Council Harris for, for approval of the budget. Uh, just a note that we'll also be do, taking the salaries and those will be coming up on, uh, on June 12th at the con before the council meeting will be having a finance committee meeting. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Hearing none, thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Take care. Okay, next item before the council, uh, TPAL. Mr. Grennan. This podium's never meaty enough for all the papers I bring. Oh, yeah. Where are they gonna slip off? All right. Go right ahead and make your presentation. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Councilors. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present the TPAL fiscal year 2024 proposed budget. I'd like to point out the changes in the budget. Um, in personnel services, there are contractual increases due to collective bargaining with the units for 1139 QPA and Supervisor Union. Um, you will see a elimination of a vacant general foreman position. That position has been vacant for two and a half years since the passing of Steve Cubitt. Um, in place of that, we're looking to add two traffic maintenance positions. That would bring us to a total of three. Um, there's one crew that takes care of all the signage, all the pavement markings, do all the block offs for the parades um, for the entire city. So adding the two will allow us to run two crews, which will be beneficial, I think. And um, <clears throat> you'll see an increase of the offset of parking receipts to $950,000 from 900,000. The only other change you'll see is in contractual, an increase of $50,000 for parking garage operations. That increase of $50,000 matches the increase of um, the offset and that is because the garage has come out of warranty. There are some minor maintenance items that have come up and we just want to be um, better funded to take care of any small items that come up over the next year. Happy to take any questions on this. Motion, okay. motion has been made by Councilor Kane to approve on the motion. Councilor Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. How are you? Good. Uh, the general foreman that you said was removed because of the vacancy and then you added another two positions. Where did you add the other two positions? So if you look, there's actually a typo for budgeted positions for line item traffic maintenance, 512316. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It should, it reads two, it should go to three. Gotcha, okay. That's what I thought I heard and when you said three, I was like, yeah. there's two, okay. Um, and that, that would bring the overall budgeted positions to 24 okay. from 23. Got it, and then for the parking receipt offset, you're increasing that, so you're essentially saying that even though the parking garage operations are going up $50,000, you are anticipating that we'll receive additional $50,000 in revenues though from parking receipts, correct? And so it's really, when you're looking at this, it does level out in, in the sense that, you know, again, we have to pay $50,000 more, but we're getting $50,000 more anticipated 
in receipts. Yeah, the the parking receipts currently total just over a million dollars. So there's there's room to increase That's that. That's fantastic. Yep. Okay. That's it. Oh, I guess I just put a plug in like that. You know, in some we've talked about this a lot, right? But like in some neighborhoods, there are some concerns with folks not um, minding parking signs. And so if we can increase this parking receipt even more over a million dollars by ticketing more folks where they shouldn't be parked, then I say go for it. Absolutely. So, thank you. Thank you for everything you do. You do a phenomenal job and I'm really um, excited to continue to work with you. I appreciate so, that. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Council McCarthy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ted, good evening. How are you? First, thank you for all your help in Ward 1 with everything. Um, so it's my favorite ward. No offense, <laughs> I live there. I grew up there. <laughs> Hey, I'm looking at the increase in bike lane improvement. Is that you're going up a little bit? Is that just to paint them? So it's it's staying the same as it was from last fiscal year. We did go up last fiscal year from fifty thousand to seventy thousand. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's um it's actually a little mishmash of things that we do. We do it's maintenance on the bike lanes. We are adding more bike lanes in the city, so there's more to maintain. We're up to about six miles of bike lane. Um, there's another six in various stages of planning, so there's a lot of pavement markings out there. Um, it also allows us to do, this fiscal year, we actually have encumbered um, two crossings, bike-friendly crossings at off-street trails, one at C Street at State Street to get on the MWRA dike, the other at the Commander Shea Boulevard at the Riverwalk. So it allows us to do, it's not just bike lanes, it's more overall like bike improvements. We're also doing repair stations. Um, with some manual tools, some air pumps that are going to go at the public libraries this summer. Sure. And uh, just a general question, Ed. I, I know um, you staff pretty well. You feel like you, you, you're staffed enough. I mean, it seems like, um, you know, things get busier in Quincy. You guys get busier. You're, you're involved in a lot, a lot of things that we, a lot of activities. Um, I mean, the first word is traffic. So, uh, you know, uh, when there's a parade or anything going on, do you think you're, you're, you're staffed enough? I think this, adding the two traffic maintenance positions will go a long way to getting to where we want to be. Again, like I said, we only have one staff, um, one crew to, you know, every sign that gets knocked down, every crosswalk that needs to be painted in-house, um, you know, every event, every parade, that they handle all of that. So right. being able to add an extra crew will be uh, crucial to our ability to better serve the residents. So I, I think the two additional traffic maintenance person people will um, go a long way. No, that's good, Ed. And, uh, you know, again, thank you. And, and thank you to Allie yeah. Rule. I, I know she works hand in hand and gets involved in a lot of things that we look at when people ask for certain things. And I think it makes sense. And you guys might come back with a different opinion. So the banter back and forth is, is is good and healthy, so thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely, I'll extend that to her. Thank you. Okay, Council Andronico, and then Council DeBono. Ed, thank you for joining us tonight, I appreciate it. Um, first, I just wanna say thank you to you and your entire team. Um, I know there have been a handful of occasions where uh, you have personally gone out uh, earlier in the morning to try to rectify a situation that we've had, um, and your team has tried as well. Um, so I know you're always given 110% on that front. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you and I have talked about in the past is I think the, an issue with the uh, rapid uh, beacon flashing systems, is that right, for the crosswalks? Um, yep. And that we were in the process of replacing uh, a lot of those because of some of defect? Right? Yeah, there was a, a batch of, I believe, six of them that we purchased maybe three fiscal years ago is right when the RRFB systems were gaining popularity. There was a lot of vendors in the game trying to get a foothold. Um, we made, I guess, a poor decision in retrospect and bought what is essentially junk for one of the companies. So there's six that have been in the process of being taken down over the course of the summer. Um, one has been replaced. We are awaiting from a different vendor five more. They should be in hopefully any week now to get those substandard ones up to snuff with the rest of the city. Okay. So I know we'll you know, have a few replacements here and there, um, but then just moving forward, uh, additional uh, systems. I believe we're trying to implement one, implement one on Southern Artery. Yeah, um, presidential states. Yep. Yep. Presidential that's uh, that's actually encumbered with the same project of the the bike crossings that we talked about for. Perfect. So yep. we're uh, we're excited to get that one done too. Okay. Um, and then I also wanted to follow up and ask you just about uh, working with the MBTA uh, as far as a covered bus station out in front of a, a thousand Southern Artery and just the progress on that. Yeah. So um, bus operations, we have a, a biweekly coordination with the MBTA. 
bus operations has um, been given the updated request that the building at Thousand Southern Artery is now interested in um, having that. They were supposed to have reached out to the property owner. I can certainly check in on that and make sure that that connection has happened. Um, if it has not, I'm happy to, to drive that myself. And we, but we, they are, the MBTA is excited to do that. Perfect. No, we'd, we'd appreciate you following up and just yeah. staying on it. Um, but outside of that, again, thank you for, for being here and joining us tonight. Enough for everything you do. Thanks very much. Uh, Council De Bono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ed, good to see you here tonight. How are you? Um, uh, just getting back to the flashing, blinking crosswalks. How, how many do we have across the city? You know? uh, it's approximately 35 right 35? Yep. Okay. I mean, obviously, over the years, your, your predecessors, Mike Coffey and Chris Cassani, um, they really laid out a lot of the kinks along the way as we formed this, um, you know, TPAL, you know, traffic parking alarm and lighting some years ago uh, when it first got onto the council. And we... We, it was it was difficult out there, and um, I think you got <clears throat> a lot of adjustments of what they both did and made um, have fallen into your lap. Um, uh, I see a lot uh, a lot of different things across the city. Um, those flashing, blinking crosswalks are very important. Is there any way of getting more funding for that, or how do we how do we do that? Is it coming from sure. a, a grant, or what, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we've been extremely successful with grants in the last fiscal year. We, uh, we actually received $1.2 million in grants um, just in 22 and 23 alone. Um, one of the grants that we received was for an equipment-only grant through Mass DOT Shared Streets and Spaces. Uh, we did order five new sets of RFB crossings. Um, they do have locations slated. Um, they have not come in yet, but it's, we're always looking for that sort of like quick hit grant that we can get the equipment paid for. Sure. Um, we also, you know, as we're looking at improvements in corridors um, and working with the state and the DPW, if there's an opportunity to put in a foundation for one and, you know, maybe we throw in a couple bucks to get the RFB funded, um, that's something that we've been willing to do and we'll continue to do. Yeah, because obviously over the years we've had some folks get hit some fatalities. My good friend Donnie Bowes, which I miss every day. Every time I go to the Red Sox and see my good friend Dave McCarthy, I also look up at uh, uh, Donnie Bowes' little entrance there, and um, I really miss him. And that's why I talk a lot about this um, um, deeply about getting as much as we can out in the city. And I yeah. think you've done a pretty good job. It, it's tough. I know. I, I know it's difficult. I like to put him in all different areas. But uh, if we can somehow get to some of the areas, I know we have them. Um, um, down by the um, Veterans Memorial Stadium, which has been huge. Because yep. the kids are crossing the streets in both areas where those blinking, uh, especially at night, yep. when they're crossing the streets. Yep. Um, the more we can get, the better. Yeah, totally um, agree. So, um, some public safety is very, very important. I know um, my my colleague here, Chuck Phelan, is going to be leaving here. And obviously, I've, I've attended the meeting with the uh, possible Adam Street, which is the, the possible roundabout. Wh yep. where, where are we in that process? And as we move forward with um, the traffic mitigation and the speeding. Sure. So uh, the, the Adam Street roundabout at Whitwell Street, it is um, close to final design. We had the public meeting that was hosted by Councilor Phelan. Yep. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of comments that came out of that meeting. Um, the engineering firm that we're working with, Foss and O'Neill, on that uh, was wonderful. Um, to, we worked together to incorporate as many of those comments as possible. Um, the project is very close to being at a draft final design. It's been circulated, um, you know, between the engineers in the city to just make sure there's no glaring uh, mistakes on it. Once that we're once we're happy with that, we're going to be working with Councilor Phelan to set up a, an additional meeting, get some additional feedback on what the proposed project is, and then go from there. Yeah, both you and Councilor Phelan ran the meeting very well. I, I attended it downstairs. And both of you ran it really well, and we got a lot of opinions in, in different st stages from, from, from different folks. Um, is there any other alterations across the city that you see that have something like that coming in a roundabout or traffic mitigation somewhere in the city where it's looking to um, go forward in the next year? Sure. It's going to be a pretty busy year. Um, there's a, a MassWorks funded project intersection at the intersection McConville Way and Hannon Parkway. That's expected to be uh, mobilized in August and continue into next year. That's a, a new traffic signal at the intersection of Dunford, um, excuse me, at McConville, at Hannon, a realignment of parking way coming up in front of the Beth Israel building. 
um, and then a, an eventual abandonment of the existing signal at parking way at Hannon. And what that does is provides more queuing space between those two signals that are really tight together. Mm -hmm. We're thinking that the functionality of that will be much better. Um, also, we are in the process of designing a pedestrian improvement at the intersection of Washington and Elm. Um, that is a, a, a place that there's been some repeated uh, incidents near misses. Um, it's a, a tightening of the crossing with bump outs is what the vision is. Um, that is close to being final design. We'll circulate that when we have that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, and then just overall, like adding pedestrian crossings where we can. We have a, uh, you know, I've spoken to it a couple times already, a project with six pedestrian, new pedestrian crossings with crossing beacons going on this summer. Um, you know, we're always working to increase the pedestrian mobility around the city. Yes, yeah, so obviously as our city grows, we just have to be taken a good eye on this all. Uh, you know, your TPAL division is very, very, very important um, as we move forward into this next dimension of things. Absolutely. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, state funding where they, they put in their guidelines and their protocols. Um, if we receive the state funding, like for instance, um, I know we have the C Street project coming in very soon. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we receive funding and we, we go by their protocols? Uh, sure, there's, I mean, there's a lot of different methods to receive state funding. Um, they have been, in the last few years, very uh, happy to give out grant funding. Um, they have a couple programs that we use frequently, the shared streets and spaces being one that we've been extremely successful with. We've gotten, um, you know, three rounds of that at I think each one, like, I think we got 200,000, then 350,000, and then this last one we got just shy of 500,000. Um, and then there's the state TIP process, transportation improvement program that, you know, you, you, you bring a, a project and improvement yep. long term to the state gets put on a, a list that could be like four, five, six years out for funding. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it's up to the cities to sort of jockey their way to get their project funded. That's how we're funding State uh, C Street. That's um, how we're hoping to fund Rusciutti Drive, that improvement once we get there. Um, you know, so there's a lot of methods. There's a lot of money that the state has to help us out with these sort of things. Are you in contact with the state for that Rashuti Drive, which is bound at Quarry Hills? Are you in contact with, um, you know, uh, I guess I could call it um, State Representative Ayers, or oh, yeah. have you been in contact constantly? Because I, I know I've, I've talked to him quite a bit about that intersection and how we got yeah. to get that taken care of. So I'm glad you spoke about it. Yeah, yeah, we're excited about that project. Um, you know, about four years ago, that's a state controlled intersection, the intersection yep. of Willard Street and Rashuti Drive. The city, you know, advocated for an improvement there um, based on what we heard from our residents, the crash risk, um, the high severity crash risk. And um, <clears throat> what we've done is we used mitigation money that came from one of the developments up there to start a design process through DOT standards for that project. It's gotten to the point where there is a project manager assigned by DOT, which is great. Um, it's at almost at final 25% design. Um, and I say final 25% design because we've had to resubmit 25% design based on the state's guidelines on how they want to see the intersection, um, which has been a little bit frustrating. We've worked closely with Councillor Devine over here in the state delegation, Senator Keenan, Representative Ayers. Yep. Um, so we're, we're hoping to have 25% 25% uh, <coughs> design finished in the next month, uh, design public hearing, hopefully scheduled sometime this summer. At that point, we'll, uh, kind of we'll move forward and it more so gets handed to the state at that point. My last question will be outside of Father Bill's slash police station slash McDonald's on the other side, Roxy's. Mm -hmm. That entire corridor, you know, I've, we've had Joe Shea from Granite Partners in here quite a bit for, the, for that mitigation over there. That is a very area that we need, to, we need to get better traffic flow and obviously pedestrian access. Has it been an area on your radar for when we get into that next phase? Yes, yeah, certainly. That's, we, that's been the subject of multiple grants that we've applied for. Um, thank you very much. Sorry, Ed. You, 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 these are very important No, stuff. it's good. It's good. <laughs> and I, you know, 
I'm talking fast and not. No, it's all great. To breathe. It's, this is some very important stuff for the citizens um, and the pedestrian safety. And yeah, it's you know those are that's a corridor that we've targeted um, multiple grants. We've gone for federal raise grants. We've gone for federal safe streets for all grants. Um, most recently, we're discussing pursuing a Mass Works grant for that great. those two locations. So that's certainly extremely high on our list for areas that we want to touch with pedestrian improvements. Thank you, Ed. I really appreciate all your hard work. This is um, you, you undertaking that you're, you've really taken on head on first. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very you, much. Chairman. Okay, Council Devine and then Council Mahoney. Ed, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it. I'm doing good, thank you. Uh, yeah, you guys are exceptional down there. You've been really good to me. Uh, I'm brand new, so uh, your response time has been unbelievable. And uh, you clearly take uh, public safety seriously because uh, I know it sounds funny, but one light being out can really change somebody's life. I mean, if somebody gets in a even a slight accident and has a, a neck injury for life, that's it's debilitating. So you guys, I know you take it extremely serious. Uh, and back to Rachuti Drive, uh, Senator Keenan and um, Representative Bruce Ayers uh, and uh, T-Pal, we all were able to get on a, uh, a Zoom meeting with... Uh, Mass DOT, uh, they don't seem to work very well for us. Uh, you guys have done a really good job of uh, reaching out and um, basically spoon feeding them what we need to get uh, to make uh, Retreaty Drive uh, a safer place. Back to that whole thing. If we save one person from uh, some type of bodily injury that's recurring for their life, it's huge. Uh, and your, our, our <coughs> engineer, Allie, she, did a really good job at that meeting. You know, we had uh, state police, we had um, Quincy police, we had uh, three of you representing, uh, and she got in there and uh, you guys clearly had a plan and you pushed it in there. And I'm happy to see that um, Mass DOT is finally, you know, responding properly. Yep. And uh, I do know that Senator Keenan and Ayers are working diligently on that. I believe they almost have everything in order, so it'll be great to see that come to fruition. And uh, so I wanted to thank you once again very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Council Mahoney. Thanks. Hi, Ed. Hi. I, I'll, I only have a couple of questions, oh, and some of them me. you've helped me on. So um, one of the questions I had was for um, Newport and Adam Street. Yep. I don't know what we, I know we kind of talked about that for a brief moment. Did you mention that earlier that you're, you're going to be doing something with that or are we doing anything with that? Yeah. So, um, we looked at that, as you know, we did the, the study, mm -hmm. um, we have added the speed feedback for southbound traffic. It's near, kind of near the carriage house of the Adams mansion as you're coming southbound Newport Ave, uh, the, after analyzing the crash data, the thing we saw most was lane departures in the southbound. So it's important to slow down the speed coming that way. Um, there have been markings, um, like first draft markings put down to kind of handle like lane designations. There's a little gore along the wall of the subway um, to help people better travel through that without departing their lanes and sideswiping and getting into all sorts of crazy crashes over there. So um, yeah, I mean, it was it's a good example of being made aware of an issue, going out, looking at getting the data, getting the crash data, and then have an alley who's an extremely talented engineer come up with a plan for um, what to do out there, and then it goes, goes to me to get the staff to implement it, so. How long would, is it gonna be implemented? I, I know that you did all the study, but I guess the implementation, when would that happen? Yeah, part of it's already been implemented. Okay. The speed feedback's been installed. The changes to um, the signal timing yeah. to increase like the red clearance has been done. The payment markings are halfway done. They're marked out on the road. Um, they just haven't been like final course painted yet. Um, so yeah, we're, we're pretty far along on that. I guess the reason why I asked that is because the other night I was driving down it and I almost saw like a head on collision coming up from Newport headed to downtown. It's just where they, yep. it's like if you had a left turn only at something, I don't know. It's just, it's just yeah. crazy. You can't get across it and people play chicken. It's just kind of nuts. And that's what, that's what the big issue was there. Yep. But I appreciate it because I know you're working on it. So yep. I'm not here to tell you how to do it. So yep. the other question that I had was, and I got this from a constituent and this is um, in regards to Linden street. Linden I know street. 511 Hancock street. I think that Galvin is the Galvin project that's going on. I yes. believe they were supposed to be worked. Is there new traffic lights that are going to be going in over there? The traffic signal that is existing is being retrofitted from a pedestrian crossing to a full 
uh, traffic signal. Yeah, because I guess what they're doing is they're um, they're not able to get out of Linden Street right now, yep. and people are going down. They're not supposed to go down that street, but they're going down it, so they're just concerned about that as well. Yep. So with the, there's a plan in place. The um, the equipment there is uh, really old. It all needs to be replaced. Um, the detection doesn't exist for vehicles because it's only been for pedestrian crossings to this point. So there's a fair amount of work there, but we're committed to upgrading that to a full actuated signal. Do we know when that's going to be done or when it's going to start? Or uh, we, The parts need to be ordered. The funding is, you know, we're still trying to figure out all the, the stock lists and the funding, I would think, hopefully the fall, okay. to be honest. I guess I was confused because it sounded like in her, the email that I got, it sounded like it was part of the permitting for it. And that's a, that's a whole other question. So sometimes these things happening during, you know, when they're going to ZBA to get approved for things, great traffic things get changed at ZBA. Yeah. Which really isn't the role of ZBA, but sometimes we add things like at 105 C Street, they're going to make it a no left turn with some kind of bump out. But I was like, hmm, I don't know. That's like, you're going to have to figure that out because that was a promise it's going to happen. But then there's a whole other problem because that's the Timmins project. When you go down the street a little bit further, you can't, you can't get into that far left-hand lane to take a left to go down um, Quincy Shore Drive. So they're going down into the neighborhood and they'll be taking lefts down there. So that's a whole other issue that's going on okay. with that. Um, and then the other question that I had was, um, if I can read my notes, which I can't, which is so typical, I can come back to this one on that. Um, so with the with the Rashidi Drive, and I appreciate the update in regards to that. Yep. I know. Does the state have funding for that yet, or are we funding? That's the state that has to fund that. The state that. is. So the city is funded. I know my colleagues have been talking about Rashidi Drive, but that's a you know I mean. It's not part of these budgets. These are department department budgets tonight. So I, I don't know if Mr. Grennan has that information or not. And uh, they're all capital improvement uh, in regards to uh, the state. So I don't know if you want to get down that hole, but I, I, it's up to you. Right. Um, well, uh, we, well, we've I wanted had, to stick to what's in front of us, which well, is the well, department. We've already had a couple that have come it's up. It's okay. You don't have to answer my questions. That's no, what what I, would, I, would, I understand it. What I would tell you, we'll, if it's a... If it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go right What on. I would tell you is um, the city has agreed to fund the design, mm -hmm. up to 25% design. It will then, the intention is for it to go on the, the state tip list. Um, it does have a DOT project code. It has a DOT project engineer. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the scale of this project compared to other projects on the state tip, it's, um, the state is hopeful that it's something that could be slid in um, on the tip in a sooner year rather than something that's programmed for five, 10 years out. Mm -hmm. um, that will be ultimately up to the state yeah, no, to I do that um, with our sort of endorsement, um, you know, and to, and to ask for their partnership on that to get it moved up. And by no means, this is not a problem that I'm having with you. I appreciate your answers. I just sometimes feel like I can get censored up here. I'm not trying to cause any problems, but I truly do yeah. appreciate it. And I truly do appreciate the interruption of my questioning. Nobody else's question got interrupted when I asked those questions. So I do appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, with no other counselors, Chair will just take a minute. Um, was brought up on Linden Street and all yep. that. I know. I know we've had the discussion with it. Yep. And it was a commitment made by uh, Chris Cassani at a planning board meeting. We're gonna do it. And uh, there was money put in by the Galvins. Yep. Who were supposed to pay for part of it. Yep. So that is in process, and I know I, we've had that discussion. I believe I've got some of the same emails, and we that that is underway right now. Right? It is. Yep. Yes. Yep. So yeah, there's partial funding from the Galvins through the project approval and then we're finding the rest of it to do it. We've, we've okay. certainly agreed to do that. All right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Brennan. Uh, I call you regularly and thank you for all your time. It's always a pleasure. Time. Uh, okay. Uh, we, have a, we have a motion to approve and I'll just make the note that we're going to be coming back on the salaries. So uh, we are the, I believe you're the only one in your department with, uh, there's a couple in your department. That yeah, are, there's those, three. Okay. So just so you understand that. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. All, 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 any no's? None? Uh, the ayes have it. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Okay, the very next one, uh, we, got, uh, <laughs> we got Mr. Murphy, Natural Resources Department. And we're going to start with the uh, Cemetery Department. Motion 
Okay, a motion has been made to approve. Uh, but at this time, uh, Mr. Murphy, if you have a presentation to make. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the council. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to appear before you and talk about the uh, many great things that are happening in the Department of Natural Resources. I'd like to begin by introducing uh, my colleagues uh, that join me this evening. We've got our Recreation Director, Michelle Hanley, our Park Department Program uh, Manager, Paul Darty, our Recreation Department Program Coordinator, Eric DeBoer, and our Environmental Scientist, Heather Liss, is with us uh, also this evening. So uh, before you tonight is a budget that helps us maintain uh, 52 parks, more than 74 different locations uh, to include veterans memorials, islands, open spaces, and planting areas, six municipal cemeteries with over 150,000 graves, uh, provide recreational programming through our uh, free summer playground program, sports clinics, swim lessons, Prevention Friday, sailing programs, Happy Acres Day Camp, Winter Basketball League, uh, went to gym program, Happy Acres Day Camp, um, all of which have attracted more than 186,000 recreational experience for Quincy residents over the course of the last year. Uh, this budget also helps us operate and manage a nine hole golf course set to run an operational profit for fiscal year 23, while providing a permanent home for our high school girls golf team, our Quincy High boys golf team, our senior Olympic golf tourney, and our new senior golf league. This budget will help us manage our urban forest, uh, maintaining close to 22,000 street trees and likely just as many throughout our parks, open spaces, and cemeteries. Our forestry crews in the last year responded to 260 requests thus far in this fiscal year from residents for service to street trees. Those requests uh, result in 157 maintenance prune and cutbacks and 104 removals of dead trees along our streets. Our maintenance pruning contract that was supported by this council last year helped us address many of our larger mature trees, trees throughout the city, improving the overall health and condition of 165 mature street trees. This past year, we planted 416 street trees through our fiscal 23 uh, budget appropriation, and we worked in close cooperation with the DCR to plant an additional 410 trees along Quincy streets. Our ratio for new street tree planting versus removal this year was a whopping 7.85. This budget will also help us provide support for all city events, including yesterday's Memorial Day Parade and preparations in all of our cemeteries. Uh, our very exciting Flag Day uh, Parade upcoming. Uh, Chief Keenan, who was before you early tonight, is our Grand Marshal this year. We encourage everybody to come out on June 10th for the parade and the fireworks. Uh, programs such as Clean the Greener, a Christmas Parade, uh, our holiday lighting displays, and many others. Uh, this year's budget before you, I think, is pretty straightforward. We were requesting essentially level function in both the park division and cemetery division with increases uh, requested in summer help to help us keep up with minimum wage increases in a competitive labor market. And we were requesting an additional 15,000 on repairs maintenance budget to ensure we can protect the improvements that we've made to our parks and playgrounds over the past number of years. You will find in our recreation division is looking to continue to grow to meet the public needs. Uh, through Michelle's leadership, we are expanding our inclusionary programming, extending our after school programming into the spring months taking on the Quincy Track Club, adding adult programming, and in order to do so, we're also looking to increase the seasonal line and add a new operations supervisor position to assist with the additional programming and services. I certainly appreciate the council's continued support of our efforts, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, uh, we have three different budgets before us, so let's start with the cemetery, and I'd ask all question to, we already have a motion on the cemetery. Um, so the first one up is gonna be Councilor Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and so we're just doing it by each of the departments, correct? Great. Okay. Cool. For us right now. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, hi, Commissioner. All right. So if I could, for the motion um, on the cemetery budget, we get, did get the memo from you, Mr. Chairman, that you, I mean, Mr. Commissioner, that you were uh, looking to get a reduction on the cemetery maintenance line, uh, number 512601 to reduce that by 93,000, right? So I just wanted to confirm that that is accurate according to the memo you sent to us? That is correct, Councilor. Okay, so then you know, based off of that, could we make a cut on that line item number 512-601 of $93,000 per the recommendation of the commissioner? Um, and that brings us to 156 is this, this is on the cemetery? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Cemetery uh, maintenance man. To, to make a $93,000 cut? Yes. Um, motion has been made on $93,000 cut. Is this, this was the amendment you sent to us, right? Yes, it is, Mr. Chairman. There was yes. a, an issue where Munis picked up a position and classified two positions twice. 
So we caught it and suggested we're not looking to add new positions, so it would be a, a welcome cut to reduce it by 93,000 down to the 156, 688 okay. figure. We have, we have a motion to cut $93,000 from that line. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, hearing none, the ayes have it. Thank you, and then just one last question on cemetery, if I could, Commissioner. So under ground, um, groundskeeping supplies, it's the line item uh, 540600. You had asked for uh, 30000 at the last fiscal year and again 30000 for this fiscal year, but nothing had been spent uh, to date from the year-to-date budget report that I have. So could you, I guess two questions there. One, why wasn't anything spent out of it last year? And two, obviously moving forward into the next fiscal year, you are requesting it. Um, you know, Historically speaking, you're pretty conservative with your budgets, and so I have no doubts that you wouldn't ask for something if you didn't need it. I mean, you just told us to cut 93000 from your budget, so again, you, you're proving that you know. You don't need something you're going to tell us to cut it, but if you could just again clarify why that wasn't spent this last fiscal year and what you're anticipating it to be spent on in the next fiscal year. Sure, Council. That money will be spent in this fiscal year. This is our Super Bowl. This past weekend is when um, probably 75% of the visitors to our cemeteries uh -huh. uh, go to our cemeteries. So May and June is probably the busiest time of year where we uh, purchase all of our flowers, our loom, our seed, all of our groundskeeping supplies. So we're going to. Um, we've probably incurred. I don't know if they've been processed yet, but we've incurred a number of bills on that line in the last couple of weeks and I run up to Memorial Day in the spring season. Oh, so it will be spent down before the fiscal year then. Okay, good. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the, any others on the budget? Council, on the cemetery budget, Council Mahoney. Hi, Dave, how are you? Good, Council. I, so I just have two quick questions. One is on the Wallace Cemetery. I know you're doing the gate, the gate over and I know that's coming from the opera funds. Um, I did get a, phone calls from people, I, I actually talked to some people in the neighborhood too, where you took the, the historic wall, that's the stone from the historic wall on Marymount side. I got pe from people that they're, they went to see the loved ones over the weekend, Memorial Day weekend, and were a little surprised that that had happened. So, um, and I'm assuming there's gonna be something that happens there. It's also historic wall, so I think that was what people were really upset about because you know they knew that you were doing work to the front of the, um, of the cemetery but they weren't aware that the wall was gonna be taken um, and is changing just the whole look and feel of what, where their loved ones were. So if you could. Yes, I can provide a little context to that. I think it would be helpful. So yeah. um, the, the genesis and the origin of this particular situation goes with the improvements that are made, uh, being made at the C Street entrance. So there is a new gate. Those of you that are familiar with the history of um, Mount Wallace and the original signature entrance on C Street had what was known as the Briggs Gate. Briggs Gate was removed through time because as vehicles went from horse-drawn carriages back in 1855 when they put it in to modern day vehicles, they could no longer fit through the, the signature uh, Gothic style gate that was at the C Street entrance. It was a project undertaken um, by my department um, uh, with the mayor um, to improve the C Street entrance in the Mount Wallison Cemetery as a whole. As you know, uh, those of you that enter that C Street entrance, there's actually a 250 foot wide swath of asphalt as you enter one of the nicest cemeteries, not just in Quincy, but really anywhere outside of um, Mount Auburn. So the goal is to improve um, that entrance uh, that has a couple secondary uh, positive effects that'll help us expand the veteran section uh, in Mount Wallace and somewhat we'll be able to pick up some space by narrowing that driveway. Uh, we're also going to be adding in the next 12 months a monument to recognize all of those that have served from the original Gulf War through the war on terror to Iraq, Afghanistan, and the other conflicts our country has fought. So that's providing some additional space at the, um, towards the uh, driveway and openings in the veterans section to allow us to recognize those folks as well. In addition to that, we're going to be planting a significant uh, allay, if you will, through the green uh, leaf entrance. Um, we had a lot of smaller cherries, uh, cherry trees through the year years that were um, one by one they were being removed and dying off so it looked like a I'd refer to it as a hockey player's smile so there'd be two cherries a gap another cherry another gap um, so the the plan there is to actually plant a canopy uh, as you enter on the green leaf side the point that the council raised was on Marymount Road and the repurposing of the granite wall so as we are narrowing the entrance on the C Street side the only way to match the historic Quincy granite is with the other Quincy granite that was installed when the wall was originally built. Matching it with a different type of granite would look quite silly at such a signature entrance and to make such aesthetic improvements and then have something that didn't match up. 
I think everybody in the design process agreed was not the way to go. From that point, uh, it became, okay, what design would work on the Marymount Road side? So the new gate is a, uh, a wrought iron style fence. The uh, Greenleaf entrance has a, a wrought iron fence at their entrance. So this is picking up the theme of the combination of the historic Quincy granite with a wrought iron fence along uh, Marymount Road. We have, um, the design team did meet with Mass Historic. I know there was some concerns about the historic aspect of the WPA wall. Uh, they did meet with uh, Mass Historic and run the plans through them. Uh, they have been approved by the cemetery board. Uh, we've talked to the ward councilor and we've had multiple correspondence uh, with the immediate abutters on Marymount Road as well too. They raised a couple of concerns that we've tried to uh, stay on top of as it relates to making sure we plant along the base of the fence to uh, basically control leaves leaving the cemetery and also that we do rodent control at the time of the uh, wall dismantling. Okay. So uh, mine were, so there were certain, some neighbors, but it was also people who went to, I think people that went to see their loved ones in that section of the grave were kind of surprised about that. So I appreciate the explanation. Um, were there plans drawn up that you can direct people to so they can see kind of what they can anticipate this is going to look like? Sure. Are, there on the web, are they on the website? Uh, there are, there's information on our website. I'll have to see how detailed the actual plans are. We did we do have some renderings that we shared with the neighbors that if they're not on the website, I can have put on the website. If you could, because I think that there's a lot, there's a lot of dialogue it was this week and it, that's, I, I didn't even know about it. I just found out about it. So, um, and not that, again, this is like one of those things where, you know, the ward councilor knew, but it doesn't, it's just it, a lot of conversations were happening. I don't think um, for the most part, people were receiving it well. The, I'm sure you're probably hearing mixed things about it just because it's a big change. It's a historic wall. I understand that you got all the approvals for it. However, I think it was just the way it was, um, I think the way it rolled out quickly and was done, I think it was a little surprising to people. And they didn't realize that, I, I didn't realize it either. So when they said the wall was being taken down, I wasn't aware that that was happening. But now that you explained it to me, I, I, I can understand it, but I think it was a missed opportunity too. Um, so when I missed one thing, did you say expand? What are you expanding? I missed what you said because you said expanding. There's some ruffling. So by narrowing the uh, entranceway in the driveway, yeah, that will expand the veteran section, if you will. So we're actually taking the driveway and, and narrowing it. So that'll create some additional graves in the veteran section uh, at Mount Wallace. So I know that there's been other areas that there was some expansion. How many graves? How many? open spaces are there in Wallston? I realize it's the veterans, it will be just for veterans, but how many um, open spaces are there in, in Wallston? Because there's been other areas that the street kind of got, I think, got covered up and uh, became grass and became kind of an area for expansion as well. So uh, how, what's, how do you prioritize people coming into Wallston? Because I know it's, it's not like Pine Hill where you're actually really expanding. I'll have to get the... Um the number to see what is available. Mm -hmm. I know that seven or eight years ago, they did a uh, uh, master planning type process where they eliminated some of the existing roads to create additional grave space. Yeah. I don't know off the top of my That's head. That's okay, you don't have to, if you could just let me know. And then just Pine Hills, just touching on Pine Hills, because I know you're doing a ton of work up there too, so you, can you just let us know what's going on there? Yeah, you sure. did see the, the shed that you're, put, you're building up there. It does look nicer like than the shed. The shed. It's yeah, gonna be nice. nicer than the shed, I promise you. It's, so. it's a nice shed. <laughs> So as this council knows, uh, you were very um, helpful in approving the $14.6 million for not just the expansion, the much needed expansion of Pine Hill Cemetery, but also the uh, enhancement and improvement to the uh, existing uh, cemetery. We are partnering with uh, C. Naughton, uh, a well-known contractor who has been excellent. Uh, they are um, on schedule. They are stalling um, close to 13,000 spaces for interment between uh, in-ground burial in the city's first cremation uh, niche wall. Um, they have the pre-installed vaults, which is something the city has never done before, which will make um, our labor, even though we're expanding seven acres, it should make our labor much easier because we're not spending as much time. It makes our uh, space more efficient. Um, we plan on doing the uh, water feature where the former uh, office used to be towards the Chickatawbit entrance uh, in August and September. Uh, we should be doing the improvements to the roadway in the fall, probably the late fall. And then by the time the spring of 24 comes, we should have uh, pretty much only the landscaping left to complete. But uh, to your points, Councillor, it is difficult. We take great pride in how the cemeteries look on Memorial Day and to have concurrently two major construction projects going on in the cemeteries. You know, we, we, we've been doing a lot of 
um, communicating with folks and families that you know are concerned about the correlation between construction and cemeteries. And our contractors have been great. Um, I just think that sometimes there are issues that um, Mr. Logan and his staff have done an excellent job kind of working their way through some sensitive issues. Thank you. When does that project, when do you anticipate that project's gonna be done? I know it's a, it's a lengthy project. Uh, Pine Hill should be substantially complete uh, by the end of 23 with landscaping done in 24. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, any other councilors? Seeing none, we have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. All opposed, seeing none, we'll go into the parks. Okay, uh, we're ready for any questions. Any councilors? Motion, motion has been made to approve by Council McCarthy on the motion. Council Mahoney. So I just have a couple of questions. Um, so again, this is this might not be you, so and I, I apologize, but this, Fernsbrook, um, Fernsbrook, the work that's being done on Fernsbrook, is that you? That has become us, yes. That's become you, okay. Um, so a lot of work's being done down there too. So could you walk us through a little bit of that too? Sure, I would be happy to. And I, I do has think- become you, I love that. <laughs> this is a great opportunity for me to um, publicly recognize the work that Heather Liss has done on that project. She has been working with a contractor there, Flynn um, Enterprises, uh, to really make that the best project it can be. As we all know, it got off on the wrong foot with the uh, clearing um, of the trees along with a lot of invasive species that really uh, was a, um, a shock, aesthetic shock, I think, to a lot of people. Uh, I will say that as the project progresses, I am uh, pleased with the amount of positive feedback we get. It actually outweighs the amount of calls we got when we first uh, did that project. So um, as it stands now, uh, today was a milestone um, with uh, connecting the diversion um, um, with the regular uh, channel and that they are making substantial progress um, Heather has been working very closely to add to the planting plan. Uh, that planting plan will include 54 new trees uh, and 20, uh, 233 new shrubs, along with uh, 2,500 new plant plugs. Now, the irony to all of that is after all of the consternation over the clearing, now that they see the meandering brook, people don't want us to plant anything there because they like the way the brook lives, uh, looks. So uh, we will be going back in uh, and improving um, that area with those plantings uh, probably within the next 30 days. What's happening with the granite that was removed? Just curious, from the brook itself. Uh, that's another, the brook itself is another historic kind of brook. That's another right. thing that came up. So I didn't know what they, I was being asked where the granite went to. I, it, I, I believe that's being stored down at DPW at this point. I don't know that there's an active uh, plan for that. It's that, uh, various degrees uh, to the, it's Quincy granite, but it's in various degrees of condition. Yeah, and that was like, and that got brought to me too. Like, why couldn't they use the brook stone for the cemetery? I'm like, probably because it was, I don't, I have no idea why you couldn't. So that, that was a question that was asked. Yeah, there's not nearly enough. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be an expert on what you can or can't use that for. Um, you said that you, you're, is 54 trees and 233 new shrubs. How many trees were removed in total? So uh, we, we kept track of, uh, Heather and I and Mike Castanelli went in there and kept track of the trees that would have met, met the uh, tree protection ordinance standard, which is eight inch caliper and above. And there was approximately 36 trees that met that standard. There were a lot of smaller uh, saplings, uh, invasives, um, quite a bit of uh, Japanese bamboo. And then my last question is, I know when this is all done, it's gonna look beautiful because, you know, but then the maintenance part, what's our plan for maintenance? Because that the evasive things will grow back. So my concern is like many things that we do, we spend a lot of money and then in two or three years or sometimes sooner because the evasive stuff is pretty aggressive. You know, what's the plan to be able, because it's a pretty big area. So there's two answers to that question. One, uh, there's no replacement for actual elbow grease and getting in and, and doing the work. The the larger answer is the plan that Heather is developing, we've added to the plantings in an effort to prevent invasives from coming back to the degree that they were there before. Right. So she's developing a planting plan, I think that's going to be very helpful in limiting the amount of maintenance we have to do to chase the invasives away. You know, the goal is much like we did at Butler's, we planted a plan so that the native species can win the battle versus right. invasives. And that's the plan that Heather's developing now. Okay. I, I don't believe that's gonna be 100 to zero and there's gonna have to be some maintenance involved. Yeah, no, But I, I do believe that the, um, the planning portion of that job is gonna save us quite a bit on the maintenance portion. I guess my, my bigger question though is, I understand 
it's not going to be 100%, but what's the plan? Because we do these and then we don't have it in the budget. So what's the plan to be able to make sure that we can keep on top of it? I mean, it's not done yet, so we don't have to worry about the, this quite yet. But I just, the plan is to keep on top of it. Yeah. All right. And then moving over to, um, you have a lot of projects going on, Dave, but then over to Marymount, um, Marymount Park, and I see all the trees going in. Those trees are, how many trees are you putting in up there for that? I think they're just on the slope. I think we're looking at 60, uh, 70 new trees on the slope, and that doesn't include the azalea, the viburnum. Okay. And just, this can be off, because I know we, I asked you for a budget, because we didn't have a budget for, for, um, for, for the tree. Oh, we didn't know the tree. I didn't know. I think all of us didn't know. Those trees were coming down. We didn't have a budget for um, the pageant field either. And I know Mr. Mason sent something over. Could we just, the full council, get a full updated budget? Because at this point, it should be probably itemized out. And that would be super helpful, because that was a project that was just kind of a surprise to everybody in the city. So. Sure. As, as beautiful as things are, we shouldn't be having projects that are just, you know, appearing in the middle of the night. Just not, just not cool. Not a cool way to do things. Um, thank you. Thank you. Senator Veronico. Commissioner, thank you for joining us, and thank you to your team for joining us as well. I appreciate all your work. Um, my question had revolves similarly around uh, trees. I think uh, one of the questions was just, overall process of tree removal and replacement up at Faxon Park, um, and if the absence of a tree warden for an extended period of time maybe impacted that project or, or other projects as well. So as it relates to Faxon Park, we have done some substantial tree work within the park. A lot of those oaks, um, we have seen significant dieback, and if there's a, a dead tree in the woods, it's not that much of a big deal. As we begin to put those nature paths in and people are utilizing those areas, it becomes a safety hazard. So, you know, I, I think we still have plenty of work to do, Councillor, at Faxon Park. We still have conversations to be had about some of the improvements that we've been discussing now for quite some time with both the friends uh, of Faxon Park, with you as the Councillor, with the uh, friends of Penn's Hill. There's a lot of different ideas out there and it's time to kind of narrow that and hopefully start doing some of that work this summer. Um, that would be my goal. I'd love to partner with you on finishing that last CIP project with, you know, adding a picnic pavilion up there. My anticipation, uh, we're already seeing more requests for picnics up at Pageant than we can accommodate. Um, the facilities, the old facilities up at Faxon aren't something that I would issue permits for. If people want to go up and use them, that's fine, but I really think we owe it to Faxon to give it its own facility up there with a, a new pavilion. As it relates to replacement trees, uh, we've put an excellent system in place. Uh, we've got a project manager, urban forester, Mike Cassinelli, who's done an excellent job in beefing up uh, tree specifications. So uh, we've spent quite a bit of time looking at soil conditions and what we need to do to, you know, it's one thing to plant the tree, it's much something different to make sure that it thrives. So our watering commitments, our warranties, and our soil conditions, and our tree specifications have all been beefed up significantly. So if somebody is looking for a tree, they can call our office, we'll put them on the list. If this budget is approved, we've already gone out to bid. We've gotten ahead of this because we think if we go out to bid in the spring, make it subject to appropriation, we're gonna get a much better deal than if we waited until late summer and people are rushing for work. So if this budget is approved and the tree planting money is approved, we'll be ready to go in October and we'll be planting another 400, maybe 450 trees. Understood, thank you, and you touched on it very briefly, but those small improvements up at Faxon Park, we've gotten some great feedback on between the disc golf, um, the outdoor ping pong tables, the walking paths, um, great feedback all around, and I know some more uh, smaller improvements are really gonna make a big difference. Thank you to you and the team. Okay, Council McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, Commissioner. Uh, just to thank you for all the work uh, all you folks have been doing. Um, you know, we put a lot on the plate, LeBrecht came out really good down in Ward 1. I know you're going to do some work for me down at Brill Field. Uh, but the cemetery project, uh, um, when that is finished, it's going to be spectacular. Uh, I know Council Mahoney talked about Marymount Road, but I know you did your due diligence with the neighbors, myself, um, on a number of times. I think a lot of people that don't get to the cemetery or don't get to a certain part of the city, um, I'm sure a lot of people were surprised when they saw the work that was being done off of Furnace Brook uh, with the brook itself. Um, but um, it's all progress, it's all positive things. Uh, I got up to the um, pageant the other day, and that's spectacular. 
uh, the pavilion, the move, uh, the reconfiguration of softball, the walking path, um, the reconstruction of the the hill now with the, with the granite wall on on on. Um, um, what am I looking for? Southern Artery uh, is another one that's spectacular. Uh, you know that hill was gonna drag itself right down on the street. Those trees that were there were gonna push that wall down if they weren't removed. But uh, I've got so many positive comments now uh, from folks that have gotten up that way. Uh, uh, it's just been a, a, a lot on your plate, and and just you, when the bell rings, you're, you're there. So. Uh, Thank you very much um, from Ward 1, from the Ward 1 folks. I know that uh, the parks look great, and we were joking the other day, I don't think I've had to call anybody up to ask you to mow anything. It's all been done. Um, it's all proactive. You've done a great job with the cemeteries and, and with the, uh, the Natural Resources Group. They've uh, uh, just uh, a great staff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Council DeBona. Council uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Murphy, good to see you up here with the crew. Um, we know, obviously, as our city grows in population, that how important parks are to, to our city, the open space park component of it. Um, on, the, on the subject of the tree warden, um, we're, the, the previous tree warden was, was fantastic. Um, he was a great hire for us. Every, everybody, most of the, almost all the councils really liked him. The public liked him. The, the, the Tree Alliance liked him. And um, I know he was working on a project for inventory across the city for trees. Um, as the new inventory um, in the arborist, um, the new tree warden is from an arborist family, which is great. Um, has he taken on that duty to, to kind of get that inventory in place throughout the city? Yes, Council, he actually has an excellent plan. So I was naive to believe that one person could inventory 22,000 street trees and still be responsive <laughs> to the public demands that the job faces. Yep. So Dan um, put together a plan, and similar to the street tree planting contract, he has put together an RFQ and bid out, subject to appropriation, uh, a uh, street tree inventory that will fill in the 75% of the gaps that we don't have size, species, condition on throughout the rest of the city. Uh, for those of you that haven't been on our website and seen the work that our GIS folks have done with the urban street tree management, uh, truth be told, we stole it from the city of Seattle. We, we modeled a lot of different um, uh, ways that they presented their urban tree management programs. Um, and uh, Steve and Jackie from the, the GIS department were all stars. And we've basically used the flyover. We've identified every single street tree. Now we're populating that data as it gets inspected by the tree warden. Now the population of that data has gone very slowly, so we're requesting money in this budget to bring on a consultant that'll have five or six arborists that'll flood the city in those areas that we haven't covered and give us that data that we can then populate. Uh, Anthony Andronico's predecessor, Brad Kroll, obviously we had the Washington Street Corridor where we started from the Four River Bridge and we came all the way down to the Quincy Center basically. And I know that project you took on uh, very early in your, in your, in your time and uh, it, 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 now that I drive down there, I see all these trees up. So I think you guys are doing a great job. Um, it was a big undertaking to start with. And um, <clears throat> I know as, as the, the, the initial tree warden, now we, we've passed it on. Um, and obviously in parks, we, we've had other park directors here and we've passed it on to natural resources and have a parks manager. So um, I think it's, we've come a long way. Um, we talked about departments in general across the board and uh, I've talked to the mayor personally about having the bright people in those positions, and it's very, very different than when I first started on the council, how difficult it was up here to get a lot of things done from the city, um, from the department heads, and I, it's a totally different story today. And all of you have come up, and you've been very responsive. You've got good communication skills. There's all directors and commissioners across the city, and um, I, I think it's a, a good asset that we're all working together because we're only as good as we give you the information and then you, you go out and do it. So I want to thank you for all your hard work and communication amongst, you know, trees and et cetera in, in your department. So thank you. I, I appreciate that, Council, but I'm only as good as the people the that are with me and, quite frankly, the people that you may never meet. But they operate a lawnmower. They operate a weed whacker. People will judge me on my job based on how these people do their job on a daily basis. And I've got an incredible team, a leadership team with an 1139 that motivates. It's, it's you know, 
90 degrees out, it's mid-July, it's tough to get the guys motivated, and I'm really blessed to have uh, folks in my department from you know the office on down to the general foreman, the foreman, the working foreman that they get the job done, they take pride in what they do, and it means a lot to them. So I appreciate the compliments, but the truth be told, I'm only as good as the people that work for me. Um, just on a note of you talking about that, I remember me and, me and Council McCarthy talking about the schools and how difficult that was to upkeep as well. And, and you guys have gotten a handle on all of that too. So I, I just want to thank you. Um, thank you to the entire department and everybody in this. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been a long road um, to get to where we are today. It, it's, it's very, very different. Uh, the communication is very different amongst department heads and, and, and commissioners across the city. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, Council Devine and then Council Harris. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for coming in. Um, President, uh, the Council just mentioned that um, our past tree warden, is it accurate that he, uh, that he left because of pay? Would that be accurate? No, it wasn't because of his boss. Is that what you're suggesting? No, I wasn't getting at that. I just I, I heard that possibly he was underpaid. And if that was accurate, then uh, our Gallagher um, report and what we're trying to do with the um, pay is is what I'm kind of scared of. Uh, so if that is accurate, I had people even before I was counselor asking why we didn't have a tree warden, and I didn't know. So uh, talking about budget, this is right up budget line, so I just want to make sure that uh, if that was the situation, I hope that we keep that in mind uh, going forward to June 12th. And then on a second, real quick note, I wanted to say thank you to Heather. I see her down at Furnace Brook almost daily, taking water samples, checking everything. Uh, and like you said, she's adding more trees. So uh, that's adding to our budget, but I think it's excellent. And I know you're using a, a, a very invasive, also native plant to fight back the non-native uh, invasive plants, which you've told me about before. So thank you for all your help and uh, information. That's it, thank you very much. Okay, Councilor Harris. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Dave, um, real real quickly, um, what your department did and, and Public Works did for the Donahue Memorial is uh, just outstanding. I, that was, that's 54 years coming. And it happened, and uh, I know there's an awful lot of people, awful lot of people, not just saying it, it's just not, that's not a fictional statement, um, what was done, and we had a beautiful event, and, it was, and, and um, I, I love how um, yourself and the chief, uh, you know, this, this evening, you, you, you give credit to the credit where it's due, and the folks that were working out there, uh, with with the neighbors on that project um, were so considerate and um, accommodating and uh, again uh, I'll thank Al uh, when he gets here but Dave thank you very much I support your budget uh, hundred percent thank you thank you so much okay um, on the motion council Yang chairman uh, commissioner could you explain if there have been um, any staffing changes just to clarify for me because I'm looking at some of these line items and there's a lot of uh, shifts in amounts from fiscal year 22 to 23 that don't seem dramatic but then from 23 to 24 that do so I'm just going to run off a couple of them if that's all right and for one it's um the the way it's titled it's LAB HBY MEO 2 another one is um WKG form laborer gardener um I know downtown coordinator is getting pulled out and we'll talk about that later on but mechanical technician you're taking out this year horticultural labor and handyman labor, for example, you're getting rid of all those positions. So again, just sort of looking holistically at all of that with the sort of changes, are you, are you looking at doing any changes within the parks department? Are you reorganizing? Could you just explain to me what those changes are for? Sure, we have some slight changes, but those positions that you mentioned, Council, it's not just the downtown coordinator that's part of that downtown district budget. The mechanical technician line that is also part of that downtown budget. That's why that's being pulled. And the same with the horticultural labor position. That's why that's being pulled. Okay. So within the park division itself, we basically have uh, two lines that have been decreased by a position, two lines that have been increased by a position. You'll see a decrease in the labor heavy MEO2 position that you pointed out. That's a minus one. But then we have a plus one line below in the working form and heavy MEO. 
and then we've got a plus one in the working formal labor gardener and a minus one in the handyman laborer. So it offsets, it's just a change in positions within the department, there aren't any, it's not a reduction in positions. The positions that are pulled out are actually part of the downtown. Gotcha, okay, thank you for clarifying. And uh, for the golf course items, right? So the golf course superintendent, golf course pro, administrative, I'm sorry, yeah, administrative um, assistant, seasonal help, and then for maintenance, um, under personal service, I'm sorry, under contractual and for uh, personal services. Could you just remind me, we, do we, we get an offset for, to, to offset these expenses, correct? Yes, and I, I, I wanna be clear that um, if one were to look at the numbers on May 1st, I think there'd be some concern about the uh, revenue flow of the golf course versus the expenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way we bill our memberships is we do them monthly from the first six months of the calendar year, or the last six months of the fiscal year. So we divide the memberships up equally and bill from January through the end of June. So May and June become our two biggest revenue months because they're membership months, they're also league months, and they're uh, some of our highest walk-up months that drive the greens fee and cart fee uh, numbers as well, too. So I know that Council Mahoney um, requested some of the updated financials for Furnace Brook as part of the larger clubhouse. I'm happy to provide those. Diane, who works at the golf course, is an, a tremendous asset. Um, and I can provide an updated um, both actual and projected figures uh, for this fiscal year, as well as our actuals last year when the city maintained it. But I think it's also important that the council see the actuals from the three prior years when we didn't own it, because our revenue is up close to 50% based on some of the changes that we've made. That's fantastic. Do you know off the top, that'd be great if you could send that over, but do you know off the top of your head, just while we have you tonight, um, how much you're anticipating the revenues will offset as a percentage, the, the total expenses? So we were taking a look at some of the uh, POs and encumbrances that are currently uh, within both the contractual and expense lines. We have two very large encumbrances uh, that'll be liquidated by the year end. So my guess is they'll generate uh, probably close to uh, $60,000 uh, in savings that shows up in the budget but won't be spent as part of this year's uh, fiscal allotment that'll probably drop into free cash at year end. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take the uh, budget figure, the transfers that have come in, less the uh, liquidated POs, you're looking at approximately $837,631 in expenses. We're projecting 918,500 in revenue, and that will place us um, approximately 80,000 or so uh, to the good. That's great, okay. Thank you for clarifying, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to approve. All in favor? Aye. You guys have it? Okay, recreation. One more to go. <laughs> Okay, any uh, questions on recreation? Motion has been made by Council Harris to approve. Do I have any discussion on the motion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Yang. Uh, so, the, where is it? The, the clothing line that was asked in previous other um, departments that they had said that that was uh, due to union negotiations. That's the same thing here. The addition of the clothing line item. Again, it's, it's minimal, but... Supervisors Union. Okay. All right. And then the other one is to um, the Recreation Operations Supervisor. So do we, do we have somebody in for that yet? No. Okay. Um, do we know when we might get somebody in, when we might anticipate we're going to bring somebody in for that? When you approve my budget. What was that? When you approve my budget. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is it's not um, in this budget, but uh, we had, and I don't know if this is to you or, or to the commissioner, likely to the commissioner, um, we, or I had received a couple of requests from residents who were making inquiries about the process to move forward and support funding for renovations and programming at the Ruth Gordon Amphitheater. And so we, again, we can't add to the budget, uh, but I did want to make sure that I am advocating and relaying that message. I, I don't know if it's within this department. I kind of made the assumption that it was because it's recreation and programming. Um, so if you have any thoughts on, on what you may plan on doing, if you could share that, that would be really helpful. And if you don't have any, again, I just wanted to make sure to take this opportunity um, to advocate specifically for funding um, to be uh, dedicated specifically to you know, encouraging programming um, and the renovations for that area. I can't add, uh, but if you have any funding for that or anything that you have in mind to share, that would be really helpful. I've been waiting for a Ruth Gordon question. Um, so 
without letting the cat out of the bag, I've been working very close with Sarah Trainer Khaled. She's the daughter of the architect Owen Trainer, who designed the amphitheater. She has been working tirelessly to help bring programming back this summer to the Ruth Gordon Amphitheater. The mayor has made a commitment to fund programming there uh, throughout the course of July and August. We've given her an um, subject to appropriation anticipated budget to bring entertainment back there on Friday nights. Um, and that funding, particular funding for entertainment, is located within the celebrations budget. Uh, gotcha. And the mayor's okay. committed about $10,000 to the amphitheater to bring um, entertainment back there. There is additional funds in both the uh, rec side, because we're going to support the events and staff the events. So Michelle will have some of her people there. You know, I will have a park staff on from time to time. So there are minor impacts in both the park and recreation budget as it relates to the amphitheater. But the uh, thrust of the funding is coming through celebrations. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I know Michelle will do a great job, and that's not the question here at all. I think this is more of like a moving forward. Um, I mean, I've been doing this seven years. I've never once, I think, or maybe this is only the second time I've had residents actually ask me to say like, hey, spend more money on X. And so I wanted to make sure to advocate for that and say as well, you know, it's coming out of celebrations. That's great. But within your department, if you, Michelle, again, if there's increased um, support that's needed year over year to continue those programs, um, or again, commissioner in your department within your line items for improvements, clearly it's it's uh, it's being supported by folks. And so um, I'm happy to hear uh, that it's being allocated in celebrations. And again, just moving forward, um, just keeping keep the front of your mind, if there needs to be allocations, particularly within your department, um, I have received positive feedback from that so far as well. So, As it relates to capital, I know that Sarah has put together a team of architects through the Friends of Ruth Gordon that are looking at potential improvements, including accessibility. Um, some other items as well, too, as it relates to performances. If I had to guess, uh, we'd likely be compiling an application, maybe through CPC, into the next funding cycle um, to address those capital needs there as well, too. So we're going to address the entertainment, reactivate the space, and then come back at a later date for capital. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you both. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other councils? Council President Zamona. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good to see you up there, Michelle, with, with, with Day, uh, Commissioner. Um, obviously, we um, I think how important our um, rec program is to the city of Quincy. Um, how are we doing with our summer summer rec leaders and our, our rec programs? Uh, how's the enrollment going? And, and is is a lot of participation in it or coming up to sign up? Uh, the uh, enrollment for the summer clinic summer clinic started on May first, and uh, we are almost full with. Um, just about everything. The K to two programming, which was expanded this year, is full. Um, we actually last year went down to age three, four, and five. Those are full, um, and some of the other uh, programs as well. We do run a very, very, very robust free program for which a registration has not begun. Registration will begin on July fifth for the free programs out at the playgrounds. Uh, the boating and sailing registration will take right. place later in June as well as the summer swim lessons. Um, obviously, we had uh, Mr. Klaas being here for the uh, uh, Council on Aging and the Senior Olympics, and great job again um, with, with those programs. Um, Thank you. How, how, do we, how do we look across the city in general? Um, do, do you have enough funding for these programs? Do you need any funding for these programs for the future? Or are we kind of where we need to be? Funny that you ask. I put together a listen the children <laughs> in my opinion are very very important seniors numbers. and children seniors and, and children very important thank you i put together a by the numbers handout for you that I, i'll put in your mailboxes um after ten and i certainly won't read through um all six pages of it because um i'd bore you to tears but um in fy 23 so far um we've um, had employees work 58,180 hours. That's in our salary um, wage line that we've asked for an increase um, in order to do some more um, special events. And as Dave said in his introduction, uh, and continue to increase programming. Um, we've had we've serviced over 90,000 Quincy residents in programs um, with the daily attendance with over 9,000 enrolled in programs, um, going from our aquatics which is uh, one of the best in the Commonwealth. We have a terrific pool. People are always trying to rent it for swim meets because we're one of the few facilities with a um, gallery area. Um, uh, we're American Red Cross certified. We trained 26 lifeguards in-house because we have a lifeguard instructor. We worked with the Quincy Fire Department to train every fireman 
in basic water rescue training. Um, they now have rescue tubes on every fire apparatus because of the work um, that we did together last summer planning that class. And that was in response to the Brockton firefighter who passed away last year um, trying to rescue without the proper equipment and proper training. Um, that's just the beginning. Like I said, I'll put this all in your Thank you. boxes to not continue to go on and on and on with that question of how we're doing, but we're doing great. The 276 hourly staff are wonderful. Um, as Dave and Chief Keenan said, we're only as good as the people that work for us. I have an amazing administrative assistant and program coordinator who um, work hard every day. There's only three full-time staff in the recreation department. That's why I'm asking for a fourth so I can continue to expand yep. and um, maybe actually see my family uh, sometimes, though they're in college now, so I guess it's okay. But, um, but that's your answer. We're doing great. The facilities that, uh, where we run programs are wonderful, yep. and uh, we're very, very lucky to have the support of the council and the mayor. My last question is going to be, Obviously, summer rec leaders are in the parks as well as the recreation, so it's a combination of both. There are, and it's across the city as well as is is if we, you know, we had an inventory of the tree warden, the tree, the trees across the city. Some of the things is across the cities as we build these new playgrounds, do things is shade. Obviously, there's some areas of playgrounds slash parks that don't really have much shade. Obviously, you have to put trees in to get shade, but is there any other mechanisms to put some shade in to particular parks? And, and the reason why I ask this is I get this across the city as, a, as an at-large counselor. There's some parks that, geez, they put in a nice, beautiful playground, but there's no shade. And it's tough during those July and August months, where, and even in Junes and Septembers, where it gets really, really hot and the kids, um, it could be 95 degrees out there, the kids can't get out there to play. So. It's something as a suggestion to move forward is to look at those shade, get some shades in those particular parks. Is is there anything that you have that you think um, you have on on your on your mind that you? Well, there is, but that's a facility question for Dave. <laughs> I actually did take a picture of a shade structure sure. um, in Southboro last week when I was at a Massachusetts Recreation and Park Association meeting, so I could show Dave. The recreation leaders are very creative. They actually go under some of the platforms with the kids. Last summer in the heat, they were under there playing board games and doing some arts and crafts. They, they find shade. They're, they're kids. We all grow up without shade. But they'll be fine. They'll be, they'll be, yeah, I just, I don't want to deter any kids. It, it's, it's 90 degrees out. They want to go down to parks, and sometimes they just can't because mom will say, or mom and dad will say, hey, listen, this is a little too hot out there. You got to stay under a tree or a certain thing. I just want to make sure that we have that in place as we move forward, as we, as we grow as a city, as well as building our parks and, and, and altering it and revitalizing it that we have the shade in place. So something to consider not only for, for your department as well as the city councilors and, and our funding moving forward. And a solution to the madness, if, if yeah. Rec is an example, councilor, of something that we can do. We have a shade structure that we put adjacent to the, the playground there. Part of our plans for the renovation of Forbes Hill and Irving Ball, something similar. So to your point, I mean, these aren't the path and south. Yep. 10 by 10 shade structures uh, that we can put so that if the parents and children need a break to get out of the sun for a little while, they have a place that they can sit, get out, and then run around again, too. One of the uh, unintended consequences of the new servicing for the playgrounds in July and August, it heats up. We've got the put in place rubber, so that adds to it as well, too. So the shade is becoming more important as we meet some of the other requirements of the playground. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're all, we're all trying to work together to make it better. Always try to make it better. So thank you. Okay, we, thank have you, a mo we have a motion on the floor to approve. Seeing no other counselors, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Have not seeing none. Thank you very much, thank Council, you. Dave, you. Commissioner, and Michelle. Thank you. Okay, it's getting late, and we got two more items, so we'll go right into it. Um, we have the downtown district. Do you want to go on? Um, uh, Mr. Walker is going to Mr. Chairman going to address that. Yeah, just re re real quickly, Councilors, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before I hand the microphone over to uh, the very capable Mary Cahill, uh, I just want to be clear that this is a, a paper change to the budget. This is not a operational or a budgetary change. This just reflects um, 
a different way of bookkeeping. Um, we find it, it's gonna be clearer. Uh, it's more transparent. It shows where these positions are, the jobs they're doing. Um, some councils, we remember some councils are new um, that originally when uh, these positions were created four or five years ago now, um, they were built between both the park department and the public buildings budget. But for um, clarity purposes, for bookkeeping purposes, uh, we felt it appropriate uh, to separate out at this time. Uh, again, it's a, it's a bookkeeping measure. The public won't know any difference um, in terms of level of service. It's not an increase in level of service. It's not a decrease in level of service. It's the same level of service. It's just how we reflect it in the budget, in the budget book. And Mary will be able to answer any questions uh, the council may have relative to the operations of the group. Thank you. Okay. Mary? <clears throat> motion approved. Motion has been made to approve by Councilor Kane. On the motion. Council McCarthy. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Hi, Mary. How are you? Good, Dave. How are you? Um, first of all, fabulous job. Uh, I know that um, when this first came in front of us, um, we were all trying to understand the importance of the downtown. I mean, the Hancock Adams Commons showed up. I see you guys, your guys, and I see you on top of your guys, uh, power washing, keeping it clean. It looked beautiful yesterday. Uh, and uh, the General's Bridge area and all the other areas that are up here. And um, I think one thing that um, when you, you know, we're, we're in the mix of, of being in, in one big department, it didn't really give you the teeth to um, come forward, as Mr. Walker said, and be accountable, have your own budget, and, and be able to really line up the important things that you need to take care of this um, beautiful common that's out there. Um, the General's Bridge area, and more to come. Um, the team out there is working day and night. I get more compliments uh, from people that say, the guys are out there. We never see those. We either see those guys getting directed by you to do something or they're doing something. So um, I, I think it's tremendous that uh, uh, what we have here in Quincy and what you folks have done. So uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Any, other, any other counselors? Council Mahoney. Hi. Um, is it Mary? Yes. Mary, it's nice to meet you. Um, I'm assuming you've been in this position for a while now. Four years. Four years. Yeah. So I'm one of the councils that didn't agree with this because this is a downtown mm -hmm. specific and, you know, the downtown was created and with the diff is paying for itself, but the taxpayers are paying for the specific department to maintain certain things. And there are other areas of the city that don't get the same attention that the downtown says. And we were talking about the hardscapes. These are specific, specific areas. So even in the downtown, I'm seeing it's just like when I walked in front of the Monroe building, they had the same... Um, gates with the little, um, as you go down further, you see the trees that you have some, you have some growths that go underneath the trees. They're, they're all dead. And so once you, that's the Monroe building, that's right next to the downtown. Mm -hmm. And then you get down a little bit further past the downtown before you get to Kilroy, same thing with the trees and they had the nice grass that was growing, completely dead, nothing's happening there. So I guess I'm getting a little confused. Is, are we only taking care of the specific parks like the General Park, Kilroy and Adams, Adams or are we doing is it, it, I would think the downtown would be still the Monroe building all the way down. Yep, yep. So, so I guess. Question. Matter of fact, we were out there today for the planters. Mm -hmm. We have an irrigation problem. Mm -hmm. Back from before Hancock Adams Common was even built. Mm -hmm. Mon, I think, was the vendor at the time. So from the visitor center down to Starbucks, across the street to Five Guys, back in front of the church, down to Stop and Shop, they made a mess. And it's a, it's, is that why that's all marked on the sidewalks? Is that what's going to no, be torn? That, that's <clears throat> um, National Grid doing some, some other project. But um, we're looking at it right now with Dave and I have a meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock um, in the mayor's office because it's not a quick fix. Yeah. And So Dave know, from Natural Resources? Mike Sampson, you know, who's a great irrigation guy, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> he said it's bigger than me. So mm -hmm. we are addressing that. And it, just to give people a little bit of an overview, when we started four years ago, there was only the Hancock Adams Common. Mm -hmm. And there were two guys that worked for me. We didn't own a screwdriver. We didn't own a truck. We didn't have a Kubota, nothing. That now has grown into um, the Hancock Adams Common, Kilroy Square, the garage area, Dunford Drive, 
Generals Park, Generals Bridge, McConville Way, Dunford, uh, the alleyways between uh, Fat Cat, the alleyway next to the Fours, Chestnut Street, Foster Street, um, uh, the, the Coddington, <clears throat> the atrium across the street of Coddington and in front of the Monroe, Monroe Building. My guys, on a daily basis, are picking up trash, spills, um, emptying trash cans. There's 44 trash cans that get emptied every single day. Fountains clean, the baskets, the maintenance for the fountains. Um, there's four fountains out there, chemicals, the baskets for all the debris. You don't see anything. that You could, you could take a bath, and some people do, in those fountains. It's that clean. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, they wash and wipe down every bench in every one of those parks so that people can sit there and eat their lunch and feel comfortable. Um, power wash, clean all the spills, stains, graffiti. Um, weekly, we mow and whack, weed whack all the lawns and all those places that I just described to you, not just on the sidewalks for all those areas. We trim the bushes. We've taken all the work back that we were um, farming out to Nichols. Um, we hired a horticulturist, um, Big Mike. I think you've seen him walking around. You can't miss him. Um, <clears throat> we um, brought in, we, when I came on board, everything was done from an outside source. The fountains were taken care of. We were paying somebody from an outside. All the landscaping, um, all of that is done within. And, you know, my guys, at least once, if not twice a week, they start from the end of Hancock Street down where uh, Good Health used to be, and they go all the way. If you haven't met the five guys that work out there that wear orange shirts, they don't stop. They know, they take a lot of pride. What I did when we first started, I took them into the, the Rose Kennedy Greenway to show them the place that was supposed to be the most spectacular spot in Boston. It was the middle of January and it was trashed. I mean, literally trashed. The fountains, the trash that was in, the funding had stopped and dried up. And they walked around, they were like shocked. And from that day to this day, you know, those guys, you know, they won't just stop and say, I'm in downtown you know, on the way to the garage, in their cars. So um, I, I hear you, that it, it sounds like it's just the downtown, but it, it's a pretty significant amount of area that five people are covering and the way that it looks. Is it being covered, is this coming from our general budget, it's being offset by anything else? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's a difference between the, the terms offset and, mm -hmm. um, you know, re revenue. Mm -hmm. the, this, just like the DIF budget, the DIF debt service budget is ultimately offset by the revenue we collect. Now, it doesn't reflect in the budget book. We don't reflect the DIF revenue to pay off the DIF debt service. Um, that's a, a legal issue and a, and a budgetary issue that, that Eric could explain in more detail why we, we don't do that. But in the same way that the DIF revenue pays off the debt service, the DIF revenue does pay off, pay for the services we provide through Mary's team. Once again, I'm, it, this isn't about your team and what they're doing. What I'm saying, suggesting, is that the whole city, and we have other areas of the city that doesn't have the same kind of, you know, attention to detail, because this is like kind of we've created this, you know, this nurturing center just for the downtown, but the rest of the city and the constituents who pay the taxes to pay this don't feel like they're getting the same kind of treatment maybe in Wollaston area or um, Kincaid Park. I can go through a million different places that I can tell you that they don't have their trash cleaned up as much as they do. They don't have they don't have a special staff that's taking care of that. Yet we've created some other really spectacular places in the city of Quincy that doesn't have that same type of attention to detail. I just talked to um, to to Mr. Murphy about the fact that you know we do these great things, these great beautiful things. They look beautiful the first year, and then we don't maintain them, and all of a sudden they start to kind of you know have overgrowth. And that's because we're doing so many things. You know, we're doing we're just we're and we're creating so many things that we have to maintain, but we're not doing those things even at the other end of the square when we had the pocket park the little pocket park that was created for um the, when they moved the 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 the, the underground um <coughs> i can't think the waterway that was underground that's down the very end of the square that's not maintained you go down there and it's trash is thrown into that over by um marymount 
where they put the they put the nice like fencing up. The fencing's all broken already. That's brand new fencing that just got put up. It's broken. And when you look inside on the other side where you see the where you see the water that's in there, there's tires that are in there. That's Marymount. That's just brand new that they just did that they're they're getting ready for Flag Day for. That's already happened. But in the downtown, we have a special crew that's just taking care of the downtown. It, and the taxpayers get upset about that because they're saying like, how come how come we have the special department that has like special toys that they play with? And I'm not. This is not me saying this. I'm telling you this is what constituents say. So I try to offset that as well to say, you know, why do we have? Why do we need this? So when we put this into the budget, you know, there were several of us up here that cut it and said, no, it shouldn't be there. And then it showed up in, in buildings and 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 natural resources, and now it's being taken out. Once again, it might be transparency. It's not transparent because you know when you present it, it's like a new department that's popping up and nobody actually mentioned it. And now we're talking about it, like, oh, it's just moving it out. It's not a big deal, but it's the same thing. The concept's the same. So I guess I have that problem. And then, like I just brought up, you know. There's, when we talk about this, where does the downtown start and where does the downtown end? And that's, and you, I, I appreciate what you just said, that you're looking into those things, but there are a lot of things. If you get down the other end of the square, like I said, that pocket part, is that part of your, is that part of you or is that part of natural resources? That's the part that I think really is confusing because it's, is it, is it from the, the, where Discover Quincy is, that part of Monroe building to the other end of the square? Or does it go across the street to that pocket part? Like where does, where does, where does natural resources pick it up? Because you're now saying that you're going to pick it up and go all the way down to the other end by Starbucks. But it's a problem for me because I, I really don't see how it, you separate it into a department other than making it a special, you know, a special, special city within a city is what we've kind of created here. No, and I hear you, but what yeah. I hear mm -hmm. is people from all of these wards come and enjoy Quincy mm -hmm. Center mm -hmm. that didn't come here before, mm -hmm. the Christmas parade. You know, we're going to have Country Fest here mm -hmm. this Saturday. There's going to be a crowd bigger. You know, we're going to have Gay Pride in Kilroy Square on Sunday. Yeah. We're going to have... Which is not um, promoted in the city. You know, I, and I appreciate that. Mary, I totally appreciate that. Yeah. I, I'm not saying no, it's no, not no. beautiful. I'm, I'm just saying they get to enjoy the I'm same not saying benefits. It's, as, by no means am I not saying that these places are beautiful, but we have other places that are beautiful too. We just got done putting a ton of money up at, at Pageant Field. And, you know, they were going to fill in the Ruth Gordon Amphitheater, but now they're not. But now they're going to program it. So they're going to be more people going up there. But they don't have, spe you know, we're asking for little bits of money, $10,000 for them to be able to program up there when this is getting a $760,000 budget for just the downtown. Mm -hmm. So I understand what you're saying. By no means am I trying to say that you're not. It's not about you not doing your job. You got hired to do a job, you're doing it. What I'm saying is that we have a city of 100,000 people, 60,000 people who pay taxes, homeowners that pay taxes that are saying we're creating a special project, special special just entity of, a, of the city of Quincy just for this when we have all these other places like I just mentioned we just put a ton of money up at Pageant Field and we have Ruth Gordon Amphitheater that was told oh we don't need that because nobody goes up there we want all the programming when you go downtown that's not right either now we, we they saved Ruth Gordon Amphitheater a certain group of constituents saved that and they're going to get a whopping ten thousand dollars to be put toward their programming this summer when I'm looking at 760,000 plus more that will go into the programming of just the downtown. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we're, and then we're gonna go down to Wallston and do a URDP down in Wallston. Will that become another department for, you know, particularly saving the down, saving Wallston? I don't know, where does it end as we create more government that we're doing? That's what I'm trying to understand. I don't understand why we can't have it completely maintained underneath, one, we have a new director of the downtown and we have a natural resources that came in when we hired the natural resources it was supposed to eliminate the other things but now we have a director of recreation and we have a, a commissioner of, of cemeteries so the government in the city of quincy is growing tremendously but but the people of the city of quincy aren't feeling those great services they might come to the downtown for the events but it's costing them a lot of money so i hope they do come i mean i really do because honestly you know, they probably can't afford to go to the movies, but they can go to the country fest. But I'm just, I'm just bringing up because I don't believe we should have a separate department for this. I believe it should be absorbed. We should have a separate director for this. It should be absorbed into the current natural resources, and it should be able to be managed underneath that as well. It shouldn't be a separate entity completely, and that's just me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, listen, at the end of the day, this is a gateway to our city. And folks and citizens of the city want to enjoy this downtown. Um, the, the biggest question I've asked many, many people with that live outside the city, how they feel about Quincy, and they said, you guys are doing a good job. You're cleaning up the downtown. That's the word they use. So for the citizens living in the city that are benefiting from these activities that we have 12 months out of the year, 
We have the tree lightings. We have all the holidays, all the different religions outside here. Um, we have the fountains that need to be maintained. Um, we have the grass cutting, obviously. And as our, as our revitalization in the downtown happens, we've become more open space, more parks, more recreation in the downtown. Everything that some of the folks are talking about is also the reason why we have it set up this way, because we need to continue to work together with the Quincy police that are obviously down here all the time, patrolling the area with yourself on maintaining this downtown and making sure that this is um, the engine that can run. Because if it doesn't look good, people will say, oh, you guys have this nice downtown, you're vitalizing, but you're not taking care of it. Um, if there's any issues that I have in the city with different, different areas of the city, we just get on the phone and call our different department heads, call our different commissioners, and they have communication. So we all have to play the role that if we see trash or we see other things in the city, that we can pick up the phone or take a quick photo and email it over to the proper department and get it, get it mitigated, get it taken care of. And I come up here a lot. I come up here a lot throughout the year to see all the different activities that we're having, and it's, it's night and day. It's night and day from what we came from prior to 2018, before we opened up this Hancock Adams Common. We were just talking about yesterday with the Memorial Day Parade being out there. And we've, we've never had it down here, outside here. And people came up to me and said, it's beautiful out here to have it here because we're revitalizing Mount Walson Cemetery, that we could have it right outside here. And we were also talking about the road that used to be here. And, um, all the different trees that used to be outside here. And it was really dark and dungeony and, and, and dangerous. So not only is your department now newly formed and it was put in different departments at one point, but we have to maintain this. Maintenance is the key component to as we revitalize the downtown. So as I know, this, there's a cost to this, but if you don't do it, all these other people are going to say, you're doing all this redevelopment, but you're not taking care of the downtown. What, what's the sense of doing this for? So you're going to get the other side of the coin. So I, I think you're doing a great job up there, up, outside here. I see you out here all the time talking, facilitating, and we're getting, we're getting progresses done here. And uh, the investment in the downtown is coming from how good it's looking. And at first, when we first, when I first came on to the council in 2016, in 15, when the steel was coming up at uh, Quincy Mutual, um, West of Chestnut was coming up, we had no idea what this really, really was going to look like. And as we come along the years later, the years later, we're transforming it year by year, parcel by parcel. And we still have a lot of work on that Ross area that needs to be done, putting in the General's Bridge, putting in General's Park, putting in the, 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 the green space out there. And it's just going to all flow together, just like Kilroy is now and all that particular area and we're getting more restaurants, we're getting more um, things that the public can use like the farmer's market and all these other things. Uh, we have, it's almost like an investment we put into the city, the investment that we're putting into um, taking care of this area. So for me, I look at it very, very differently and how important it is um, that we provide this for our citizens of the city that live here in our city, the folks. And, um, and a lot of them were, were very hesitant about the downtown. Oh, I don't know how it's going to look. It's not going to be anything for us of citizens of the city that we can use. But what do we have every month? We have three to four different events down here where folks can come down here and enjoy the downtown. And if it doesn't look right and it's not upkeep right, people are going to say, well, why did you even do this? So for me, I think it's a plus. I think it's a win-win. And I, I see a lot of different citizens coming up here that thought they would never come to the downtown. Oh, I don't need to go to the downtown. And they've come down here and like, oh, I just enjoyed the farmer's market. Oh, I did Kilroy's. I did all these different activities. Oh, I never tried this restaurant, this new one over here. And it's, it all flows together. And I think as we move forward into the next year, um, as the new redevelopment happens in the downtown, I mean, I, I remember Council Palmucci and I talking about the, the, the Hancock Street corridor down there. Where we need to get something revitalized, and, but we need to upkeep our downtown with this all, the, the, you know, everything that we're doing in here. So it's not just the grass cutting, it's the upkeeping of everything else, the trees and putting in everything. So uh, I thank you for all your hard work. Just continue to do it. And uh, I'm hoping I, I support this um, and thank you. All right.
Next, we got Council Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This isn't to you, Mary. So uh, this is more so to uh, maybe the auditor. Um, <clears throat> so. Councilor Devon, you make a good point, right? The downtown was an investment, and we decided as a municipality to make an investment to revitalize the downtown. And so, you know, my understanding of it is that I want to make sure that if we made this investment, um, what are the associated costs? And so I actually appreciate that it is separated out because I want to make sure that I can track, okay, we took on this investment, we're revitalizing the downtown, we're building these new buildings. Now, what are the associated costs to maintain that? So I appreciate that they are separated out. Um, I guess my question then would be, and it doesn't have to be tonight, but could we, or could I get a breakdown of the revenues that have come in from the DIF and then be able to parse out from that um, how much of that is getting is going towards paying back the, the monies that we are borrowing, right, for the DIF, and then whatever is left over, if there is anything left over, how much of that is going towards helping to cover these costs, if that makes sense. So again, you know, it, it, logistically, right, I'm just seeing it as that, right, that we, again, we chose to move forward with Revitalizing the downtown, that's all well and fine. I want to know then if you're taking on that investment, what are the associated costs, right? And now they are in front of us in one very clear place, so I appreciate that. I just now want to know, you know, how much of that is being covered now by the revenues generated from the investment that we had made. Yeah, okay, Councillor. So I know um, usually I think around December the Council does vote on um, an appropriation to cover the debt service costs of mm -hmm. the, all the different um, borrowing, so I'm um, I'm going to assume, and that money goes through. It's through the sinking fund. I'm assuming I'd have to speak with the director of municipal finance that this is something that possibly could be done as well. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I would assume that the rev there's enough revenue to support all of that. I don't have the revenues for the downtown or what it's generating as of right now. I believe that's done by a separate company that does a study on that. Mm -hmm. But it is something that we can get to you. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Mr. Chairman. Council Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, I was a person that, when we first came up, uh, I guess the, the green uh, came up for vote. I voted against it. I didn't think that we should have been spending, uh, you know, that public money on the downtown before all the private development was was finished, and. I think on the other side of this, you now see everything you just described, that it is a perfect public square that people take full advantage of for holidays and various events, and the programming has been spectacular. And I think that there are other now uh, externalities that come with that around economic development that you might not get a direct correlation to the taxes that you pay, but <clears throat> it continues to be a driver for people wanting to move here and the reasons why your home values continue to rise. Uh, so, you know, it's not just about this $700,000. Uh, the effects are much greater overall. So, you know, I appreciate the thoughts, but I just want to put that into the debate tonight. Uh, Councilor Devine. Um, <clears throat> to add on to that also, um, it can be infectious. Like when you, um, if you let it fail, it's a broken window syndrome. If you have one broken pane, someone's more willing to throw another rock through the second pane. Uh, just yesterday at the end of um, the Memorial Day event, uh, one of the vehicles was driving away and somebody recognized that something was leaking out of the back of the truck and they wanted to make sure it wasn't oil. They scrambled right over to check, which that's the Heinz behind us, touched with his finger and, and made sure it wasn't oil because he wanted to get it cleaned up faster. Well, if we didn't maintain our property the way we do, 100%, he might not have been too upset about it. I mean, well, whatever, we already got oil all over the place. So it's infectious. Uh, I, I think that uh, our downtown is amazing, and it's attracting everybody, like Ian just said. So uh, well done. OK. Uh, the chair will take a brief moment, brief privilege. Um, I'm agreeing with all my counselors, I think. We're doing this to uh, to promote the downtown, to bring everything down there. The programming, again, has been excellent. The cleanup and everything that goes along with it, it looks as good the next day as it did the day of. So that's obviously happening. And I understand that there are stuff in other, other areas, and those are things that we need. sometimes we need to work on. But this is part of promoting this. It's an economic driver, and I think it's something we should be doing. So. Um, 
And I, I also, I very much support having it out separately so we see the budget, we see the numbers, we know what's going on. So I think that is actually very transparent by the city. So I'm, I'm going to agree with this and, uh, and vote for it. So at this time, we've had, the, we've had, we have the motion on the floor. So I'm going to ask for, for a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. Um, so, uh, so the, the the order carries. Thank you for coming before us, Mary. Thank you. Thank it wasn't you that bad, for your time. Was it? <laughs> like everybody else okay. said, but I know my team is the best out okay. there. If you see those guys, give them a pat on the back because they really, really care. Like I say, one yeah. Thanks. All right. Our last item on the agenda: public buildings. We have the commissioner. Uh, Mr. Hines. Good evening, committee members, councillors. Thank you for having me. Um, I just want to say, much like my predecessor said this evening, that you know the, the, the compliments that my department gets are not my own. Uh, Sarah Slyman from the elevator sent a glowing email the other day to the mayor, you know, praising me and all that I do, and I had to shoot back to her that. As much as I appreciate her sentiment, and she likely saved one of my sons the start of my eventual eulogy, um, that the, the compliments really belong to the whole team. So I, I certainly echo uh, what the others before me had said in that regard. Okay. Um, Discussion of the motion. We'll let Paul Hines give his presentation, and, and then we'll go to question. Okay. I, I actually didn't perform. Uh, prepare a, a, a okay. monologue or an introduction. I thought we'd jump right into the numbers. So Okay, very good. But thank you. All right, so we go to uh, Council Yang. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioner. Uh, so for the overtime line item and the shift differential, um, they're looking at this last fiscal year. We had gone about 100% over in spending, so we spent 200%. It's reflected here. I'm just wondering if you can clarify what that is, because all I'm seeing is just the, the title, and we don't get to see the description. So if you can clarify um, for overtime and shift differential why we were so over this last fiscal year. Right. Uh, the shift differential is a contractual item that primarily goes to the custodians that work the 24 hours at the police station. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's some other people that get a portion of that. Uh, but the overtime is just what it would seem by description. Uh, and I've got multiple pages here of the spreadsheet uh, that detail by the hour what that overtime is. Um, and it's uh, pretty much across the departments. One of the things that comes up relevant to the story of the conversation you just had with regard to the downtown uh, department now uh, is that the overtime of those people that work for the downtown group went on my overtime uh, it, and blended in with my staff. Um, so I can break it out with this report but Munich didn't report it that way in the year to date in the performance. Uh, in addition, there's like the security guard when there's meetings and other events in town hall, he's on, he's in there. By and large, one of the biggest um, entries in that is our ventilation people, our mm -hmm. HVAC people, uh, as well as two plumbers that work a couple of days a week after hours uh, for the last probably eight months in exclusively North Quincy High School, uh, continuing our effort to get the lead out of the drinking water. North Quincy High School was renovated in the mid to the late 70s. Unfortunately, just before they outlawed the lead in the, in the solder for the plumbing pipes. Mm -hmm. And there are quite a few uh, areas in that school that had elevated levels. Uh, and with the age of the building after the renovation, there were broken fixtures and faucets everywhere. So they've gone on and they really, they've done a wholesale replacement throughout that whole building. Um, so uh, admittedly, that is quite a high number mm -hmm. on the OT. Um, but it sounds like OT then is primarily for repairs and maintenance, not for any new projects, correct? Correct. Okay. That's maintenance. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so you can give new projects. So you, you brought in the project manager uh, to help with the management of all these new projects. Because again, you do obviously maintenance um, and repairs, but then you also have to manage all the new projects that are coming on as well. And so um, do you foresee it continuing to be just one project manager that you need for now? Do you see yourself needing more down the line? I just want to we can't add, but I want to make sure you have the resources that you need to deliver because we've had this conversation, right? That when things fall behind, you are just as frustrated, if not more than I am or residents are with things getting delivered. And you're, I know you're very, very like sort of meticulous about your timelines and things getting done. And so I just, 
this is a sort of larger question of just like making sure that again, what you're projecting out for next year in capital improvements, maintenance, existing projects, et cetera, and deliverables, you know, what you might need from us and how we can be supportive to make sure that you have the resources you need, right? To see that through with even your own timeline, you know? <laughs> I, I do appreciate that sentiment and the question. Uh, the project manager that we added has made a significant difference in my ability to, to function uh, by taking <laughs> managing individual projects off of me by and large, I still have some, uh, and seeing them through in a much more timely way than I was able to do while also running the department. Um, with the CIP projects that we, we took on and got funded last year, the fire department improvements, they're gone straight through. We're just about finished with the sixth firehouse, I believe, uh, and starting the prep work for seven and eight. Um, and there's also jumped in a number of the other projects, so it's very helpful. Um, okay. So as far as the staffing level at, at that level, I, I believe it's adequate and appropriate at this time. Mm -hmm. um, we are doing, again, part of the funding of the CIP is a major improvement to the North Quincy Fire Station, roofs, windows, that's now grown into abatement, HVAC, and like all home renovations do, they grow, as he knows as a new homeowner. <laughs> um, and so we do have professional LPMs that have came in and help us manage that one, mm -hmm. because that literally took moving the fire department out of the building into trailers, setting them up with the fire alarms and the smoke alarms and the, the voice alarms yep. uh, and keeping them functioning while taking them out of their building. And it went very, very smoothly. And I have to commend the department members themselves who helped to move out and were very cooperative in the meetings. Uh, that's going very well, um, to, much to the pleasure of all. Uh, the, the school department cooperated. We used North Quincy High School parking. It's really been a team effort, but it's mm -hmm. been great. Um, so I think I as far I'm, as staffing levels at this point, we're doing well. I'm glad you have a central person, um, like a, a central project manager is for you because to that end, right? Every sort of one-off project that comes down the line, I do see whenever we look at their proposals that they have like a designated project manager to that one project, but then they come and go with that project, right? And so for you to have a central person that they can report up to is, is phenomenal. Um, the last question I had for you is just, again, another clarifying question is the energy line. So the last two fiscal years, you were requesting a million this year is going up to a million three. What is that line item for? That is the utility bills. That's the gas and the electric, oil and propane. Um, the payments right now, the expenditures appear to be in line with the budget. Um, that is because about $150,000 at this point have been taken out of the contractual line mm -hmm. to meet those obligations. Uh, and I also need about another forty to $45,000 to get to June 30th. So that's what the estimate for the 1.3 is going forward. Okay. Um, we all know the, the energy costs went exponentially high this year. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we've had a couple of more buildings we're now responsible for. And uh, three years ago, we put our electric supply under a third party carrier, not National Grid. And that contract expires during FY24. That's right. okay. So there's an unknown of what our rate will be at that time. No, that makes sense. I saw that in the um, expenditures to date for that line item is already at, you're pretty much at 99 point, is it, you're at 100% and um, with you know, still a month left in the fiscal year. So I, I, I can understand why it was reflected. I just, again, wanted to understand what uh, the term energy stood for within, you know, your department for practical use. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Okay. Anyone, any other councils? Council Mahoney. Hello, Councillor. So when you were talking about overtime, um, and you said that you had to you kind of look elsewhere to get overtime, what do you mean by that? Look elsewhere for people to do the overtime? But I'm sorry. I'm... When you were talking about the overtime, yes, you said you know you look for you look for people elsewhere, like in the city, for that overtime. What what what, what are we looking for when you say that? The well, I was suggesting that the the crew that worked in the downtown district, yeah, where they were carried in my budget as well as Department of Natural Resources. When they did overtime, that's reflected in my overtime. No, I understand line. that. I understand that. Part. So we don't use anybody else. We don't use plumbers. You don't use plumbers from other. I, I do. I've got two plumbers. The ones that are working in North Quincy High School are from a different department. So you you use plumbers from other departments in you your department. Them out you of pay my them out line. of you. So why wouldn't so, I guess why wouldn't you then just hire a plumber if you need a plumber for like when, if I guess I just have to understand your overtime in that sense because paying people overtime is great because you're taking them from other people but they're making more money and the overtime is probably more expensive so you do, do an analysis to see whether or not you should have a plumber is let's if that's the example I, I have done that and with the prevailing wages that we're required to pay mm -hmm. under the mass law it is still cheaper to pay overtime to to our employees than to contract out and so we're so the plumbers are coming from the school is that what you're saying uh it a DPW plumber and um, from, uh, well, actually, I guess they're both DPW. 
So I guess if, I guess this is a question. So if the DPWs need those plumbers working overtime, those chances are some of your projects or some things that get put on hold because you can't get them. What happens then? Do you hire somebody outside? We do also contract out plumbing work, correct. But the nature of the outside bid is you have to have a defined scope that you put on the street and you bid and get your quotes, as opposed to like the North Quincy High School project is a rolling project that they can plan a night to work the day before, get their supplies, do that work, and walk out the door. If there's an issue with the DPW and their, their regular job responsibilities that they can't come on a particular night at North Quincy High School, that's not critical. They haven't shut the building down. They haven't taken a bathroom offline. Mm. Okay. So now moving over to projects, some of the projects you're working on. So I'm just, I don't remember if this one was done. Broadmeadows Middle School, the... Um, the auditorium. The auditorium, yeah. Yeah, so, that is done. It looks spectacular. I really, I, I want you, I invite you all to come down and look at that. It's amazing. That's excellent. Okay. And the Greenleaf Building, my favorite. My, I'm sure it is. Uh, work has progressed on it. Uh, it is not complete. Once again, I have to say that it was a three-tiered purpose of buying that. It was to restore the, pro the home, the historic home, and, and take it from being a blight on the neighborhood and make it a showpiece, which it is. It prevented a multifamily development on that corner, which it oh, has done. I appreciate that, but it's seven years. I'm yeah, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate what you're saying, but you know, there's a cost effectiveness to something like that too, because we bought it over seven years ago. So we've been working on it for seven years. So when you work on something for seven years, it's impossible almost to keep track of things, especially in this situation when you told me there was no budget for it, but we are, we're hiring outside labor to be doing things for something that has no budget. Correct, so, correct. Yeah. So Victor Cristofaro building, how about that one? The Victor Cristofaro building, how about that Christofaro, one? Cristofaro uh, Learning Center is going very, very well. Um, we, with the delay of windows and electrical gear and, and all of the other things that, you know, the COVID delays, which it was a kid, it's like the dog ate my homework, but in the adult world, it's the COVID has delayed everything in the project. Uh, uh, timeline and the deliveries, uh, we did have delays. We've done a, uh, a recovery schedule and advanced some work um, and suspended other work and changed sequencing to advance the, the calendar, the, the project schedule. Uh, we anticipate our substantial completion date being October of 2023, this October. Uh, and uh, after that, it has to be fitted up with the furniture, fixtures and equipment, the technology and all of that. Um, so that's why when last we spoke on it in this forum and my last time at the school committee, I suggested to them that it's their call when they occupy, whether they did January of 24 or wait till September of 24. I've since learned the school committee's vote was to do uh, September of 2024, which would help them to showcase it and market it to the families in district and out of district. Okay. And 610 McGrath Highway, that's a new one. 610 McGrath, that's the building that was acquired to have a, a public forum for the um, Elanon and other programs like that. Uh, to my understanding, uh, I haven't directly been involved in it. I have some general knowledge of it, but I don't have the particulars, and I think Mr. Walker should be better versed in speaking on that one. Okay. I thought all new buildings kind of just fell underneath you. I guess I didn't know. I thought all new buildings just fell underneath you. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chairman, it, it does. Um, just from a, a process standpoint, Councilor, um, there is interest from the, the state, um, sure. DCAM, is the agency that have uh, been planning on building a new courthouse in that area for quite some time. We knew that th this was a possibility. Um, they have begun to express their interest that they're going to want that building uh, for part of their design. So um, long-term planning for that facility um, is in limbo at this moment, and that's why Paul wouldn't necessarily have all the details of it. We're working with DCAM right now. Obviously, they have them in a domain uh, taking authority ability. Mm -hmm. um, it was sort of always part of the the possibility, the realm of possibilities with that. Um, but the, the decision was made to move on the building and see if we could get some use out of it. I'm not sure at this point in time um, if there's going to be enough time for us to get use out of that building before the state comes in and takes it for the courthouse. So you did start working on it, though, right? Mostly dem demolition at this point. There was there's Some of the new works began, but not, uh, not anything of real significance. So is it on hold now? It is on hold. Okay. okay. And the Monroe building? The Monroe building is up and functioning. We have tenant, uh, tenant up. The sheriff's department's moved in the first floor to keep the street level activated. Um, we keep it maintained. We keep it operable. There's, there's been no major projects undertaken there. We have moved a number of city employees into the second floor suites to. Are to you gain doing maintenance space. of that building though? Is there any maintenance that you're going to be doing of that building, or is it just? It, it actually it's, it's 
built like a, uh, I, I almost use the wrong term. It's very well built, uh, the terrazzo floors and things like that. So there's not a lot of improvements needed. I mean, it's areas if it's dated, but there's no plan at this point to update Some of the exterior the is kind of the exterior. Some of the exterior, like the windows look like they're they're getting water damage and stuff. And just yeah, you, you, you could use a coat of paint, certainly, on the street level. Yep. And then the animal shelter, just curious, because I think you... Okay. The temporary one is complete. No, they love it. Uh, the 99 Quarry Street one, um, we were going very, very well. Uh, we began the excavations and such. Uh, I think everybody knows the history of the site. Um, in that it went from John Adams started the quarries there uh, to later on the Duane company using it for a, a dump site for construction and demolition degree uh, debris um, and then um, the major developers coming in Dean Strizzuli and High Point and then Avalon so you know through the due diligence of testing in those days they determined there was asbestos and all kinds of stuff uh, in some of the areas uh, there was construction debris in the area that the city parcel became as part of the lawsuit settlement. The city got 22 acres, and that's where the dog park is, the dog road, and the proposed dog shelter. So we did the, the necessary soil testings and such for the site, the building site for the shelter, um, and they came back uh, below reportable levels. The soils were characterized as urban fill and were appropriate for, for moving about for the construction. Uh, there was one area that hadn't previously been tested, so in December of 2023, uh, we engaged a firm to come in and do the testing of that uh, particular slope that had to be cut into. Uh, and they did advance those test bits. The soils were categorized and no asbestos was found. Uh, and excavation began, and lo and behold, deeper than they tested, we found uh, trace amounts, and I mean trace amounts of asbestos, barely over the reportable thresholds. Uh, but because they were, we fell into the mass contingency plan, reopened the prior filings with the DEP, and I have to thank the DEP staff. They've been very cooperative with their schedule, their time, and their resources uh, to get us back going. So we have been delayed since January from that find. Uh, we just uh, last Thursday got the go-ahead to begin uh, the, the removal of those soils, relocating on-site, and capping it in the area of existing landfill and cap. So by and large, about 75 or 80% of that site has previously been capped and filled with three feet of soil. So DEP, for the first time in the Northeast Regional Office, has allowed us to relocate those soils on site and cap them because we already had that landfill. We're just increasing the elevation of an existing condition. Uh, and that saved us probably about a million and a half dollars. Uh, and so that was certainly welcome. And, uh, and from a scheduled point, it helped us. It would be probably six months to truck those soils off site to a, a landfill out of state. Um, so again, they've been very cooperative, uh, very helpful, and very respectful of our, of our needs. And I, I can't be more appreciative of them. And I don't know that a lot of people say that about the DEP. Yeah, so de the delight. So was there any cost, additional cost? There I know is. It's, I know it saved some. So what was the additional? I, I appreciate that there's a million five that was saved from all the work that you did. But what was the additional cost that added into it? Uh, at this point, we, that's not known. The, the totality of it is not known. We're going to have additional costs to the soil moving company additional costs to the contractor and additional costs to the, uh, the environmental team. Uh, that's still being assessed at this time. Uh, we're still under negotiation with that. Uh, I don't have that final figure at this point. When do you think you'll have that number? Just I, I really, please, I don't want to speculate on it. I, oh, it's, it, it's, I mean, will it be this year? Will it be next year? So oh, time. I thought you meant dollars. No. Yeah, um, the worst case scenario is the time of the moving it would be eight weeks. Uh, but in the three days they've done it, they're already 20% done. Okay. So that schedule should co collapse significantly. And that, of course, is going to also reel back the costs of doing that. All right. So what, what has it done to your schedule for the, the completion of the project? Uh, it began last week. It was eight weeks out. Okay. So now we don't have... So you're not that bad. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Well, every day is bad because it does cost you more, admittedly. But yeah. the, the more quickly they can move the soils, the better, because that gets us back in our construction schedule. Uh, and that forecasted schedule going forward has been recast and completed. We just don't have the data keys off of until the soils are moved. Okay. If you could just keep us posted on that, because that's, you know, obviously I, I, I went up there too and I saw that they, they had everything covered in tarp. 
Um, so you knew that you hit something, but um, but if we could keep an update on that, along with the time frame of that particular project, and then also the cost impacts of that, sure. because you know that's a pretty expensive project, and that's a going to be no matter what happens, the delay is going to cost us money, and also the cost. That brings me, it brings me to dirt, which I, I don't think it's your dirt that I'm going to talk about, but I might have to ask through Mr. Walker about dirt, because it's just, we got big piles of dirt in it the city. It might be my dirt. If it, if it's the dirt <laughs> is some I'm of that your talking. dirt? Uh, at uh, Ross Parking? Yeah. Yes, it is my dirt. That's your dirt. That's from the public safety headquarters, temporarily stockpiled. Is it all your dirt? It's going back to the site, yes, when they finish the There's no phase. other dirt, just the, just the, just the, just it, so there's no other projects that that dirt came from. I just want to make sure. My understanding, it's all mine. It's all yours. Do you, you don't have to test that, though, because it's going to go back to It has side. been tested. It's been tested in, in, in um, it's been classified and tested. It's clean. or will never be able to lose, leave that site. Yeah, so, okay, so that's going to go back. Where is it going to go? To the Back on the site. They, they've done excavations to do footings and stuff for the building, and then they get a backfill around it all. Okay, and then there was some dirt moved to, I believe I was told it was moved to next to the beachcomber. Is that right? <laughs> That's part of the park improvements there. That's the fill for the park. Because right, there's I a lot of dirt. <laughs> I, I mean, I was, it's only because I'm asking. Cause I, no, cause... That's, that's part of the original plan okay. where they're going to be making the park, but they have to bring the dirt up to the level of the street. Okay. And then they're going to be doing it, doing the plantings, doing the path. And it should, they're talking sometime this summer. Okay. I'm just done. asking because there's a lot of, there was a lot of dirt. When you mentioned yeah. dirt, all of a sudden I was like, oh, there's but a dirt But it's all question. being graded, and it's all... What happened was the soil there was impermeable. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the, I know. From the old beachcomber that all had to be dug up. Yeah. This is all meeting what we have to for the environmental reasons. I was hoping that. the dirt, whatever dirt's going there, okay. was coming from was all the dried some other story. The yeah, there seems to be a lot of piles of dirt. So, <laughs> so that's, that, that is what five dirt. I well, <laughs> <laughs> again, but, just uh, because there's big piles of dirt, and you know, I don't know where the dirt's coming from. It's just funny because I was, I, I just, okay. I had no idea where the dirt was coming from. It's just piling up. Looks like mountains, little, like a, you know, just, just interesting. Yeah. As All much right. as there's land at DPW, it is still at a premium for parking and their operations. So it really had to leave that site without, otherwise it would cripple DPW's operation. Yeah. No. Again, just because. I didn't know where the dirt came from, so like, and, I, and I thought it was going to be a natural. I was like, "Is this going to be a natural resource question?" But only one part was okay. the natural resource. Thank you very much, All Paul. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other counselors? Councilor DeBona. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just um, Commissioner Hines. Thank you for all your hard work. Uh, public buildings is obviously a very important, vital part. Um, our city. Um, thank you for North Quincy's branch of library. Um, I know it was tough and. A lot of these things that we go into these buildings and um, some of these buildings are grandfathered in and some of them have to go up to code. Uh, thank you for reopening the uh, Ward 2 Civic um, over at Four River Clubhouse. I know um, we have some issues on the other side which um, the folks have, are glad and happy that at least one half is open. So um, just continue to do it. And if you, on your staff, how many public buildings do we have across the city? Buildings are about 70 and the definition of buildings has now become buildings and structure. And I said to the mayor, why? Because cause you get things done. So I have like radio towers and different things that you just, I keep getting. Um, so if you total them all in, it's about a hundred that we care for. And the staff that you have right now, your, your, your whole department, do you think you're, you're where you need to be or do you think in, as we move forward that- I could think be at this point we're in a good place. We have a lot of capital projects coming up, which we've contracted out and uh, we can handle that while our guys uh, and women continue with the, uh, the maintenance projects and such. Um, and to the questions that were asked earlier, and I think I get skipped, but I've got a total of 44 employees and 32 a union across three separate unions and 12 a non-union. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thanks for coming up tonight. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Okay, any other counselors? We have a motion on the floor. Just so you know, we will be holding Every, all the nine union raises, and that will be dealt with on uh, on June June twelfth. So um, we have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Hearing none. Thank you. Well, um, just one quick point. We'll be back at it tomorrow night. So thank everyone for their time, and uh, we're more than halfway through it. So let's we're going to keep moving. All right, and I'll entertain the, the newest city resident must have been bored tonight to come and sit through this. Oh, okay. <laughs>
Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn.